This is Vincent Price. Our story is about a mask, a facial covering that has known many uses, been the facade for many feelings. All of the peoples of the earth use masks in one way or another. This is the story of an African mask named Oshango Batala. Oshango Batala was an old mask carved by a mischievous master carver in the last century and had been present at many ceremonies, both frivolous and serious, as his mood suited him. Because he had been found over the years to be an untrustworthy mask capable of placing inappropriate expressions on the face of the person responsible for him, the people of his village placed him on the back wall of their mask house, between two well-behaved masks, hoping that they could talk some sense into his wooden face. Neither the people of the village nor the two masks flanking Oshango Batala had any notion that their village would ever become famous, renowned for the excellence of its carvings. But perhaps Oshango Batala knew, he with his tricky ways and love of fire. I've seen stuff from every hut in the village except that one. There is nothing of value there, sir. Why not let me decide, hmm? I mean, after all, I'm the guy making this village rich, right? With my urge to collect, my export-import business... There is really nothing there, Mr. Palmer, I assure you, except for a few old masks, uh, badly carved. Old masks? How old? Uh, very badly carved, but, Mr. Palmer. But very old. Uh, well, uh, you know, masks from the past. I'd like to see them. Uh, it is not permitted. I'll give you 50 shares to let me take a look. Oh, the people would not like it. They 100. Would... And that's my final offer. Well, it would have to be done after the people have found sleep for the night. Uh, Mr. Bob. Yeah? I must warn you. One or two of these... Are not nice masks. What's nice? I felt I should warn you. Okay. I've been warned. Too bad sometimes that we can't see beneath the surface, go behind the beyond, understand the personalities of those faces we call masks. And that's how we begin our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Mask, by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Jim Mapp and David Downing. Ralph Palmer, entrepreneur, veteran of a thousand business deals, finds himself in search of another bargain in a remote corner of Africa. It will be interesting to see what the ultimate profit will be. Mr. Palmer... Uh, over here, over here. Shh, talk about dark night. Shh, please be quiet. The people would be very disturbed about this if they found out. Uh, do you have the 100 shetties? Do you have a flashlight? Uh, yes, I have a torch. We must wait until we are inside the mask house. Do you have the money? Do you know something, Bruno? I kind of get the impression that you like money. I like the options that it offers. After all, I am only a poor, corrupt village official trying to feed a large family. Yeah, seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Here, you want to count it? Oh, I trust you. Now, come, follow me closely. We will have to circle behind the village. Here, push gently. Shh. We must close it to keep the light from being seen. Right. Phew. So 
awfully close in here. No one has been in here for five years or more, at least. Smells like it. Let's have some light. Over here. Shine your light over here. Oh, good Lord. These are incredible. Incredible. I thought you said they were badly carved. Perhaps not so badly carved, but they represent... Here, here, shine your light over here. On that one. Yes, that one. It's magnificent. Uh, that is the trickster mask called Oshango Batala. I want it. I have to have it. Why are those two masks on each side facing it? They are talking to him, asking him to behave. Mad guy, huh? I love it. Have to have it. Uh, please, Mr. Palmer, we must leave. We cannot stay. Someone might discover us. Oh, no. I want that mask. Now, who would I have to see to make a deal? Uh, that one is not for sale. There is no one who you can see to buy that one, especially that one. You don't understand me too well. I want that mask. And I'm willing to pay for it. Now, who should I talk to? Uh, please, Mr. Palmer, we must go. I'm not leaving here without you. Uh, but you don't understand. This I'll mask give you is... 200 cheddars to help me get it out of here. And I'm not going to bargain with you now. That's my first and final offer. I, I, I don't want Look, to. Look, let's, let's be sensible. Now, you need money to feed your large family. I need this mask for my collection. How long did you say it had been here? For five years or so. I... All right, five years. It's a sense that it might not be missed for another five years or so. And by that time, no one will know what happened to it. The mask will know. Okay, okay, the mask will know. Big deal. It'll be hanging on the wall in my den. Good light. Pleasant surroundings and... Uh, did you say 300, Sherry? No, I said 250. Now, give me a hand. Help me take it down. Uh, do you have the money now? Of course not. I'll give it to you when you get back to the hotel. Here. Hold that light steady. Ooh, this thing is really heavy. Someone comes. That was close. What happened? We were caught coming out of here with this. In the old days, we would be killed. Oh, oh, uh, well, it's a good thing it isn't the old days. Oh, come on, give me a hand. Paging Mr. Palmer. Paging Mr. Ralph Palmer. Please come to the message desk, please. I'm Palmer. Do you have a message for me? Yes. Here you are, sir. My husband, Brunkein Guy, asks that I send you this before your departure. My husband is in hospital, suffering from burns on his chest and arms. The doctors have assured us that his injuries are not permanent. The accident was caused by an exploding oil stove. He thanks you for allowing him the privilege of being your guide during the time you were in our village. He also asks you to be careful of the mask. Sincerely yours, Mrs. Mary Ingai. Shango Batala, the mask, continues. Ralph, I'm telling you for the third time, that thing winked at me, and I want it out of this house. Oh, come on, Ivan, now be sensible. How could a wooden mask wink at you? That's a good question, Mom. How could a wooden mask wink at you? Yeah, Mom, how could a wooden mask wink at you? Okay, okay, you guys. Maybe it didn't wink at me, but it did something else. I was lighting a cigarette yesterday in the den, and the light flamed up suddenly, and the eyes in that thing seemed to light up, too, as though it were happy to see the flame. 
In addition, I almost had my eyelashes singed off. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe it's the kind of wooden mask that gets excited when it sees oh, fire. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you ought to wear shorter eyelashes, Mom. You know what I can't understand, Dad? Why is it with all the beautiful African lady statuettes, you'd have to come away with the face of a dirty old man with brass tacks around his mouth? Now who's talking nonsense? Eric, uh, I'd have to give you a question. Very careful consideration. But seriously, Ivana... What's really the uh, the problem with you, huh? And this particular piece. I mean, after all, we, we have at least 20 or 30 other masks around the house. Well, what's so disturbing about this uh, one? I, I don't know. It's, it's grotesque. That's what it is. It's grotesque. Look, Max is dropping in this evening, remember? The last thing I'd like to have is a major league collector come into a family that's panning the products. Major league collector, minor league collector, or whatever... You've got to do something with that thing. Now, why don't we get back to this tomorrow, hmm? Put it on hold, okay? Whenever. But let's have it clearly understood. I want it out. Hark, if I'm not mistaken, our major league collector is here. Open it, will you, Adrian? Max seems to pop in on a better mood when you open the door for him. It's Mr. Falcon. Hi, go right on in. Oh, my, 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 Adrian, you certainly came. <laughs> Since last month. Well, Ralph, old stick, welcome back. Yvonne, I must say you're becoming more and more... Oh, come now, Max, you always say that. <laughs> Can I fix you a drink? <laughs> yes, it's gin and tonic. Well, Eric, how's, uh, how's football treating you? So far, so good. I'll know when the season starts. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I've... Uh... Somehow formed the conclusion that American football is like the weather. It's always there, but no one can do anything about it. Hmm? Ah, thank you, Yvonne. Well, Ralph, uh, I can tell from that devastatingly perkish smile that you've got a surprise or two for the old falcon there. Eh? Well, maybe I haven't. Maybe I haven't. Well, why don't we take a peek? Bring your drink. I placed the new pieces here in the den. you deal in materials more? I mean, you have a point there, Adrian. African fashions are... Well, I must say, Ralph, quite an extraordinary gathering, quite. And this superb piece here, with its somewhat malevolent expression, now that is a real find. One could say that it was simply ugly. Oh, oh, if one had to say something like that... Now, uh... please, please, old stick, don't try to cancel out real emotions. That's one of the beauties of the African mask. Some people simply cannot get past that enigmatic facade. I smell smoke. Hmm? Smoke? Hey, now just a minute. I know some people don't like long dresses, but this is... Well, I'm sorry, Mom, but the hem of your dress was smoking. What? See? Hmm. <laughs> Guess I'll have to give up smoking or start wearing shorter dresses. Ivana, are you okay? Mm, tail feathers singed, but okay, I think. My word, what on earth happened? I mean... How could the train of your dress cut... How do things like this happen? By accident, right? Right. No other explanation. Sheer accident. Damn it, I, I can't figure it out. Life just seems to be one accident after another these days. Yvonne burning a dress last week... Adrian burning her hands on a skillet panel that she wasn't even over a flame. Now Eric's feet are catching fire. This keeps up with me needing my own personal broom unit. Mr. Palmer? Mr. Palmer? Who, 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 who is it? Where are you? Look up here, Mr. Palmer. Me, the mask. Hey, no, no, don't give me that. Okay, Eric, that's enough now. Knock it off. I got a lot on my mind. I don't need this kind of distraction. This is not your son, Eric. This is Oshango Batala, the mask. You must be losing my mind. Mask, don't talk. You're right. Not usually. But that's been one of my bad habits ever since I was caught. Wait. Before you say another word, let me stiffen my drink. I need it. There is no need to be afraid. I come in peace. Okay. Great. I'm 
talking to a mask on my damn wall, and it's telling me you... You're telling me that you come in peace. I don't understand. Now, what could you do to me? I could make life very hot for you. For the people around you. You you could make life hot for me? For the people around me? Yes. I won't explain how. But I thought you should know that. I think I'm already aware. In that case, I won't have to spend a lot of time beating around the trees. I want to go home. Oh, come on. Now, be sensible. You've got a beautiful room with a view yet. Everybody admires... No. They do not like me. They hate me, and they think I'm ugly, and I want to go home. Now, just a minute. Can't we put our heads together and reason this out? I don't really think so. Do what I say, or suffer the consequences. Someone once said that we, all of us, are the faces that we show to the world. Is there a possibility that remark might also apply to masks? Eric, come in here and close the door. Adrian, pour me a stiff one, will you, honey? What's wrong, Mom? You're really wired up. There's something I have to tell you both. It's the kind of thing that would upset anybody. It's about your father. Here you go. Is he... Is he... Is he what, Eric? Well, I don't know. I just thought that maybe he Eric, was... please. Can't you see you're distracting her? Yes, you are distracting me, and I'm already distracted enough. Well, calm down, Mom. Take it easy and tell us. What about Daddy? Well, I, I hardly know where to begin. Uh, freshen this up for me, will you, dear? Hmm. Thank you, Adrian. Oh, incidentally, how are your hands? Oh, they're okay. Doctor tells me that there's no problem. Purely superficial. The skin will renew itself in a few weeks. Oh, uh, 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 could we sort of get to the reason for us being here? I have to go check on my VW. The upholstery looks like some Boy Scouts forgot to douse the fire. Okay, take a deep breath and listen closely. I don't know if I can repeat myself. Last evening, I passed the den and your father was talking to that mask. What? He was doing what? He was talking to that awful mask that he brought back from Africa. Oh, well, what were they talking about? Don't make light of this. It's the truth. I actually heard him speaking to us. What was he saying? What was he saying? Well, it seemed... It sounded as though he were trying to work out a deal. With the mask about something. You know, in a way, I uh, only had myself to blame for being caught in a situation like this. The mask house elders have been warning me for years that I would be exiled if I didn't behave myself. What caused you to misbehave in the first place? Who can say, really? I've heard several theories... One of them is that the man who caught me blasphemed before I was done. Someone also said that the wood from which I was made had not been properly blessed. And there was another point of view which said that I was made from the wrong wood. How do I know? All I know is this. I want to go home. Well, haven't you heard? You can never go home again. What? I don't understand. What are you talking about? Nothing. Look, forget about going back. Now, just a minute. I think it's terribly unfair of you to be so stubborn about this. Not being stubborn. I just simply fail to see any advantage for your return. But you don't understand. I'll be back where I belong. That's advantage enough. You call being locked up in a dark hut an advantage? Yes. I'm surrounded by others who have my best interests at heart. Not like here, where people stare at me as though I were a freak. Oh, come on now. That would be the case almost anywhere. Let's face it. You are strange looking. I am not. I look exactly like the way I'm supposed to look. 
The people who are looking at me, talking about how weird I look, are the ones who look weird. You've got a point there. But look, why let these things bother you? You're the main attraction here. I don't want to be the main attraction for a bunch of idiots who think I'm ugly. I think you're too sensitive. Who thinks you're ugly? Your wife does. She thinks I'm ugly. She comes in here from time to time, stands in front of me and thinks, how ugly. Well, how do you know she thinks that? I can read her mind. You can read her mind? You can read minds? Well, not everybody's mind, but... What kind of mind do you read? Oh, I'd say the ones that have definite ideas, notions. Like, uh, let's say you had someone standing in front of you, thinking in a very definite way about a matter that dealt with money. Could you read that? No. No, I'm not going to do it. I won't be a part of anything like that, no. You want to go back home, don't you? Yes, of course. I told you that. I do miss my wives. Your wives? Yes. You didn't meet them. They were sleeping in another section of our hut when you stole me. Oh... Do you realize I've aged ten years at least since you've been here? Look at this wrinkle in my forehead. If you really wanted to return, you would listen to my proposition. That's about the gist of it. Your father is blackmailing that mask. Wow. You lost me, Ma. Yeah, that's a little heavy for me, too. Mind slipping it back through? Simple. He's blackmailed the mask into working for him. The deal seems to involve the mask doing a bit of mind reading before he can... The mask reads mind? As I understand it, it can read some minds. It has obviously read mine. Oh, let me get the straight of this. Dad has a mask hanging in his den that reads mine? Yes. I mean, what does... What does he want the mask to do? Well, as you know, the last three deals your father has been involved with haven't worked out. He has propositioned the mask into helping him recover his losses. The deal seems to be that in return for its help, the mask will be returned to its home. No. No, I don't believe this. Double that. Well, I'm quite pleased that you invited me over this evening, old sock. I've been wanting to discuss the Anderson deal with you. Um, where's the family? He lies. He is not pleased to be here. He'd rather be at home. The family... Oh, oh, uh... Well, Yvonne has a Wednesday evening backgammon group, and Eric and Adrian are playing tennis down at the club. Randy? Uh, just a thought. Now then, as I understand it, about the Anderson deal, we're talking about a straight split down the middle. No silent partners, no backstabbing, none of the usual business practices. The rip-off has already been set up. He's going to ask you for another five thou to take care of the matter. Well, I'm glad we've had a frank discussion. It makes it easier for me to tell you that to finalize the matter, we uh, urgently need, oh, 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 something in the neighborhood of uh, five thou to tie everything up neat and clean. So, when you're dealing with the kind of people we're dealing with, the uh, bribe comes first. He lies. He has a gambling debt to be paid. Offer him two thousand. He'll take it. How about two thousand? Mm, well, uh, yes, all right. Yes, we've got a deal. Ah, nothing like a glass of fresh juice to start today. Dad, we know. About fresh juice? About your deal with the mask. The deal with what mask? Daddy, we all know. We've all heard you talking to the mask. Did you hear what it said to me? No. I didn't hear anything. Neither did I. What? What do you mean, you didn't hear anything? The mask? How would you know that I had a deal with a mask if you didn't hear? We could figure out what the deal was because of what you were saying. Ralph, you have to take it back. It's too soon. But, Dad, I heard you promised the mask you'd return it in exchange for help in reversing some business losses. We happen to know, for a fact, that the last two weeks have put us in another tax bracket. Give it a break, Daddy. Take it back. Are you people insane? 
Are you going to try to make me believe that a mask is responsible for my recent successes? Frankly, dear, I don't know. All I can see is that there is a connection between you and that mask, and I don't like it. Take it back to wherever it wants to go. Well, not take the mask anywhere, and that's the end of it. Well, I thought my family was pretty intelligent bunch of guys. You really surprised me. No! That's it! I told you the last time! No more! Shh! Know your voice. Why should I? You're the only one who can hear me. Yes, right. I forgot. Now look, this is the deal of the century for me. Don't you understand? There are only ten authentic Nubian statues in the world, and I have a chance to get my hands on six of them. I could practically corner the market. And don't you see what this means? I don't care. I want to get back home. You won't reconsider? No. That's my final word. As you say, the bottom line. Stubborn, huh? Now I can see why they kept you in that hut. I want to go home. Maybe if I stuck you away somewhere for a few days, you'd be more charitable. I don't care what you do. I just want to go home. Well, in that case, let's see what the basement will do for your bad temper. I don't care. I don't care. Put me down. Put me down. I want to go home. Put me down. I hit Hmm. Now, that's what I call a real down-home southern fried chicken dinner. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I decided to make it for you to celebrate the disappearance of that mask. Decided to take our advice, huh, Daddy? Well, I thought about it, and it seemed to me that I was, it was being a bit stubborn. I mean, um, well, it's only a mask. What did you do with it, Dad? Oh, I got rid of it. You know, the, the usual. What's for dessert? Peach cobbler. Mmm, great. <laughs> Ooh, it's been a long day. You can say that again. It's been a long... Oh, Ralph, stop that. You know what I mean. I know, I know. I'm just fine. Listen, why don't we start making preparations for that vacation we put off before my last buying trip? Hmm? Ralph, I'd love to. But just a minute. This sounds like something I've heard before. Please don't flip my spirits up if you don't mean it. Oh, honey, I do mean it. Let's face it. Now, neither one of us is getting any younger. Time is passing us by. Why not take a vacation? The islands. I want to go to the islands. Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados. Sun, clean, clear water, beautiful beaches. When do we leave? Hold on. It can't be tomorrow. I've got a really important deal to finalize before. How long will it take? Really anxious to take off, huh? Shouldn't take more than two weeks. I'll start making arrangements tomorrow. Oh, I don't know why, but it seems that this has been a very wearing month. You feel that way? Uh-huh. Well, it's almost over now. Time to go night-night. Dream about something good. Night, honey. Night, Ralph. I'm so happy. It seems like ages since we've had a vacation yeah. together. Ages. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of Oshango Batala, The Mask. You were lucky, Mr. Palmer. Another five minutes and that fire would have swept through your place like I don't know what. What caused it? Well, as far as we can make out at this point, electrical shortage, a few sparks can sometimes fall on combustible material, things like that. Where did it start? In the basement, one of the usual places. Like I said, you're lucky the damage is minor. 
Now, if you don't mind the smell of burnt wood, you're perfectly free to go back inside the dangers pass. In the basement, did you say? The fire started in the basement? Right, that's right, sir. In the basement. Now, people were more careful not to store combustibles yeah. within the... Access. In the basement? Ralph, are you all right? What's the matter, Daddy? Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. I was just thinking of the clean-up job we have to do. I thought you'd burn to a crisp down here. Nope. As you can see, I am still where you left me, and I still want to go home. Oh, this is silly. You're being unnecessarily stubborn. Now, if you... No, I will not, and that's final. Now, you listen to me, you dickheaded chunk of wood. Ralph, what are you doing to... Oh, no! I thought you'd gotten rid of that thing. You see... That's why I want to leave. Nobody cares for me here. I thought I'd just store it down here in the basement. But you, you said you'd gotten rid of it. Well, as you can see, I haven't. And I can't yet. There's too much at stake. What are you talking about? What's at stake? All I can see is that you're going off your bird about a damn mask and endangering your family's life in the process. She's right. This isn't like you, Yvonne. I can't make myself believe that an intelligent, modern-thinking person like yourself would... Get rid of it! Do something with it, Ralph. Take it out of our lives before... Before it burns us all up. Well, I must say I'm quite surprised, old Bean. Quite. Considering the authenticity of the piece, I, uh... I really have to feel that I'm getting more than my money's worth. Um, may I be so bold as to inquire, why are you selling it? Well, I, I knew that you were drawn to the piece. Well, I'd like to say that uh, that is the case with a number of things that you have. Now, come, now, tell me the truth. Yvonne couldn't stand to have it around, hmm? You are absolutely right. Hmm. There seems to be something about this mass that burns her up when she's around it. Yes, I quite understand. Well, now, will you stay for a glass of Madeira? I'd love to, but uh, I'm late for an important meeting. Oh, well, yes, of course. Well, cheerio, pip-pip and all that, right? <laughs> and I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Jolly good. I want to go home. Hmm? What? Oh, I must have dozed off. Too much Madeira, I suppose. I want to go home. What? <laughs> no, I must be dreaming. I told Ralph Palmer, and now I'm telling you, Max Falcon. I'm bored here, and I want to go home. I miss my friends and wives in the mask house. My word, it, it's speaking to me. Yes, to you. I can't believe it. What's so unbelievable? I'm bored, I'm lonesome, and I want out. Well, now, 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 just a moment, Mask. Now, I am not the sort you can order about. Oh, we'll see about that. Listen to this. Author and well-known art collector Max Falcon, 62 years old, was taken to Bellwood Hospital for treatments of a heart condition. Mr. Falcon also sustained second-degree burns of his hands and chest. Mr. Falcon declines to offer any explanation for the presence of the burns. He's in satisfactory condition. Sounds like Mr. Falcon nodded off with a glass of something in one hand and a cigar in the other. Ralph, did you... did you sell? Yes, sir. I hate to admit it, but... Take it back, Ralph. For heaven's sakes, take it back. I'm on my way. Five hundred shedders to help me smuggle this thing back into... Please, please, Mr. Palmer, please lower your voice. Someone might hear us. Why should I pay you twice as much to help me return this as I paid to take it out? Uh, two reasons, sir. Inflation and the fact that I know where the mask house has been moved. What do you mean, moved? 
Uh, periodically, the mask house is moved, just to keep the mask from becoming bored or being in one spot. And I'm the one who knows which hut it is. Bruno, you're great. Here, you want to count it? Oh, no, no, I, I trust you. Come with me. Yes, right there. Look at that. It's magnificent. Mr. Palmer, that mask... Stop! You don't have to tell me. Let's go. Wake up! Everybody! I'm back! We can see you're back. You should have seen me. A room of my own, admirers by the hundreds, a fireplace to stare into. If you keep on boasting in this manner, we will make a rent, Mr. Have you sent back? We know how lonesome you have been, and how badly you wanted to return to your own kind. Just because you're a mask doesn't mean you have to tell lies. You're absolutely right. I've been miserable, really miserable. I just come from a place where it seems that they change places every hour, sometimes every half hour, and you can never know what they really think. It's good to be back with honest faces again. Uh, let's talk about it tomorrow. Now's the time for sleep. <sighs> This is so beautiful. The water is so blue. The sky is so blue. It's just what we needed. What are you smiling about? I was just thinking about Max in the hospital. How vulnerable he looked. He didn't offer the slightest protest when I suggested that the mass be returned. Ralph, do you... Do you really think that the mass was actually responsible for those fires? For Max's burns? No, no, I don't. Oh, what's wrong? Back is sunburned. I wonder... Daddy, how... check this out for me. There's this guy down the beach setting these masks for five bucks each. What do you think? Take it back. Take it back! Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Mask, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Jim Mapp and David Downing. Featured in the cast were Mady Norman, Robin Braxton, Ben Wright, Don Blakely, and Ray Tosco. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for sensibility. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces.
This is Vincent Price. Here's another item for your Bermuda Triangle scrapbook. This one we will solve for you within the hour. The solution will be more simple, more complete, and more reasonable than most you have heard from that mysterious area. And yet, when you hear the solution, you may find it more disquieting than the mystery. For then you will always wonder when you've made a simple purchase at the store, a loaf of bread, a pair of shoes, a palatial new yacht, what else may be wrapped up in the package? But Henry, dear, it's an absolute dream boat. Now, isn't it? Well, it is a pretty boat, Celia. And the price. Who would imagine that you and I could buy a boat like this at such a price? Oh, Mr. Merrickin's price is good, my love. So good, in fact, that... Uh... That what, dear? That I wonder what's the matter with the boat. Is it haunted? And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Voyage of No Return by Edward Borgers. Our stars, Jeanette Nolan, Harley Bear, and Eddie Firestone. The story you were about to hear starts with a newspaper clipping. That clipping is from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And here's what it says. Guests at the Tropica Hotel who came out for an early morning swim today found a bizarre spectacle waiting for them down on the beach. Two corpses washed up side by side, each in full evening attire. No wounds, but quite dead. Police have tentatively identified the couple as Mr. and Mrs. George Willoughby of Akron, Ohio. A retired factory executive, Willoughby, moved to Miami Beach with his wife about a month ago. There they are reported to have purchased a beautiful, ocean-going yacht. Since neither Mr. and Mrs. Willoughby had ever dipped their toes into an ocean before this month, it's unthinkable that they would have been so rash as to set out to sea alone in their new yacht. But the Flamingo, which three days ago was tied securely to its Miami Beach moorings, has now vanished. Another weird blank from the world's most sinister stretch of ocean. Well, that's the clipping. Right at this moment, it doesn't mean a thing to Henry and Celia Grant, recently of Tripola, Iowa. Henry and Celia have been driving south down the west coast of Florida. At an out-of-the-way spot called Benson's Cove, they used a substantial part of their savings to make the purchase of their lives, a luxury yacht that they've named the Harvester. Right now, there's nothing on their minds except that life-fulfilled dream. But soon, they will remember the clipping. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, they'll remember. Well, Celia, I reckon we better stop gawking and get on board. What are you up to, Henry? Well, the harvester's not going to do as much good tied up here at the dock. I'm going to figure out how to start the motor, and away we'll go. Henry, you can't do that. You've never been in anything bigger than a rowboat. Oh, I think the old combine was as big as this yacht, and I imagine the machinery was about equally complicated. I've spent most of my life on one kind of machine or another. Have you forgotten already? Oh, Henry, you're terribly smart around the farm, and you know I've never questioned that. And I don't mind drowning any more than you will. But I am not going to have you backing half our life savings into an ocean liner just because you happen to pull a wrong lever. Want to run it yourself, my love? <laughs> Now, listen, honey, we have to find someone who knows all about ocean yachts and hire him as our crew, at least until you've had a chance to learn how everything works. Well, I don't see that that's really... Hallelujah. Your much... prayer's answered. Praise the Lord. <laughs> he must have been very attentive. I wasn't even aware that I was asking the... Henry, don't be awful. Uh, what did you mean, young man? Vernon Wallace, ma'am, and I can see you understand how a man talks when he's been saved. Always pray. Of course. And Henry understands, too. Sometimes he just gets a little cantankerous. Oh, I know how it is. I know how it is, and I don't mind a bit. Now, uh, 
Would you be brother Henry and sister Celia? We are not brother and sister. We're married. Oh, <laughs> I get it. I get it, old timer. <laughs> Some kidder. Some kidder. Well, now, Mother Grant, uh, Brother Marican tells me he just sold this boat to a couple of rich Iowa farmers who don't know the stem from the stern. And if they don't want to just stand there on the docks drooling at it, he says they're praying right now for an expert navigator. And you're an expert navigator? It is the way I make my living, so praise the Lord. Oh, Henry, how wonderful. We will take him, won't we? Well, I expect it'll be all right to watch somebody else for a few days till I get the hang of it myself. Great! 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 Now, that's the spirit, old timer. Listen, I'll just get my sea bag, and I'll be right with you. Henry, why are you so hostile to that fine young man? Not hostile, Celia. Maybe not entirely convinced. Of what? Surely you're not going to be suspicious of a man who has been saved. Not as a general rule. But, of course, there's always... Always what? Always the case of Judas Iscariot. Rock of Ages, oh, there me. he goes again. Henry, let surely you're not objecting to a young man who'd rather sing me. one of the great hymns instead of that heathen rock and roll. No, no, I'm... It's very inspiring. Maybe before we get back to land, he'll learn another hymn. I like it. Well, Henry, I see your wood carving again. Yeah. I'm going to settle down to some serious time wasting now. Especially till I learn how to run this boat for myself. Well, is that... The... It is. It's the harvester you're modeling. Yeah. And that's why you've been doing all the measuring all over the boat. Well, it wouldn't do not to have the proportions right. Are you worried about shavings on this spotless deck, my love? Oh, of course not. One sweep of the broom and they'll all be in the ocean. Gone forever. Henry, I do like a young man strong in the faith. Me too, Celia. But the real religious folks don't go around shoving you into line. The ones who shove you are after something that's not good for you. Honey, he carries his Bible with him all the time. And those pamphlets about salvation in his pocket. And he's always singing hymns. Yep. Packaged like soda crackers. To sell. To sell what, Henry? I don't know. Himself, maybe. Oh. What's that? Thunder, my dear. Oh, but that means a storm. Only a few minutes ago, everything was so calm and sunshiny and beautiful... Now, look at that horizon. Well, it's often like that, even in Iowa. Uh, Celia, I think you'd better know. I've been prowling around the boat in odd places, taking measurements. Yes, for your wood carving. Yeah. This is going to be to absolute scale, inside and out. <laughs> uh, down in the hole, where normally neither one of us would ever look... Under the firehouse, I found a loaded revolver. Good gracious. Now, what's a Bible-carrying, pamphlet-packing, saved young man doing with a loaded revolver? Well, I... Now, wait, Henry. How do you know that's Vernon's gun? Is it yours? Well, it could have belonged to the previous owners. Well, that's what I'd like to imagine, Celia. I'd like to imagine Vernon Wallace doesn't even know it's there. Last there, mates. Squalls ahead. Time for landlubbers to go below. Do we... Should we go, Henry? Why, of course, my love. In a storm, the waves will sweep anyone off the deck. Just like the wood shavings. Yes, yes, I'm sure you're right, Henry. Let's go below. Dreary rain, Henry. <laughs> rain seldom makes anything more fun, my dear. And we're trapped in here. In in case... Well, out there, all he'd have to do would be to shoot, and we'd fall in the water in here, at least. Henry, what's this on the dresser? What? Oh, oh, that. Well, now, 
That's something else I found while I was prowling around this morning. I took up the mattress to measure the exact dimensions of the bunk from the floor, and there this was, between the mattress and the bunk. Why, it's a gold watch. How could yeah, it have... I, I know, old-fashioned type, but new. Now, it must have belonged to the original owner of the harvester. I wanted to try to get it back to him. I guess he mislaid it. <laughs> and whatever Marikin did to redecorate the boat before he sold it again, he sure didn't take up the mattress. So he didn't find Willoughby's watch. Willoughby? Well, I deduced that, my love, from the inscription here. To George Willoughby from the gang at the plant Akron... 1979, and there's a big 35 in the middle. I expect that's how long he worked there. Willoughby, Henry, didn't I read in the paper about a Mr. and Mrs. George Willoughby of Akron? <laughs> no doubt, my dear. Hundreds of Willoughbys in the world. Well, that's funny. Watch seems to be all wound up, but it doesn't go. Now, that's odd for a practically new watch. Let me take off the back here and see... Well. What is it? Well, no wonder the watch won't go. It's got a piece of paper stuck in the works here. Folded up like a message. Is there a message, dear? Yes, my love. There's a message. And I guess George Willoughby hoped the next owners of this boat would find it. What's the message, Henry? One word looks hastily scrawled. Murder. I'm sure you've all had a visit from a relative you really didn't want to see, or a guest who just wouldn't go home at bedtime. But I hope you've never found yourself with a visitor who might be a threat to your life, or again might not. That's now Henry and Celia Grant's problem with their navigator on the harvester. You remember, dear, the Willoughby's of Akron washed up on shore in their formal clothes, both dead. Willoughby? Yes, I do remember now. And they had bought a boat, the Flamingo. A boat a lot like this one. They were high society, not farmers. Uh, uh, probably they usually celebrated by dressing for dinner, and if they were out on the ocean celebrating their new boat... Yes, if they were out on the ocean, what happened at that dinner party? What... Oh, that watch me... Made... I'll come Evening, Mother Grant. Hello, Good Grant. evening, well, what's the matter? My old friends sound on edge. Here. We are. Yeah, the ocean's getting a little rough, I will admit. Are you seasick? Uh, no. No, we got on the other side of that. But no. Good. Good. Great. The old timers always did set the pace for us, youngster. And a storm at sea can be pretty scary, too. Every crack of thunder sounds like it's going to split your rotten too. And every time a wave hits, old Tump pitches just like it's headed for the bottom. I won't blame you if you get uneasy. We're not afraid of the storm, Vernon. And you are right, old Tama. Ta the old stick and play his head straight into the waves and relax. Ride right through a tidal wave. Vernon, this afternoon down in the hold, Henry found a gun. Oh, this gun, you mean? Yes, Vernon. That gun. Well, now, I didn't mention it to you folks, because I didn't want to worry. What would worry us, Vernon? I told you that anything that had to do with navigation, I'd take care of. And I can, and I will. Yes, Vernon. But in the past few years, in the Bermuda Triangle, there have been lots of boats like this. Yes? They sailed out to sea with expert navigators at the helm, and the weather, perfect. But they disappeared. Without a trace. Well, now, how, uh, how could that be, Vernon? Well, there is buried treasure in these parts, and adventurers go looking for it. And sometimes those adventurers run into pirates, real 1980 pirates, complete with planes and battleships, see? 
And that's what this gun is really about, because I want to take good care of you folks. One pistol against planes and battleships. We're not even looking for buried treasure. Ah, but you see, your inner treasure, the fl- I mean, a harvester. These pirates pick up a boat here, a boat there, just by getting rid of its owners. And they sail this stolen vessel into an old, out-of-the-way cove. Like somebody... uh, Benson's Cove, for instance? Sure, old timer, like Benson's Cove. They alter the boat's outward appearance. They repaint it and equip it with forged paper. They sell it again as soon as they can. At a bargain price? Of course. And so long as they didn't overwork any one spot too often, they could keep up this kind of piracy forever without being caught. Right on the money. But how could these pirates get hold of their stolen boats in the first place? (laughs) That's easy, Mother Grant. When they sell a stolen boat, they just sell it to someone who have to have a crew. And they arrange for one of their own men to be that crew. They give them a Bible, a few salvation tracts picked up from local revival meetings. They tell them to mumble a few hymns he'd learned on the farm before he went to a farm school. Create credibility among the gullible agents. Credibility is the magic word today. Oh, yeah, right. Right on, right on. <laughs> With credibility, you can always find some rich dummies who's got lots of dough but no brains. And they'll invest a fortune in a boat when they don't even know which end sails forward. Yeah, but you'd, you'd never fall into such a dumb trap, would you, old time? But I still don't understand. Just ask me, Mother Grant. What happens to the owner's of a stolen boat. Why, this rogue, the uh, sucker's trusted, just waits for a good storm. Then he just points a gun, like this one, at his victims, like this. And he orders them up on deck. And in seconds, the rays from the storm just take care of the owners. Victims of the Bermuda Triangle. Just like the newspaper said. You're right, Mother Grant dead right. But, uh, what if the victims refuse to go? Refuse to go? Yes. What if the victims won't do what the villain says? What if they refuse to go? What kind of a question is that for a helpless elderly man staring into the business end of a revolver? And if the man holding the gun is asked a question like that, what can he answer? What do you mean, what if they refuse to go? What if they refuse to be this bad man's suckers? Oh. Well, in that case, this fella just aim his gun at the two of them, pull the trigger twice like this... When I found that gun, Vernon, I removed the firing pin and dropped it overboard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see you did. Now, how'd you manage that? Farmers these days spend most of their lives with machinery. Taking apart a firearm is simpler than most jobs I used to have in a day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess it is, huh? Well, you spend a few years in the city, you forget what life on a farm is really like. Well. Well. In a case like this, a nasty pirate fella'd have to go at it the mess of way, wouldn't he? What would that be, Vernon? You'd have to use his pistol for a hammer and beat out the brains of his stubborn victims. But uh, he'd run into a problem there, too. Oh, really? Such as? Uh, one hint, Vernon. If you go on with this kind of work, don't ever call your elders old-timer. Oh, they don't like it. And what's more to the point, for your business, they don't trust anybody who does it. You remember I've been carving wood off and on ever since we put out sea? Yeah, 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 I remember well, Since I found that gun, I've been careful to keep the knife right here in my pocket. And you can see it's unusually sharp, and I'm quite expert with it. Well... More goes on the minds of you old codgers than one might think, huh? Now, I know, Vernon, at some point you're planning to throw that gun in my face. That's what I'd think of in your fix, but I advise you, don't try it. Why not? Well, in the first place, old codgers also dodge a lot quicker than you think. 
In the second place, the boat's pitching pretty wildly now, and the chances of your aim going true are very slight. And in the third place, if you try it, I shall most certainly stick you with this in the front and out the back. Nice old man like you. I've killed more hogs than you have mosquitoes, young man. Now, if I were you, I'd drop that gun. Thank you. Listen, you ice-blooded pig sticker. When you found that pistol, why didn't you just take it and shoot me? Without being sure what you were, why, that would have been murder, young man. Now, I have one more question for you. Uh, Seal hand me that watch. Yes, sir. What is George Willoughby's watch doing? Willoughby's watch? You're mad. With this message, Vernon. Murder. Come on now, who are you and what are you doing here? And what's that name you keep confusing with the harvester? Young man, are we the new tenants of the flamingo? Give me the watch. Get the sand back. Give me that. Help me, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right, but... I think Mr. Wallace may need it. A little nursing. I'll keep my eye on him, but if you can take a look at him. I'll just do that, Henry. Be careful, see you. I will. Here. Henry. No one can help Vernon now. Oh. oh my I I didn't mean to kill him. Honestly, Celia. I believe you, Henry. As he came at me, the, the boat lurched, and I fell right against his chest with... He was intending to kill us, dear. We were only defending ourselves. And you had an accident. Anyone could see that. Yes, 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 of course. It, at least I think so. What do you mean, Henry? Well, you know, you thought he was such a wonderful young man. Yes, I did. Clean cut. Courteous, considerate. Right, and helpful, and safe. Yes, but that was all a fake. He is... He was a thief and and a killer. Yes, we know that now, but who else knows it? Perhaps he's done this sort of thing before. Oh, I'm sure he has. But the only people who know that are at the bottom of the sea where he intended to put us. Something dropped out of his inner coat pocket. What? Well, his Bible. And those papers. Yeah, there. just really distracted me. See, it says on the cover here. Yes. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Oh, no. It's a message to us. No, Celia, you just said it was an accident. Yes, but you said who else would know it. Yes, 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 I did. Anybody else who knew him might have thought of him just as you did at first. Henry, there has to be some proof of who he was and what he was. Something we can show people and they'd be certain to believe us. Well, we've, we've never... We've never looked into his cabin. It wouldn't have been nice. Well, we'd better look now. Steady, steady. My dear. We're really getting rough. Yes. Here's his cabin. Oh, he's locked the door. Uh, he always did, but of course it is our boat, and I have a key, too. There we go. I found the light switch. Be careful. Oh, look. How neat everything is. The bed made, everything picked up. My goodness, our Raymond never kept a room like this, I must say. Oh, boys don't, you know, dear. At least not ordinary boys. Now, here's his suitcase. Yeah, let me get it up on the bed. It's locked. Well, open it with a knife. Henry, that's... That's the knife. I know. But I... I wiped the blood off on his clothes. I, here, let me get at that lock. Oh, Henry, I'm afraid. Of what now? We don't know what's inside the suitcase. No, but we've got to find out. <gasps> Why? It's full of... Of money. There must be hundreds of dollars in bills and, and also neatly bundled. You'd expect that. Where do you think you got him? I. Well, from from his evangelism, maybe. You remember he said he did take up collections, and sometimes there's lots of money in even one of those collections. So if anyone found him with all this money, he could say it was from the Lord for the Lord's work. Perhaps it was, Henry. 
He did seem like such a nice young man. Celia, have you forgotten the gun in his hand when he ordered us on deck? And the clicks when he tried to shoot us? But, Henry, maybe he thought we were trying to kill him. Maybe he was a nice young man, but he carried the gun to protect himself from... from people like us. Oh, come on. You don't really believe that. But other people might... They very well might, especially if they found us here with his corpse and his suitcase and all his money. Well, well, if they do that, no. No, by thunder, they won't do that. Why won't they? Henry? No one saw us leave. So if, if we just dispose of Vernon's body... Dispose? Chucked it overboard, Celia into the sea. But the body might someday wash ashore. Even so, they could never prove, never even suspect that the body came from this boat. But Henry... Yes? What if there's been a mistake? What kind of a mistake? I don't know if I knew. It it wouldn't be a mistake. My dear, there's always a possible mistake. But our worst mistake would be not to take reasonable precautions. Perhaps so, Henry. Then let's do it. Right away. Ah! Celia, what is it? Out the porthole there! Toward the horizon! I, I don't see anything. It's gone now. But there in the sky, there was a light! A light? Oh, you mean light? No, Henry, a light! Round, steady, in one place, glowing like a giant sea monster's eye. Celia, you're letting your imagination run away with you now. Well, you know, Vernon did say this is a very strange part of the ocean. Some people have brought back weird, weird, frightening tales. Who knows what might be out there? Celia, we have plenty of problems right inside this boat. Without worrying about spooks outside. Now, come on. Let's get this young man overboard. Of course, Henry. You know best. Vincent Price again. And here's the fourth act of The Voyage of No Return. You know, Henry... Yes, my love? When we disposed of Vernon... Yes, Celia? Well, it'll be just as he said. What do you mean? He was right. Neither you nor I know the first thing about navigating a boat, even in perfect weather. We'll never... Come on, Celia. Let's get back to Vernon. We've got to face this situation as we've faced everything else for the last 43 years. One thing at a time. Yes, Henry. Of course. (gasps) Steady. There's nothing to fear from Vernon anymore. Poor boy. He looks almost like our Raymond asleep, doesn't he? Well, Raymond never tried to kill us that I know of. Come on. Got to get rid of him. One thing, he's just bled in front there. There won't be any messy cleaning up to do. No, it won't be like the time Raymond cut his foot with the axe. Oh, dear. My dear, I, I'm afraid I'm not quite strong enough to do this alone. Could you, would you take his other leg and help me? Yes, of course, Henry. You see, you... Uh, let me get this door open. Uh, there. Uh, don't go out on deck. Just push him out of the way. We'll take care of the rest. Oh, Henry! The boat gave such a lurch and flung me out here on the deck. I know. Me too. And it slammed the door after. Where? Where is Vernon? He went over with that first wave. Then... We'll never see him again. No, but if we don't get back inside fast, we'll join him. Now, watch your footing. Ah! Water's made the deck as slippery as oil. Ah! No, 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 it's all right. Ah! Just a few more inches and... Henry! That's 
I saw something. Do it, 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 it could have been. And that light hanging in the sky, don't you understand? It's a helicopter from that ship. Yes. Yes, that, that would explain that voice, but, but why in this terrible storm? Oh, Henry, darling, it's all too clear. Vernon was a pirate. Oh, one man, a pirate, Celia. For heaven's sake, pirates travel together in. Oh. in Oh, good heavens. Yes, exactly. In ships like that one out there. They might even be going to land on our deck with that helicopter, and then they'll... Hey, Celia, listen to me now. Go back to Vernon's room, turn out the light, and lock the door. Do you hear? Unlock it only if you hear me say so. Well, what will you do? This knife isn't much, but they'll have to get past me to get to you. No! I won't leave you, Henry. Whatever is going to happen to you is going to happen to us. Celia, I insist. I demand. Henry, it's going to be all right. What? What's going to be all right? In that flash of lightning, I saw the helicopter right out that porthole. And below it, two men on a rope ladder. Well, then they'll be here in no time at all. Yes, but on the underside of the helicopter, I saw red stripes and the words United States Coast Guard. Oh, God, thank God, thank God. We'll be safe now. And I... I suppose there's no sign of Vernon. Not a trace. Oh. Oh, but Henry, you know that money. We must try to get it back to the people it belongs Celia, to. Celia, there's no way to find out who they were or who owns which part of what. What do you think we should do with it, Henry? Perhaps some worthy oh, cause. Oh, good heavens. What, Henry? That money. If those Coast Guardsmen should get suspicious... But why should they? They said... You said there wasn't any trace... Of Vernon. But how could we explain all that money in his suitcase? Oh, I see what you mean. It'll look more than ever as though we've killed Vernon for his money and disposed of him. Come on, open up. It's the United States Coast Guard. Uh, open the door. It's... It's not locked. Don't move. We've got you covered. I'm... I'm not moving. Where? Where's the man who was just with you? Henry, he's right. He's... He was here just a moment ago. I don't know where he is now. Watch her. I'll look around. Uh, we saw him in the searchlight. He has to be here. Oh, Henry's here, young man. He was just standing beside me. But you be careful what you do. Henry may be frightened, but he wouldn't hurt a fly. And don't you hurt him. Don't worry, man. We know what we're doing. Where's the crew for this boat, man? There's no crew, young man. Uh, we're checking all boats from southern Florida now out at sea. Why should you do that? We're looking for a young man. We've trailed as far as a place called Benson's Cove. There we lost him. His name is Vernon Wallace. Oh, what about this? Vernon Wallace. Oh! What have you done to my husband? Well, uh, take it easy, lady. Now, just relax. Henry! Uh, no one will be hurt. What have you done? Uh, no, no, uh, all oh. right, Celia. Just a little distraction for the officers. Davidson, I think the storm has jarred this man's brain. How so, sir? Well, I found him in the aft cabin, standing on the bunk, throwing his suitcase out the porthole. When I ordered him to put up his hands, he tried to climb out the porthole himself. 
he didn't stop when I fired a shot into the air. I, I had to drag him back. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm all right now, officer. I, I'm afraid the terror of being adrift in this storm unhinged me for a moment. Don't worry about it, sir. We all have our wobbly moments in the face of the unknown. Hey, this night must have been pretty terrible for both of you. Oh, it was that, young man. Yeah, well, I could tell you some stories. Not now. Yes, sir. Uh, you'd probably like to have Davidson here pilot the boat back to harbor for you. Oh, we'd be so grateful, officer. The helicopter and the patrol boat out there will both be keeping an eye on you. Uh, splendid. Before I leave, is there anything else? Why? Uh, what else would there be? I was hoping you might be able to give us some word about young Vernon Wallace. Why? The authorities want to talk with him. He fits the description of a mystery man who's been specializing in robbery and murder on the high seas. Oh. Oh, there's some harebrained talk about a Vernon Wallace being connected with a 20th century pirate gang. Uh, that's crazy, of course. Oh, yes. Uh, crazy. But since you can't tell me anything about him, uh, I'll be on my way. Uh, wait. Uh, yes, sir? I, uh... I do have something to tell you about Vernon Waltz. Henry. Henry, is this wise? Wise and urgent. As you say, Commander, the shock of all this did unhinge me for the moment, though not quite in the way you think. Why are you doing this, Henry? Because there is a man in Benson's Cove who must be arrested at the earliest possible instant. Benson's Cove, sir? Gregor Marikian, the man who sold us the flamingo. I think I can tell you things you ought to know about him, about international pirates, and... and about... Vernon Wallace. I'm especially glad you changed your mind about Wallace. Especially glad about Wallace? Well, you can see lying right there, sir. His name on the cover of that Bible. And the Bible soaked in fresh blood. Naturally, uh, we'd have always wondered. <laughs> The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Voyage of No Return, was written by Edward Borgers and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Jeanette Nolan, Harley Bear, and Eddie Firestone. Featured in the cast were John Shea and Michael Rye. The music for Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. Have you ever thought of going on a real African safari without benefit of travel guide and phony hoopla, climaxing with a lion hunt? This is Arch Overler. I'm not going to start this by modestly telling you that I'm an ordinary guy. I'm not. Neither are you. 
whether you're male or female, all of us are quite extraordinary. Members of a species that can fling ourselves to the stars in pioneering ecstasy or slaughter each other with atomic fire over transient differences of transient opinions. All this is to prepare you for our going on a lion hunt. Yes, you and I, ordinary, extraordinary people on a safari in Africa. Now, it all happened about a handful of years ago when, with the very first tape recorded across the border into what was then a politically unsophisticated Africa, I went on a lion hunt. After many months in the so-called dark continent, watching the visitors from all over the world being crisscrossed and double-crossed by so-called experts and explorers and exploiters, my eyes, to say the least, were very weary and very, very skeptical. Let me tell you of that lion hunt, yours and mine. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Lion Hunt by Arch Obler. Our stars, Elliot Lewis and Ben Wright. This is Vincent Price again. I'm often asked, where do those writers get the ideas for those plays? Well, I can certainly answer that question as far as the author of the play you are about to hear is concerned. Award-winning playwright Arch Obler actually went to Africa a while back, and he actually went on a lion hunt against a rogue lion who had killed a native. So the events you are about to hear, yes, and even the animal sounds are really factual. So get your pith helmet on and check your cholera shots as we start on our safari through Arch Obler's extraordinary play, Lion Hunt. Now, a lion hunt in yesterday's Africa didn't happen easily. You rode many miles along hot, dust-clouded, rutted roads that snapped auto springs like tired bits of toothpick. Then you made camp and you got ready for the hunt. Native scouts to be sent out to find a lion's spoor, a zebra to be killed and the meat staked out as bait, guns to be checked and ammunition ready. But always a lion hunt was waving and waving. The hush talk when you sat in the black African night, listening to the sounds of the night jungle, your only companion one, Jock Harder, the so-called master white hunter, master at so many uninflated dollars per hour. Mr. Robler. Yes, Mr. Harder. Uh, did you know there was a leopard here last night within a few yards of the tent? This tent? This tent. Well, now. And how can you tell it was a leopard? Well, you can tell a leopard by his grunt. He makes a noise like this. <coughs> Well, we we certainly don't need a throat-clearing leopard tonight, do we? <laughs> well, you never can tell. Um, might I ask, uh, have you ever hunted before? Oh, of course. I caught a frog, a big one, in a forest preserve right outside the wilds of Chicago. Uh, is that a wee bit of a joke? <laughs> it's a matter of opinion. You know, this is certainly like something out of Hemingway. Hemingway? He was an American writer, a very chested fellow. Wrote about the real Africa. Is that a fact? As facts go. Uh, tell me, Mr. Harder. Confidentially, do you go out on many of these pay-as-you-go lion hunts? Only when the officials tell me there's a rogue lion killing off the cattle of the Maasai. A rogue lion, huh? Eh? Aye. Uh, your gun bearers are so quiet. Aye. Are they Maasai? Hmm. Wakamba. I keep wondering, where are the drum beats, the dancing, the mumbo jumbo of the travel circular? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, the hyena, big one. 
Yeah, they're always big, aren't they, when it's too dark to see them. They're only scavengers, aren't they? Aye, but not only. What do you mean? They hunt in packs sometimes when they're hungry. I've, I've seen the thigh bone of a man's leg crushed by one bite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you really think we'll get a lion tonight? Well, you never know. Eh? Plenty in this district. This is real Maasai lion country. You'll hear the animals soon when they come to the water hole. They go... Oh! <laughs> Quite an animal sound man, aren't you? Mr. Harder, I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. I think it's about time. All this sitting out here in the blackness waiting for a lion to bite into that zebra meat is very, uh, what's the word? The full of atmosphere, regular Hollywood stuff. But truthfully, isn't it all a shade, forgive the word, phony? You don't answer me? All right, that's answer enough. Believe me, I understand. You paid professionals are... Serving up thrills to the American visitors at so many dollars per thrill. Okay. A lion hunt is supposed to be a prime kick, a thrill experience. So here we sit in the dark. But, but I happen to know that you are king of the beasts as a scavenger. Yeah, a, a carrion eater like those hyenas out there. Oh, if you wound him and push him, he'll turn and fight. But hell, a six-inch rat will do that. So what do you say we close out the farce and I'll pay you off and we'll get back to Nairobi? As you wish. Uh, Mr. Obler, may I tell you about a pair of those scavengers? Uh, Mr. Harder, do I have a choice? Well, it was over 40 years ago. It's uh, all a matter of public record. They were building the first railroad in East Africa. The heat, the uh, sickness, hmm, Africa itself. Well, it's not going too well for the thousands of coolies who'd been brought all the way from India to cut the jungle brush and graze the way for the laying of the tracks. But uh, nothing stopped the work until the rails reached a place called Tsavo. And an engineer by the name of Patterson. I absolutely won't believe it. Now, take it easy, Mr. Patterson. It's much too hot a day. But it's my responsibility. If the work isn't done, I get the blame. I fail. No one else. I described ten grains of cream. They're liars. That's what they are. Any excuse to get out of work. Well, I won't have it. They will work. No, Patterson. You're only exciting yourself. Neither Always thing. after you with a million imaginary sicknesses to keep from working, aren't they? Well, this is parallel. You know medicine. All right. I know lions. Man, look for yourself. Hundreds of coolies, campfires. No lion born of a lion would ever come within a mile of this place. But those two men have disappeared. Run away, that's all. Run away from work and the others are using it as an excuse. But it won't work. Not with me. I'm shoving this railroad through and no lazy, work-dodging pack of rice... <laughs> Cousin, what... I heard, I heard. It's just part of their little game to make me believe. So clever, aren't they? Job's getting too tough, so they think I'll ship him back to Bombay with a thank you. Sorry I took your time. Stop, well, it won't work. Stop, come, Shaitan, he has killed Sam. Stop, stop it, stop. man. Stop clawing stop, at me. Stop, stop, come, Sam. Patterson, Patterson, let him talk. Abdullah, what's the matter? What, what? Simba, Shaitan, Simba, he killed my friend. Come, Sam. You too, you drunken idiot. Get out no, of here. No, Patterson, leave him alone. We better go see. Come, come See come. what? Bunch of drunken Indians in a brawl? There is no lion in this camp. There never was, and there never will be. We now return to Arch Obler's story of Africa. Abdullah, Abdullah, get out of the way. How can we see where to go if you keep blocking us off? You'll see well enough. Another native with a knife at his back. Look at them all, around their fires, laughing at us. Two fools full of panic. Mm. Which tent, Abdullah? Where? Here, here, Saib. This, this is one. 
This is where Sid... All right, all right. Pull back the tent flap so we can see. No, no, I... Give uh, me the please. lantern, you yellow... Partisan, wait. Let me... Oh. Oh. I... Dear God. I... No. Oh, wait a minute. I... This man. Look closely, Doctor. A knife fight. Yeah. Someone ripped him. I mean, someone... With teeth that tore him in half, bit through his skull. I saw the engineer saw and believed at last that a, a lion had come through the fires, through the thousands of men, and had killed and eaten Why are you shooting? Sighting in my gun, Doctor. Just sighting it in. Ah. It's been a long time since I used this one. I wanted it ready. For tonight? Yes. But uh, how can you be sure the lion will return? A man-eating lion is one that's old or crippled. Can't catch game in the normal manner. So he turns to killing man as easy prey. This one must be very desperate for food. Sick. That's why he takes these chances. Yeah. That's why you can depend on the fact that he'll come back as soon as it's dark to finish his meal. So that night, I maybe a night like this one, the two men waited in a little thorn shelter by the body of the dead. Yes. How much longer? I don't know. His hunger will bring it. Oh, my legs, so cramped. Don't move. Oh, so dark. The moon. How far is the time for clouds? There's light enough. Remarkable. What? Oh, all those, all those thousands of coolies and. Not a sound in camp. They're all waiting, just just, just, just waiting. I, I, I wonder if... Quiet. What? Shh. The brush. The head. Yes. Coming. Closer. I, I can't see. Come ahead, you devil. Person? Shh, shh, shh. What? What is... There's something behind us. Oh! Doctor! What? Blasted clouds, I can't see. <laughs> Doctor! Doctor! Flame gun jammed. Doctor! I can't see what. I, I, I'm here. Oh, oh, my back. Lantern. Where? Matches. Oh! Doctor! Oh! Doctor! Oh! oh. Where are you? What? Here! 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 Let me see. What? Oh, my back. It's torn. Look. Claws. But how? The lion was ahead of us. Oh, hold the, hold the lantern. Hoy. Hoy. The body. It's gone. Hardison. Listen to me. There were two. Two lions. <laughs> Man! Man, listen to me! Be still! Nyamazini! Kaparam! Yes, sir. Tell them to be still and I will tell the truth to them. Yazini! Yazini! Kapar Saudi! What is Shabbat Shabbat? Tell them Singh died as a brave man dies. Singh, get you up! Upon a Cuba! Tell them that now that we know our enemy, we will destroy them. No lion born of a lion can stand up against a high powered rifle bullet. Neno, Hilini Kushara! What is Simba? Cuba Burzati! 
Kapar, what did that one say? He said, what proof is there that the white man's bullet can kill Shaitan the devil? Listen to me, all of you. Listen, you have come here to Africa to build a railroad, the first, and that railroad will be built. Two lions, mangy, toothless lions, driven to human flesh out of their very weakness. These miserable creatures cannot stop us if we act and behave like men. I give you my pledge. They will be destroyed. <laughs> From this moment on, I dedicate myself to their destruction. So go back to work. It is broad daylight. You are all safe. As soon as it's dark, I will track down those miserable creatures. <laughs> Kaparam! What? Sir, at the edge of the crowd, the lions, they have seized the man. My rifle. Get me my rifle. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Rowe. In broad daylight, as if to fling Patterson's words in his face, the man-eaters came back and each seized a coolie and disappeared into the thorn bush jungle. And Patterson saw through the swirl of panicking natives, he saw that far from crippled, aged creatures, these, these were great lions in their prime, deliberately man-eaters. <laughs> Wake up, wake up. Hmm? Wake up, listen. What? What? What the devil is this? See for yourself. On the hillside. What? The man. What are they? It's a death chant. The call is. They've been joined by the Maasai. The chant? What? I've heard it once before, many years ago, during a cholera plague. They're saying that they are going to die. No. I'll stop that. No, no, wait, Patterson, wait. Wait, 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 wait. This is just... Stop he's pulling at me. I've got to... Listen to me, I beg you. I, 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 I've got to tell you. Uh, about me. What? Well, please, please stay and listen to me. All right, all right. Uh, well, no, I'm not a young man anymore. I, I'm an old man. And during the night when I, when I couldn't sleep, all thoughts came back to me. Uh, memories when I, when I was as you are, young and... Full of the fire of young blood. Listen to me. I've got to stop their panic. Doctor, finish what you say. Well, I'm going away. What? What are you talking about? To Mombasa. To Ireland. I want to live long enough to see Ireland again. But, but if you go, they'll panic. With you gone, they'll... I'm not panicking. I, I told you. I, I haven't the time left you have... Get someone else to help you. Damn the railroad. Damn Africa. We return to Lion Hunt as night deepens in the jungle. So, in the night, the old doctor crept away and sent back a district police official. And on another night, young Patterson and the police inspector hunted through the brush once more. Wait! Wait, inspector! I've lost the trail. I lost it ten miles back. I never dreamed that going would be like this. All right. All right. Rest a minute. Gladly. You should have sent for me sooner, Patterson. Why didn't you? I, I thought I could get them myself. How long has it been? A week. And a dozen men have died. Yes, indeed, young man, you should have sent for me sooner. Well, no matter. We'll get those devils today, and that'll end it. Will we? What? What's that, you say? Nothing. I... I mean, let's get on. It's getting late. Oh, of course, of course. 
Hmm. Spool's mighty cold. I'm not so sure that this is the way. If we could only... Look, man. Look. I see. I see. Stopped here to eat. No doubt of that. Who was this poor devil? Kaparim. Eh? My personal boy. Interpreter. Is that a fact? When did this... Temp ship... next to mine. Last night. Look there. That scratching trail. His fingers. The poor devil's fingers scratched the ground as the lion carried him into the brush. Patterson, here. What are you doing? Bury him. He was only sixteen. He told me only yesterday morning he'd come to Africa to earn enough so that his family... I swear. I swear, you devils. I'll get you. Well, it's one thing to take an oath. It's another to do. And the days crawled under the hot sun, and the nights went swiftly, and men died. Twenty, thirty, forty and were dragged into the bush and eaten. But the murderers lived. No matter how Patterson tried, ambush, poison, the man-eating lions of Sabo lived. No beasts ever were more hunted or were more clever in escaping the hunter or more terrible in their murderous fury. And the thousands of coolies waited in terror. No way to go back through the jungle. All they could do was wait for the lions to come for them. All right, men, stand clear. Release the rope. Well, Patterson, I must say, you built a good trap, yes, eh? Huh, indeed. I hope so, Inspector. But will those devils really come this way? Now I'm the one who questions. Oh, I need a drink. A dozen on duty or not. Bring up the goat, men. Inside the trap, you fools. Inside. Up with the gate. All right, now time securely. Mumbiota di Nutaku. Patterson, do you realize I've been out here in the jungle in a week? Natives dragged every night, and I haven't fired a single shot. All I think about is Mombasa and whiskey. All right, now take your places, all of you. The moment the trap drops, shoot. Shoot and keep shooting. Another thing I never thought to see, these bikers actually helping. All right, all of you. Up the trees in silence. Owezi kusana kokwa. Itorabi lakima naukiri. Better. You get up to the platform, too. I'll follow. All right. Oh, yes, of course. Twelve feet up. Is it enough? I mean, what if they leap it? I know the head. Oh, I was so sure. Now I don't know anything. Perhaps you better get back to camp, Inspector. And be dragged out of the tent by my heels like that poor shrieking... No, thank you. I'll stay up here where at least... One week ago I was telling you to keep your head. Now I keep hearing the screams. I keep hearing All the... All right, Inspector. Sorry. Patterson, listen. Perhaps I'd better get down from here... I don't feel as if I, as if I could stand another night of waiting. Quiet, man. What? Shh. What? Listen. Something below. No. To the right. No, there's nothing. I see nothing. Got him. He's in the trap. Shoot. Shoot, man. Shoot. Gun, what did I do with my gun? 
We got him! We got him! Felix! And give me some more bullets! All right, hop on out! Hop on out! My horse! The lantern! Light it! Hold it high! Oh, we got him all right, Patterson. At least one of them finished. My horse! Stop fumbling! Hold the lantern! Oh, no! What? What? What is that? The trap is empty. The bullets broke away the bars. He got out. No, no. We got one. I saw it. Blood trial. Come. Got to see there's blood. What in the name of hell? The shrieking. The shrieking again. Come on. Inspector, no. Stop. Stop it, man. I've got to get to camp. I can't leave you. Inspector. What? What? Shaitan. Simba. They're in the hospital. Killing the sick. Another dozen dead. Two bodies dragged through the thorn fence and gone. On the next morning, the inspector stumbled back along the rusting iron rails away from the lions of Savo. And behind him, running in panic, went another 500 coolies, willing to face the dangers of the long, terrible way back to Mombasa rather than the greater terror of the lions. And in the British House of Lords, a statement was made. Three weeks delay, my lord. Three weeks in idleness, while our investment world asks why. It's hard to believe, my lord, that in this age, in these enlightened times, our nation's great colonial endeavor must wait upon the will of beasts of prey. So-called man-eaters, no less. We return to our story of Lion Hunt as the age-old duel of man versus animal continues. Aye, and every night more men died. High walls of thorn and bush, fire barricades, nothing helped. Did Patterson hunt here, then? The lions struck there. Did the natives dig caves? Well, the lions dug them out. Did they hide in the thorn trees? The lions dragged them down. And every night the shrieks arose, and another... And another of the poor coolies tore at the ground while the great cat dragged them away. And Patterson was alone now. No one to help him. Grew old in a night. Until a final night. Sab, do not go out there this night. I beg you. What? What did you say? Tomorrow, we will all go. All who are still here. You leading us back to Mombasa. We will leave this jungle to the devils and go. Hmm? Tomorrow, Saab? Tomorrow. I don't know tomorrow. My gun. Hand it to me. Oh, Saab, Allah, the understanding, the all-powerful watch over you tonight. There is no moon, and Shaitan come when the moon is hidden. Tree seems higher every night. comes when there is no moon. Shaitan. Devil. Are you devils, Simba? Are you both full of, as they say, the evil of all the men you have eaten? Uh, 
sleep. If I could sleep one night. No, no. Wake. Stay awake. Stay awake for the two of you. Are you two? Or are you all the lions of all Africa come here to kill all of us? Leave the jungle full of lions dancing on our bones. Oh, tired. 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 Jungle so quiet. Waiting. Waiting. Huh? Yes. I hear you. Hear you. Waiting for you. But you won't come for me, will you? Every night. Same thing. Hear you. But you don't come for me. Devils. What? Moon. Where did you... The moon. See you. Devil, I see you. There, at the edge. Coming for me. Yes. Closer. Closer. Moon, moon. Stay out. Just another second. Another second. Now. Miss Fire. Miss Fire. I can't. Devil. Gun. I will fire. Got you. Devil. Got you. Climb down. You can see. No. Moon's gone. Dark. So dark. You're dead. One of you must be dead. Who? The other one. Stalking me. I hear you. I hear you, devil. If the moon... So dark. Oh, God, let the moon... Just a little... I hear you. You're not afraid, are you? You know I can't see. Well, if only the moon... It will. It will. Moon, I see you, devil. By the dead one. Devil turning to me. Coming to me. Slow. All right. Now I'll end you, too. Jammed. Rifle jammed. Devil. Are you the devil? Slow. Slow. No hurry. I... You know. Why have you stopped? What are you waiting for? The moon to go? Come for me in the light. Come. Come for me, devil. Moon. Gun fired. Hit you. Hit you. No. Getting up. No more bullets. Fallen. Fallen again. Dead. You're dead. You're... No. Up again. Coming again. Devil. Devil. No. Fallen. The last time. You won't get up again, will you? 
you won't get up again. And so they died. The man-eaters of Tsavo. After killing, some say, over a hundred human beings, two lions, they stopped for a little while in the building of the past trail road to bring our Western civilization into their jungle world. Huh? Perhaps the lions knew. Eh? No matter. Scavenger, Mr. Obler? No, I don't think so. This is Arch Obler again. I promised you a lion hunt. I apologize. Because the real hunt happened many years ago, and only bones are left today. The skeletons of the man-eaters, they're in a museum of all places in Chicago. And the bones of the hunters, Engineer Patterson, the inspector, the hundreds of workmen who completed the railroad, all are moldering dust in the endless chain of life and death that links us all on this small, spinning globe of home Earth. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Lion Hunt, was written, produced, and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Elliot Lewis and Ben Wright. Featured in the cast were Richard Thiel, Hal Perry, and Jack Crucian. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. We bring you a story of a, quote, genius child. A child whom I sincerely hope is completely unlike your own. This is Vincent Price once more. A fire is burning, a tremendous fire. That is the event with which Peabody Award-winning playwright Arch Obler begins his story. A horrible fire is excitement enough, but I promise you far greater emotional involvement as you listen to my friend Arch Obler's play, House on Fire.
Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, House on Fire by Arch Ogler. Our stars, Vic Perrin, Virginia Gregg, and Jack Crucian. And now the first act of an extraordinary play, House on Fire. Hey, you. Get out of there. What are you... It's just all right, Mr. Fireman. I, I live in there. I mean... Get out of here. What are you trying to do, get killed? No, 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 no. I just wanted to... See, my name is Veneman. I don't I care live... who you are. Back at the fire lines yeah, now. Get yeah. out of here. Yes, sir. I'm going. I'm going. Mr. Bannerman, are you all right? Yes, I... Oh, Miss Seag, mm-hmm. I didn't see you, you know, with all the smoke. Uh, are they still up there? Did you hear anything? Oh, who knows? The whole eighth floor. Oh, my God. Oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I know, I, I know. It's, it's, it was so beautiful this morning. Such happiness. Oh, I shouldn't have said those terrible things about him. I shouldn't what have. What terrible things? Well, what did you say? In the elevator about the boy. Yeah? I shouldn't have said those things in the elevator. He frightens me. Huh? Absolutely, that child frightens me. Me, he does not frighten. A boy with such eyes? <laughs> Genius. So personally, I do not believe in pushing children too fast. A child is a child, not a scientific curiosity. To me, he appears to be a very normal child. Normal. Well, look who's here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did anybody press down? Oh, oh, I forgot. Good morning, Miss Elias. My heartiest congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Bannerman. You also have my best wishes on your good fortune. Thank you. Such a boy. $12,000 scholarship. $12,000. It says right in the Sunday paper, Mark Elias absolutely first in the National Science Scholarship. All right, all right. She knows already. Please. You'd think people could walk down from a second floor. Good morning. Good morning. Say, aren't you the Mrs. Elias from the eighth floor? Yes, I am. Congratulations, I read about your boy. It's wonderful. A college scholarship at his age. Thirteen. <laughs> Next month. Do you know what my Nathaniel's high IQ is? But I don't believe in pushing him. A genius you can push. Oh, genius, I don't know. All I know is we're going to have a little gathering tonight and... This is very nice. Parties, I like. Well, it's just for the family. You know, my husband's mother died only four months ago, but my husband felt anyway we should have the family in for a quiet little celebration. For the boy's sake, you shouldn't think we're ignoring such a wonderful thing he did. And what they do with my list. Well, congratulations again. It's a wonderful thing for the whole building. The whole building. Thank you very much. Now, where's my grocery list? I personally do not believe in pushing children. I made out a list of the things I need for the party. Maybe I dropped it. Uh, 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 don't, don't worry, Mrs. Elias. I'll hold the door. So where is the proud papa this beautiful Sunday morning? No, oh, he's busy calling up everybody. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know where it comes from, the scientific business with the boy. Sam, my husband, he can't oil a squeaky hinge. And I... I can't even hold on to a grocery list. We now return to Arch Obler's play, House on Fire. Operator, listen. I dialed and I dialed and nothing but busy. Sure, I dialed the right number. My own brother, if I don't know... Oh, hello, Jack. Why all the busy telephones? Is that a fact? You've been calling up everybody, too, huh? So, try to get here around 6.30, huh, Jack? No, no, I tell you, it's no party, just ice cream, beer, just a little kind of thing for the kid. After all, how many people in our family ever won a $12,000 scholarship to a college? Him excited, 
Listen, when the telegram came last night, it was like somebody told him it was going to be morning in the morning. I tell you, ice water. Are you kidding? He's in his room making with another experiment. Who knows? He asked me if he and Shirley could use the tape recorder, so I should say no to a genius. Yeah. Can you imagine? Twelve thousand bucks. Oh, Jack, uh, somebody's at the door. Yeah. I'll see you tonight. Now, don't be late. Okay. Okay, I'm coming. I'm positively coming. So what's... Oh. Well, sis, come on in. Come on in. Thank you, Sam. Here's, um... Is Clara here? No, no. She's out shopping. That's what I called about. We decided to have a little party tonight. Just for all of us in celebration of the boy. Come on. Sit down. <sighs> Well, that's what I came by to talk to you about. When you called last night, it was so hard to believe. Mm. When I read the paper this morning, I I cried and cried. What is there to cry about? $12,000? To us. To us. Such a thing could happen. Yeah, but why shouldn't it? Isn't it about time our family got a break? You got a break when you married Clara. Oh. I often wondered how you ever got the courage to run off with her. Courage? Me? Don't you know yet it was Clara? She's got uh, a normal kind of uh, strength in her that that I and you and Roy and Jack... It... Look who I'm telling. What's the matter with me? This is a day to be happy, full of celebration. Where are you going? Claire will be back in a minute. No, no, I should get back. Ah, wait a minute. Now, look, Harriet, I know you well enough. You don't run in and out in just a minute. Please, Sam, I I just wanted to congratulate you about the boy. Harriet. Okay, sit down and tell me. All right. Okay. Now, tell me. I don't think I can. You used to talk to me. Yes. Tell me. I've met somebody. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. No, no, listen to me. It isn't. I'm frightened and I'm miserable and I don't know what to do. When, When Mama died, I thought, all right, now it's over. Why isn't it, Sam? Why? A person can't change years of habits overnight. Who can? He's an older man. I thought, that's good. That's very good for somebody like me. That's what I thought. Where did you meet him? Oh, at the office about a month ago. He took me out to lunch. I I found myself laughing like I never thought I could. Hmm. He's got such a sense of humor. (laughs) Such stories. Oh, better than you hear on TV. (laughs) I went to dinner with him a couple of times. He likes music, too. Good. He he took me to some concerts. Hmm. I've never had such seats. Oh, main floor. And now, all of a sudden... He wants me to go away with him next week. Oh? His uh, wife thinks it's going to be a business trip for a month. He's driving west, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. You can't go. Can't. You just said it. He's married. Oh, Sam. Does everybody live in such a nightmare? Does everybody... I don't know. Is the tape winding on all right? Yes, Mark. Keep watching it. I'm watching it. It's all wound up. Okay, turn it off. Okay, it's off, Mark. What are you going to do now? Well, my quarter heads are dirty. I'll have to clean them. Uh, Can you hand me that cotton? Yeah. Will you have to go away... Go away where? You know, where you won. Oh, of course not. Not for two or three years. It's for college. Oh. Well, they're all clean. Now, we'll try it again. All of it? 
Oh, no, 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 just that one part. Are you going to do the whole thing at the party tonight? Uh-huh. Can I ask you one thing, Mark? Huh? Can I ask you one thing? Well, okay. Will it really work? I mean, will it really bring back the dead? <laughs> Sam, put all the beer in the refrigerator so it'll get good and cold. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I hope I've got enough corned beef. Huh? I said I hope I've got enough corned beef. <laughs> Who's worried about the corned beef? It's the beer. Uh, you know my brother Jack when he gets started. I don't know. You don't know what? Now, don't start <sighs> marshing. I don't know if it's right to have beer when the party's in honor of the boy. I told Jack we'll have beer, so we got to have beer. At least it's better than the whiskey he used to guzzle. Did I ever tell you the time? Cut it... some bread. Why don't you get it cut already? The same question, the same answer. Because cut already, it gets dried out. All day long, those kids cooped up in that room. Go tell them to come out and get dressed. Ah, uh, this time, this time. Oh, look who's their new champion all of a sudden. So until last night, who was yelling the boy should go out and play, become a Pete Rose. So, how should I know we had a prize winner? Tell me the truth, Clara. Where did schnooks like you and me get such a kid? Oh, well, listen, in my family, we've got plenty bright people. A doctor, a lawyer. All right. All right. And say what you, what you want about her, your own mother. She was a pretty smart one. Yeah. Where are you going? Wash my hands. Fifteen times a day. I feel like a dirty hypocrite. What? Where's the towel? Where it always is. Apologizing to Roy and my sister and Jack on the telephone this morning because we're having this party so soon after. Now, what's wrong with that? Just proper respect to the dead. For God's sake, Clara, don't you give me that. Who in the family didn't hate her guts? Name me one, just one. Oh, Sam. So, why do we play games, all of us? Who are we trying to kid about Mama? You... You shouldn't talk like that. You shouldn't talk like that. Why shouldn't I talk? What do you want me to get? Uh, 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 ulcers of the stomach? Not talking? It's been twisted up inside of me. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I've wanted to say this for months, and I'm going to say it now. When I saw her coffin going into the ground, it was like I started living again. Reborn or something. That's one for the book, huh? My ma dies, and I'm reborn. Sam, Sam. And Jack, Jack stopped drinking whiskey. And you know yourself, Harriet's like a new person, dressing up and making like a woman instead of an old bag or something. And my brother Roy's got life in him. He, he was like a nothing. Now he's running the business, a man. That's enough, Sam. You better go and tell the kids to get dressed. Oh, and the kids. For the first time since they were born, they're like our kids. Oh, and Sam, please. Admit I... it. Always at her place, day and night, Saturdays and Sundays. Who saw them? Who knew them? The junk she fed them, their bellies, their minds. Sam, and... I can't listen anymore. She's gone. So what's the use about talking about such things? My father used to say, do only one thing for the dead. Forgive. One thing I'll never forgive her for. That terrible thing she said about them on her deathbed. Never, never. Please, Sam. Go tell the children to get ready. <laughs> We return to our story, House on Fire. What should have been a happy time in the history of the Elias family is turning into revelations of horror on horror. Sam, would you please get the door? I'm fixing up the plates. Oh, that man... Oh, 
Mrs. Bennett, how nice. You'll forgive me if I'm intruding, but I heard the talk around the building about the party for your boy, and I didn't have anything to do, so I made him a little cake. Why, that's wonderful. How very nice of you. Oh, it's just one of them ready mixes, but I know how little boys like chocolate cake. Yeah, and big boys. <laughs> oh, my husband, too. <laughs> Well, I won't get in your way. No. Oh, now, please stay. If you want me to. Of course. Uh, could I help, please? I'd love it. Well, just tell me what. Um, the cheese. If you'd cut the cheese. No. No, better yet. Put the chopped liver on a little cracker on the big plate. Now, wait. I'll get your apron. Who needs an apron? I've just got to wash my hands. Where are the children? Oh. They've been cooped up in Mark's room all day. He's got some kind of new experiment going, and as usual, Shelley's helping him. She's crazy about helping him. Mm, wonderful. What did you say? I was thinking about all this happening to your boy. It's wonderful. For me, too. I'm sorry. I don't understand. Well, every time I see your child in the elevator, so sweet, so polite, I think of my baby. He passed away? Yes. I'm sorry. When? Oh, so long ago. <laughs> I found out I was pregnant a month after I got married. We were in an accident. I lost the baby. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, it was so long ago. But today, when I was thinking about my baby, I was thinking a crazy thing. Please tell me. All right. Well, all these years since it happened, I've been very religious. And today, like I said, all of a sudden I got to thinking about my baby. And I got to thinking about all the people who have died since the world began. Millions and millions. I was thinking, if there is a heaven, how could I find my baby? I never saw him, his face, all those millions and millions of people. How would I find him? How would I know him? Hmm. I guess I don't know much about such things. I guess nobody knows. Why, why don't you stay and have dinner with us? Oh, no. No, you were absolutely right. This must be just for the family. Well, we sure thank you for the beautiful cake. Have a beautiful party with your beautiful family. I... I hope so. Sam, I gotta hand it to you. Imported beer, no less. Hand me that bottle, brother of mine. Jack, maybe enough, huh? Well, it's a party, isn't it? Hey, Sam... How about some entertainment? Four times the floor show. <laughs> Listen to him. How much did you put down for the cover charge? <laughs> Marcus, uh, you know I never got to see a prize-winning, uh, what you call it? Exhibit, Roy, exhibit. Okay, exhibit. Yeah, well, what was it, Sam? Don't ask me. Ask the boy scientist. Tell your Uncle Roy, Mark. I read an oscilloscope for waveform analysis. So? Now you know. Well, sure I know. They had one of popular mechanics in the ads. War surplus. He didn't buy. He made it. Well, I gotta go. Nature calls. <sighs> no pain, no pain at all. Entertainment yet. I've got entertainment, Papa. Huh? Oh, sure. The tape recorder. Go get it. Yes, Papa. You need help? Oh, no, thank you, Papa. Shirley, where are you going? I better go help him. All right. She's crazy about helping him. Oh, that's very nice. Sisters helping brothers. Harriet, come on, sis. You sat all through the dinner not saying a word. Is that something new with her? What's wrong, sis? Tell me. Remember that time I saved up and bought you that chemistry set you wanted? I wondered and wondered. What did Ma do with it when she took it away from you? I don't know. Why? Why? I keep asking myself again and again. Why did she have to be like that? Why? Driving... Father, suicide. Shut up. The kids. When I was a kid, I wanted to love her so much. You know, I, I, I keep asking myself, is she really, I mean, the way she lived, like a, a thing, 
Is, is all that finished? What's the matter? Nobody talking? No. No, let me guess. Two to one, somebody mentioned Mama. You're so funny. Uh, what's the matter with all of you? She's been dead for four months and eight days, so who invited her to the party? Sit down, Jack, please. The kid's bringing in some kind of entertainment for it's you. It's a party, so make it a party. I'm alive at last, and you're alive, and Harriet... <laughs> Did she tell you she's finally got a boyfriend? Of course, he's slightly married. Shut up. Well, facts are facts. Okay, okay. Let's all take it easy, huh? Sam, I want to ask you something. I, I never asked you all these months, but now that we're all here and on the subject, why not? Since I was the only one who wasn't there at her bedside, did she say anything? You know, at the very end, you know, Last words or anything. I'd like to know. I mean, as the eldest son, it's my right. Okay. So, what did she say? On Harriet, I'm entitled to know. A terrible thing. Oh, so you did know, huh? I asked you weeks ago. Why didn't you tell me? A terrible thing. You say it. No. Jack, you say it. Uh, okay. Our last words were... Tell the children, Marcus and Shirley... Stop it! Clara! For Pete's sake, what? I'm telling you. She said, tell the children I want them to be with me soon. Dear God. And she knew what she was saying. I, I, I'm sorry, Clara. I, I'm sorry, but... Oh, how do you apologize to a sister-in-law for the devil? She was never a mother. Not for one minute. And why she had us... Uh, to torture, I guess. Well, Sam must have told you. To... But to talk of her in such a way. Uh, she was still your mother. Uh, mother. Dear God, you think just being a mother makes a mother? A mother gives a little. I always talk and talk. And all right. Talk. All right. <laughs> At last we're talking about it. All right, I'll tell you something else, Clara. Don't look for reasons. Or excuses for Mama. Sure, I, I've read the books. When someone is like she was, you, you're supposed to go back to the genes, the, the, the chromosomes, in her mind or maybe her glands, some kind of sickness. But not Mama. She wasn't sick that way. She knew exactly what she was doing until the minute she died. There's some good in... In everyone. Clara, stop being naive. Just look around you at the world. Now, listen. You know. All of you know. I'm a religious man. I believe that God makes good and he makes evil. All right. Some are mixtures of a little of each. But just as there's a few people on earth that are all good, there are saints on earth. I tell you, they're devils on earth. Yeah, Roy's right. Mama was a devil. A devil. And I, I say it, and I know it, and I believe it. Well, well, here's the celebration boy with his special entertainment. Uh, Mark, I'll help you. Oh, carry. no, no, Papa, it's not heavy. Well, will you look at Shirley? <laughs> what do you do, a bubble dance with wires? <laughs> <laughs> How nice. We're going to have music. <laughs> this I'm going to like. So, uh, what's special about tape recording off the radio? I do it myself. Ah, you leave it to Marcus. It'll be something special. Set it up on the side table, Mark. It, it's ready now, please. Okay. Everybody sit down. <laughs> okay, boy. Turn it on. All right, Marcus. Uncle Roy and everybody else is waiting. Um... Well, well, first, it's kind of an invention. An invention? Well, now. Now, look. Building up something from parts is one thing. But a tape recorder, an invention? Listen, Roy, if he says it's an invention, it's an invention. Huh, Thirteen years old. So, how old was that Canadian kid? I think he was Canadian when he invented aluminum. And Mozart, how old was he? Yeah, but look. 
It's nothing but a tape recorder with extension lines. All right. All right. So, let's so hear what, it. what's let's new hear about it. a thing Tell like me. that? Please, what, what? everybody, will you let Marcus play the machine? Uh, all right. <laughs> okay, Marcus, go ahead. Um, do you mind if I say something before I turn it on? Such a polite boy. He always was. Of course, Marcus. Say what you want. Okay, Thomas Edison, say it. Charlie, is it nice music? Uh, it's not exactly music, Mama. We return to our story, House on Fire, and we challenge you to listen to a climax of terror. like me to explain how it works. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Marcus. There'll be no more interruptions from uncles. Thank you, Papa. It's true that this part is an ordinary tape recorder, but I have made certain modifications. What is important is in this cabinet. You know, of course, about the law of conservation of energy. Well, Roy, so what am I, your professor? Well, the law says that the total energy of any body is a quantity which can be neither increased or diminished, though it may be transformed into any one of the forms of which energy is susceptible. Yeah, I'll vote for that, kid. Well, so it seemed kind of logical to me that if nothing in nature is lost, it should be possible to bring back voices, since voices are sound waves and sound waves are energy. (sighs) It's very late. I got a big day tomorrow. Now, look, Roy, he's your only nephew. Be at least courteous. All right, all right. Uh, So, my smart nephew, voices are energy, so what? I can bring back voices. What voices? Yes, Marcus, what voices? Old voices. Oh, brother. Yeah, Marcus, (laughs) you better explain that one. Well, but I did. The law of nature says that nothing is lost. Just changed, but it's all there. Uh, you burn a match, and it divides into various gaseous compounds. But those gases aren't lost, and so the match isn't lost. <laughs> all right, all right. But we're not talking about matches. You said voices. Well, in theory, it's the same thing. Everything is basically electrical, whether it's a gas or the vibrations of the human voice. If you break it down, it's all a matter of electromagnetic waves. So, I got to thinking about it, and I think I figure a way to bring back old voices. Old voices. There he goes again. What old voices? The voices of the dead. So, I'm discourteous. Am I supposed to stay around and listen to that? Where did you get that screwy idea, boy? Yes, I'd like to know that myself. Where did you get such ideas? From Grandma. Grandma? What? What the devil are you talking about? Answer me. Come on, answer me. Yeah, what, what is it, Grandma? Grandma? What is it? Come on, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Tell him. Shut up, all, all of you. All right. So he said something crazy. Marcus... What do you mean, Grandma told you? When did she tell you such a thing? A long time ago. When? When we were over at her house once, Shirley and me. It's crazy. I mean, what does she know about science and stuff like that? Now, what are you lying for? Can what I... are you after? Can I turn it on now, Papa? He's your kid, Sam. Come on, make him answer. I think the best answer is he should turn it on. It's a joke. That's all, eh, Marcus? I'll turn it on, Papa. You hear anything? I don't. Hey, <laughs> he's tuned in on my old super hit radio. Uh, <laughs> so, I told you, Roy, <laughs> a kid's joke. Yeah. So, what do you get so excited about? Well, I, for one, got no more time to waste. I'm going home. I got those wholesalers from uh, Kansas City coming in in the morning. I, I got to take care of them. So, wait, wait, wait. Is that? I live among Dear God. The dead. I, I, 
I don't like this. How did well, look, he What get... kind of joke is this, Sam? He got a hell of a sense of humor, your boy genius. He tape records her voice, and he plays it to us. Very funny. Yes, yes that's right. Recording. Sure, sure, tape recording. Oh, if he was my kid, I'd beat the lousy sense of humor out of him. I'd do Hello, something, Roy. I'm telling you right now. Oh. Hello, Sam. What's that? Oh. Hello, Jack. The Harriet. Yeah, that's Mama. Oh. Marcus. Oh. Marcus, you look at me. Oh. When did you tape record all of this? At Grandma's house? Did she tell you to play it to us after she's dead? Marcus. You tell me. Come on, answer your father. What the Mars say to you? Yeah. Yeah, come on, Mark. Is there more? Play it. Come on, come on. Uh, what's going on here? Take your hands here. off him, all of you. Is he to blame for what she made him do? I didn't make him do it, what? Clara. Oh, listen to that. that. She, she, she's oh, talking back now. Right. Oh. He's my bright boy. Listen How many that. times do oh. I have to do? Oh. They're both of them mine. No. Oh. No. no. Oh, it isn't. She's done talking pre-recorded. Oh, sure. Turn it off. I don't want to listen. Who cares what you want, Harry? You're too old to want. Oh, no. And too ugly for anyone to want you. No, isn't that a fact? It is her. Oh, it is. Sam, now I can talk to you. I want the children, Sam. Oh. I want them with me. It's lonely where I am. I like people with me. Not you, Sam, or her, or the others. You wouldn't amuse me. The children amuse me. They do what I say. They did many things that I told them to do when I was alive, Sam. No. Interesting things that would have horrified you, Sam, but very amusing. I like to be amused. Now I want the children, Sam. No, no. no I want no, them no. now. The knife on the table in front of you. No. Pick it up, Sam. No. Now pick up the knife. Be a good boy, Sam. No, no. Pick up the knife. No, no. That precinct 50 taken off? Yeah. Oh, man. I'm pushed. Yeah. I've seen some hot ones in my time, but not like this one. The apartment was like the inside of a blast furnace. Yeah. Hey, did that man and woman really jump? I got here on the third alarm. No, no. We got the snorkel up to them just in time. Both of them hanging there by their fingers on the ledge. They okay? Yeah. I guess so. Burned bad in shock. But the captain said they might make it. Hmm. Oh, I wish I was as sure about those kids. 
What kids? Uh, the captain said there was supposed to be a couple of kids up there. He tore the place apart, but they weren't there. What happened to them? Nothing. They were never there. If there were kids in that apartment, we'd have found them. We'd have found something. Come on, let's get out of here. Or maybe... Maybe... What's the matter? What are you looking up for? Well, I was thinking that maybe I should go back up there and... Ah, the hell with it. What a devil. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, House on Fire, was written, produced, and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Vic Perrin, Virginia Gray, and Jack Crucian. Featured in the cast were Philip Tanzini, Olin Soleil, Irene Tedrow, Benny Rubin, Ann Hills, Lorene Tuttle, Jerry Hausner, Lenore Kingston, and Mary Jane Croft. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. We bring you a story as close to you as the headlines of tomorrow's newspapers. Now, I tell you for the last time, Wendell Whitney is the man. Now, believe me. We are talking about the Supreme Court, not a job in the post office. He's a candidate, that's all. One of a dozen. Right. Now, yeah. now, hold, hold on. Now, what are you, what are you talking about? The president wants him. Now, that's enough for me and you. Yes, but what do we really know about this man? Very little, very little indeed. The question is, can he stand up under the scrutiny of the opposition, fellas? All the Eastern newspapers are touting Frank Hammond. Hammond? <laughs> He's a senile idiot. If we don't get a younger man into the court, we might as well kiss off all the Western liberal vote the next time around. Now, Lewis here knows everything there is to know about Wendell Whitney. Speak up, Lewis. Tell him. He was the top lawyer in his state. And he's been an outstanding judge of the appellate court for years. And above all, he's got a spotless reputation. And his loyalty to the party is unquestioned. He'll be a credit to every one of you who helped the president endorse him. You heard the man. The president endorses him. I endorse him. Now, what more do you want? When you hear this story titled Vicious Circle, you may say to yourself, Oh, I know where Arch Obler got that idea, but you'll be wrong. Because I know for a fact that playwright Obler started to write this play over 20 years ago and finished it only a few days before this broadcast. So get yourself comfortable and in a moment hear the amazing story of Vicious Circle. <laughs>
Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Vicious Circle by Arch Obler. Our stars, Fletcher Markle, Mary Jane Croft, and Vic Perrin. And now the first act of award-winning Arch Obler's play, Vicious Circle. My father once said it. Life is a vicious circle. It begins in the dark of eternity and ends there. And there is no escape. We are in a room in a famous hotel in our nation's capital. Judge Wendell Whitney, handsome face lined with tension, paces impatiently up and down, up and down. He is waiting for a word, a magic word. Lewis, come in, come in. Well, what happened? Congratulations, Mr. Justice. <laughs> What's the matter? You're too shocked to speak. What happened? Just what we figured. Old Harkness held out a while, but Sprigg and the others kept pounding away on your war record and your party loyalty and your reputation on the bench. And Harris made a speech about the Supreme Court needing young blood and all that. And just like that, Harkness said, OK. So that was that. Oh, they'll play a little more fiddly do before they officially tell you about it. But you're in, Wendell, and that's a fact. You better start working on your acceptance speech. That's wonderful. Hey. Come on, what's the matter with you? Listen, I'll call for room service. Get you a drink or a dozen... No, no, you... No, I don't drink. Oh, sorry, I took one look at your face. It... Wendell, for God's sake, don't you realize what their endorsement means? Every survey, every poll indicates that the party is going to win this year. With a committee backing you up with your personal popularity, with Chief Justice Conmore sick as he is and the senility of the others... Inside of a year, you could become Chief Justice. Well, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you answer it, Judge. They've come to bring you the happy tidings. No, please, you go. Okay, okay. Oh, Wendell, there you are. Lewis has undoubtedly told you, but we're here to make it official. Congratulations, Mr. Justice. Yes, congratulations, Justice. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I'm deeply honored. Well, now, uh, shall we adjourn someplace where we can have some friendly stimulants? <laughs> Senator Harris, I hope you'll forgive me, but I would like to go home at once and tell my wife. Oh, of course. Well, the very thing for you to do. There's plenty of time tomorrow for us all to get together. Uh, gentlemen, our candidate is going home to tell his wife. And having seen the beautiful Margaret, I'm sure we all understand. Oh, we should. Sure <laughs> Can I drive you home, Wendell? My car is outside. No, thank you. I brought my own. Uh, thank you again, gentlemen. I'll, I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. We look forward to seeing you. Again, Doorman? Oh, yes, Judge. My car. Would you get it for me, please? Oh, it's at the curb, sir. I saw you crossing the lobby. <laughs> thank you. Uh, here you are. Oh, thank you, sir. Hey, Joe. Who's that? Oh, Judge Whitney. What's he running for? President? Oh, better than that. Supreme Court, I think. Now, that's a job. Nobody can fire you. Top money. Lucky guy. Margaret, what will you say? I know you've been expecting it, but the reality... I better slow down a bit. <laughs> Supreme Court candidate Dent Spenders on Washington Street. Got you talking to yourself, Judge? What? Who, who in the devil... Are... Better watch your driving, Judge. Don't worry about me. I'm quite comfortable in the back seat. Why did you have to stop? We can talk while you're driving. Get out of this car. How dare you? Oh. 
Well, well, Judge, so you remembered me. Hmm? It is you, isn't it? Yeah, I'm flattered. Yes, indeed. I mean, after ten years and forty pounds. Mind if I get in front with you, Wendy? We've got a little bit of talking to do. Okay, let's go. Drive. You drive good, don't you, Wendy? Sure. Everything you do is good. All right. What is it now? Say it. I've waited for you, Wendy. Now you wait for me. You want money again. All right. How much? Now, friend, did I tell you you could stop? All right. I've had enough. Tell me exactly what you want or get out. Now, Wendy, that ain't hospitable. Old-time friends like we are, you realize it's been ten years... Get out. Out! <laughs> you see, I'm not even moving, Wendy. I know you're just making a joke. That's the way it used to be. When was it? Ten years ago? You'd get all mad, and then you'd get smart, and we'd get along all right. That's the way it's going to be now, ain't it, friend? Or should I say, Mr. Justice? What are you talking about? Oh, Washington's like a big mouth. And I got big ears. I've been hearing exciting things. President's going to nominate you, ain't he, Wendy? And if he nominates you, that's it, ain't it? I mean, the way things are going. Justice of the Supreme Court. Wendy Whitney of Leeds, Wyoming. Who'd have thought it? Yeah. And who'd have thought you'd be district attorney and then governor? But then, I always was lucky, wasn't I, Wendy? How much? You're asking that question now at the right time, friend. A hundred thousand dollars. A hundred thousand? Does that surprise you, friend? It shouldn't. You're insane. I haven't got a fifth of that. Well, maybe you haven't, Wendy, but you'll get it. Oh, you filthy blackmailing scum. Still got your expensive temper, haven't you, Wendy? Looks like rain. Remember the rain, Wendell? Wet streets. Shut up. No, no. I shut up for ten years, waiting. Just waiting. Now I'm talking. I knew you'd get there. Now you're there, so I can't shut up anymore. I'm giving you 48 hours to get the money. 48. And you'll get it, all right. A man who's going to be a Supreme Court judge has lots of friends with lots of anxious money. Twenty years ago, $150 shut you up. Then it was 250 500 Ten years ago, a thousand. And now a hundred thousand. What next, Henry? Just tell me. I like you when you talk quiet that way, Wendy. I like it. Real sensible and businesslike. Answer me. What next? When you're, like they say, on the bench, I don't know. I'll have to figure it. It's always give and take with me. You know that. You and Margaret. Margaret. Mighty pretty girl she was. And is. Yeah. I found out where you lived. And I saw her come out of your hotel today. Real pretty woman, Margaret. You know something. I think I like her looks now even better than when she was plain little Margaret Byerly, the druggist kid. You want to know what else, Wendy? Well, I just got an idea. Back home, Margaret could never see me for dirt. Now, maybe if she changed that, she'll listen to you. Maybe be generous to an old friend. You filthy... I'll kill you. No, I'll kill you. Wait, no, I'll kill you. Henry. Henry. D. 
dear God. We now return to our play, Vicious Circle. Wendell Whitney, candidate, tells his wife of blackmail and murder. Hello? Yes? Julia! Yes! Oh, yes, I heard the newscast. Isn't it wonderful? No, Wendell isn't home yet. I'm sure he wanted to tell me himself, but the phone's been busy ever since the news flash. Excited? <laughs> I don't know if I'm standing or falling or dreaming. Oh. Come on, don't you start that. You know, there's a small matter of the actual appointment and another little thing called getting past the Congress. Uh, Wendell? Yes? Oh, Julia, I have to hang up. Wendell just came in. Yeah. Yes, I'll tell him. Thanks for calling. Bye. Oh, Wendell. Wendell, oh, my darling. It's wonderful, wonderful. Oh, great. Now, that's an unenthusiastic hug. What is it? Well, your face, so somber. Oh, I know. No. The strain you've been under all these hours. Here, sit here. Rest. And then tell me all about it. Yes. Huh. If we were drinking people, this is the moment when I'd reach for the champagne. <laughs> you know, I just realized something. If you became justice, and you will, you'll be the first teetotaler on the Supreme Court bench since Douglas. Oh, or was it Justice Holmes? Wendy, aren't you feeling well? Do you... <clears throat> do you remember when we got married? Well, what kind of question is that? You do remember, don't you? Thursday, that Thursday. Wendell, what is this? Of course I remember. Uh, <laughs> oh, come now. Don't tell me after 20 years the wedding wasn't legal. Wasn't old Reverend Johnson really a qualified minister? Have we been living in sin like an old Tracy Hepburn movie? <laughs> Margaret, stop it. Stop laughing. What? That morning on the way to the wedding. You remember it was raining hard. I was late, driving fast. I was coming along the river road and I didn't see. She was crossing the road and I hit her. I got excited. I, I didn't stop. Don't look at me as if I were a madman. I'm telling you the truth. Twenty years ago, on the morning of our wedding, I killed a woman. You what? I killed a woman. Uh, I can't believe I'm it. telling you, it's the truth. I, I hit her. I ran. Mary Foley, don't you remember Mary Foley? Oh, Mary Foley. Yes, yes, old Mary Foley. I was the hit-and-run driver. I killed her, and I ran away. But, uh, but why didn't you tell me then? And why tell me now, after all these years? Because the years have come back. I don't know what... That day, there was a witness. Oh. I didn't know then. I found out quickly enough. Who? Henry Benyon. Henry Benyon? So that's why... Yes. He... That was part of the blackmail. Calling him my friend, letting him visit us. Part of blackmail? He bled me for ten years. Then he disappeared. Until today. Oh, Wendell, why didn't you tell me? An accident twenty years ago. All these years. Why didn't you I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to think about it. These last years, I kept telling myself Henry had died, and that ended it. But it's not ended at all. He's back today. <laughs> of, of all days, today. Today. All these years, working, planning, making arrangements, compromising for what happened today. I'm not going to lose it, Margaret. I'm not going to lose it. All right. All right, Wendy. We'll pay him. Anything. It'll be all right. Wendy? What else? I killed him. What? His body's down. 
in the trunk of the car. Oh, God. Wendell? Yes? Your eyes closed? Thinking. Tell me, where are you going? Telephone? Who are you going to phone? The police. No. Give me the phone. Margaret, I've got to call them. No, I won't let you. Who did you kill? A man? No, a nothing. A a piece of filth. You're going to be a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court. But I killed Mary Foley. Now him. Who was Mary Foley? Have you forgotten the town drunk? Your life for that? Wendy, lift your face. Look at me. You're going to be a justice of the Supreme Court. You're the best man for the job. The country needs you. You'll do a thousand things for for, for millions of people that'll make up for those accidents in a million ways. You're not going to call the police. I told you. His body is in the trunk of my car. All right. We'll wait until it's dark, and then we'll get rid of it. We return to our story, Vicious Circle. Wendell Whitney, candidate for office in the United States, tries to dispose of the body of the blackmailer. Faster, Wendell. Let's go faster. No. Oh, you're right. We must drive along normally. Naturally. Are you sure you locked the trunk? Yes. Are you sure? I still think I should have left you at home. Must I say it again? You can't do this alone. Please, don't talk about that anymore. I love you. Do you, Wendell? These last few years, I... I began to wonder. I wanted the Supreme Court for you, too. Oh, I love you so much. Margaret. Yes? What you said before about it being an accident, that was, and and this was. Tell me. I, I didn't mean to kill him. But when he started to talk about you, his, his eyes, I, I hit him. I hit him. He died so easily. Wendell? Yes? Oh, I must have fallen asleep. Where are we turning? The marshes. Oh. What if they find... It won't matter. No one knows of him and me. Oh, if you'd only told me 20 years ago when... If I could only turn back time to just a couple of hours ago. Why are you... Beyond those trees is the water. Oh. How are you going... I'll carry him. Oh, no. No, Wait. Someone will see you. No one comes this way. I I turn off the lights. So dark. Don't be afraid. I'll be right back. Oh, yes, please. Clouds scudding over the moon. Lose your way, mister. What'd you say? I said to lose your way. Policeman. Right, lady. What 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 is it? What's the matter? That's my question. Now don't tell me you ran out of gas. I I don't know what you mean. Yeah. Well, let me improve your education. There's some foolish people parked here for little parties. Somebody else been coming around here with a knife holding up the lovebirds. So I've been assigned to keep traffic moving. So get moving. Mister? Now. Of course. Ha, ha, ha. 
Margaret. <laughs> Don't. Please. Oh, I... I'm just tired, that's all. I'm all right, really. This past hour, I've been thinking about what you said, and it's true. Exterminated vermin, that's all. You knew him as well as I did. Every day of his life was wrong. And I've made up for what I did 20 years ago a thousand times. I'll make up for this, too. Believe me, I will. Oh, I know you will. I, I guess that policeman suddenly appearing frightened me more than I realized. You all right now? Yeah, I think so. There's no reason to be frightened. No. I'll get rid of him. In Belford Woods, and that'll end it. Policeman stopping us. Oh, for God's sake, stop that. I think there's a policeman in every nook and cranny of the district. What have you been doing all these hours, sitting with your eyes closed? This is open country. There isn't anyone around for miles. All I ask is that you shut your mouth and don't talk anymore. I... I'm sorry, Margaret. I... I'm very sorry. What are you staring at? The, the red light. Red light? There's no... No, I saw it. Against the sky. Was there's nothing. See, what, look. There. Oh, yes, yes. What is it? Oh, tell me. Fire. Oh. Yes, it it must be a forest fire. Oh. The woods. They must be burning. Oh. Now, Margaret, stop. You said you'd get rid of him in Belford Woods. Margaret, stop. I can't take any more. <laughs> Margaret, quiet. Someone's coming. What? Another policeman. Oh, my God. Oh. End of the line, folks. Oh. I I don't understand. What? what? Around the bend, a private plane crashed about an hour ago. Set fire to the brush. You have to go back to the junction and detour. Oh. Uh, come on now, lady. You're safe enough. Oh. Well, just head back where you came from. There's no danger. It, it's, it's all right. She, she's been ill. Thank you, officer. Wendell. What? We are going back. What? To tell the police the way you wanted to. Are you out of your mind? Oh, I'm so afraid. I can't help it. Oh, stop it. Stop it. You know me. You know I've got the strength. I've always had it. I've got it now. A dead man isn't going to spoil my life. I'll get rid of him. We return to our story of Vicious Circle. The hours have crawled by, and the body of the blackmailer is still with Wendell Whitney and his wife. Are you asleep? No. We're almost there. Almost there. Driving along this last hour, everything's cleared up in my mind. Everything. Everyone has a secret cross to bear. I'll bear mine, and because of it, do better for for everyone. I'll have that chance soon. So it'll be all right. It's strange. In a crisis, you were always stronger than I was. Just a, a little while, just long enough for me to get my bearings. And then it doesn't matter that you fall apart, because by that time, I'm all right. Almost there. I keep thinking of that day, the day it rained. I was in such a hurry. I had a crazy idea that if I was late, you might change your mind. There's something else I've never forgotten. The way it sounded when the front of the car hit her. Steel on flesh. Oh, strange the sky is. Darker than dark. Well, we're here, Margaret. 
In, in a few moments. Get rid of him now. Please. Yes. You stay in here. Where are you going? I have to open the trunk. Oh, uh... I'll only be a minute. Wendell, wait. What is it? I've been thinking. It was it was my fault, too. What? Well, if, if I hadn't failed you somehow, you, you would have told me long ago. But I failed you. So you so you kept quiet. I'm to blame. I'm not going to stand here listening to nonsense. Wendell! What? There's a light coming. What? The light. Now, shut up. It's just a boy. Hi. Excuse me. I, you got a jack? I got a flat a couple of miles up, and I saw your lights, and then you stopped, and... Hey, mister, am I glad to see you. W- what's the matter? Something wrong? Wrong? W- with your car. You know, I mean, I, I saw you get out and, and go to the back, I mean, Nothing's and... wrong. Nothing at all. Oh, well, if there is, I just meant I'd be happy to help you fix it. Me, I got problems. You see, my girl and I, we came out here, and she's supposed to be home at no later than 11. I, I know it sounds corny, but I, I really did get a flat. And if you could give me the key to the trunk, I'll get the jack. No, and... I have no jack. Oh. Well, then, could you drive me back to my car, and we could pick up Penny? Uh, that's my girl. She's she is scared sitting there in the dark. And if you could drop us off at the next gas station, I could, uh, you, you know, call her folks and, and get squared away. I, I sure would appreciate you giving us a ride, mister. No. Step away from the door. Oh, mister. Come on, have a heart. We've been waiting for two hours for a car to come along. No, no, no. Go away. I, I can't. Hey, wait a minute. You're Judge Whitney. Hey, look, look, I'll hold up the light. You can see. I'm Jimmy Hayes. I'm one of the pages in the Senate. I saw you when you gave that speech. I, I don't blame you for not wanting to pick up hitchhikers way out here, but now you know who I am, Okay. Judge Whitney? All right. Get in. Row, row, row your boat gently row, down the stream. Row, row, row your boat gently down, down the stream. Merrily, 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 but don't row, get a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> We're not very good, Judge, but you got to admit, we sure are loud. Hey, Penny, let's give another one of our extensive repertoire. Jimmy, I don't think they want a floor show. Sure they do. The judge is full of jokes. We should hear him when he talks to the Senate. But he sure is fresh out of jokes on this ride. They haven't said a word. He or his wife. Uh, so maybe they got troubles. I'll cheer him up. Uh, Judge? Yes? Everyone was talking today about what Walter Cronkite said last Sunday about you being, um, uh, you know, the dark horse for the court. All the pages were saying that they sure hope that you make it. Thank you. All the fellows were saying that you, Mrs. Whitney, would be the prettiest woman in Washington since Dolly Madison. Me, I said you'd be the prettiest one in history. <laughs> well, it sure is a sweet piece of machinery. You know, this car, uh, little foreign jobs are all right mechanically, but you give me something like this for a payload, I'm comfortable and big enough to carry just about anything. Margaret. Did I say something funny? Margaret. Stop it. For God's sake, stop it. Is that enough, operator? Okay. I hope it's your mother that answers. Oh, I'll say. Please, operator, just keep ringing. Oh, they're asleep, I bet. That's your dad. He's looking for a gun. She's asleep. Who? Oh, yeah, the judge's wife. Nice of him to wait. I mean, with her not feeling well. I still can't figure it out. Why all the hysterics? Oh, she's sick, that's all. Hello, Mother. Yeah, I'm all right. We had a flat tire and... Hello, Dad. I know. I know. Look, please listen. We had a flat tire and... All right, all right. I'll put him on. He wants to talk to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Hello, Mr. Kraber. Yes, sir, nothing to worry about. We're here with Judge Whitney and his wife. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kraber, I've got to interrupt. It's starting to rain. 
Penny, don't stand there. Run for the car. I'll finish with your dad. All right. Oh, wow, that's all I needed. Judge, are you sleeping too? No. Look, Jimmy's talking to my dad. He'll be along in a minute. It was nice of you to wait for us, you know, with her not feeling well. Oh, gosh, I hate thunder. Let me in, Penny. Come on, I'm getting soaked. Did you get my dad to understand? He yelled so much, I got a tin ear. Uh, Judge, her father's coming here for us. Oh, no. I told him it was just a flat, but you know him. He said the state put will break my... No, that's my dad. Wow, is it coming down. If you could wait just a couple of minutes longer, Judge, till the rain lets up... Well, my dad will be here real soon. Uh huh? What'd she say? Get rid of him, Wendell. Margaret, sleep. Get rid of him, Wendell! Out of the trunk! That boy. Tomorrow morning, all Washington will know that my wife was hysterical. Is it morning? What? Yes. Dawn. I hadn't realized... No need to hurry anymore. Daylight. I've got to get there before daylight. No need to hurry anymore. Margaret, please. I know where I'm going now. Yes. East Road. He's around your neck. All that happened, it doesn't matter. I know where to go. Where he's been for 20 years. What'd you say? Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, this place will end it. Around your neck. The river. This is where I should have come in the first place. World's always deserted. Water under the bridge is deep. Don't go back there, Wendell. What are you talking about? Don't go back there. He'll get his hands on you. Never let you go. Drag you down. Stop and down. It. He's dead. Down. Into the river and the nightmare will be over. No. Don't go there. Out of her mind. I'm trying to drive me out of mine. Keys. Yeah, so get you out of there, Henry, and it'll be over. A 20-year nightmare over. Lid won't come open. It's the matter. Jammed. I've got to get it open. I've got to. He's holding it, Wendy. What? Who? From the inside, holding it. I'll get rid of him for you. What? I'll get rid of him for you. Margaret! Get away from that wheel! Don't! Margaret, come back! Don't! Margaret! Just got the hook on it, Captain. Any minute now. Uh, all right. Speed it up as much as you can. Right. The quarters are driving me nuts. You take a look at them. His wife's dead under the river, and they haven't got the decency to... I'll put a stop to it. All right, fellas. Leave the judge alone. I told you that before. Oh, take it easy, Captain. Ah. The papers are full of the judge this morning. Haven't you heard? The party's endorsed him all the way. All we want is a simple statement. The man's in a state of shock, sitting here by the road ever since... Hey, look! The plane's got the car. They're hoisting it up. She's in there, all right. Uh, judge, please, uh, won't you make a statement, please? Statement? Yeah, what happened? How did it happen? Yeah, yeah I'll make a statement. Yeah. It was raining. I, I was driving fast. I... Ran over a woman. What? Old Mary Foley. But don't arrest me now. Please. I haven't time to stop now. 
Margaret's waiting for me at the church. You see, I'm on my way to get married. <laughs> The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Vicious Circle, was written, produced, and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Fletcher Markle, Mary Jane Croft, and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Marvin Miller, Byron Kane, Tommy Cook, Jack Crucian, Harley Bear, Carol Bilger, and Jack Carroll. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. Listen to a story of the night. We bring you stories of the night. This night. Today's night. A night which covers and uncovers. A night which brings sleep. But before that rest is full of small adventures, small laughter, small mysteries, and the tears, the salt tears, from the waters from which the shadowed gods made all things and us and you. We bring you Small Stories of the Night. This is Vincent Price again. You're about to hear a very unusual story, and yet it is more than unusual because you may find some of the events as close to you as your own blood. We're about to seize an hour out of time in these United States of ours, happenings from coast to coast in Peabody Award-winning Arch Obler's story that is titled with one simple word, Night. in darkness, the day, once capering with the promise of its allotted hours, has gone, creeping agedly over the edge of the sky. Night, soft veiling, lies thickly over the ponds and swamps and lakes and rivers, over the knolls and dunes and buttes and mountains, over the homesteads, farms, the ranches and plantations, over the villages and towns and county seats and cities. For a whisper of time, the night is on the land. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Night, by Arch Obler, with an all-star cast. And now the first act of Night. The night is a trickster. 
It mutates, transposes, changes, shuffles, conjures, prestidigitates, juggles, spoofs, hoodwinks, and hocus pocuses. A white sheet, wind tossed, spawns a ghost. A tumbleweed, a roving demon, a timber's creak, a dead man's bones. And underneath the bed wait nameless, faceless, nightboard things. The night moves on and whispers behind the joke of the dark beyond the dark. You mean he cut them up in little pieces and stuck them in the boiler? That's what I mean. Gosh. Hey, Ryan, cut that out, will you? What's the matter? Nothing's the matter with me. Can't you play nothing else? Sure. Ryan. Ryan, cut it out, will you? What's the matter with you guys? Nothing. We don't want to hear you play, so there's something wrong with us? Yeah. Is this the music center or a fire station? How would you characters like to... Hold it. Hold it. Oh, that's over in Brooklyn. Yeah. Hmm. It's a hoodoo, all right. Hoodoo what? What are you guys up to? Listen to Hank. He'll tell you. Okay, I'm listening. It's Thursday, isn't it? Yeah, it's Thursday. There hasn't been a night run in this station on Thursday night for 25 years. 25 years? Yeah. Since the Thursday night that Patty Connors died. On a windy night, just like this one. Patty Connors? Who was Patty Connors? He was a firefighter. And he died in this station 20 years ago. Right in this room. Hey, fellas, is this guy kidding me? Listen, you big lug, he's telling you the facts. Well, you want to hear the rest of the story, Ryan? Sure, why not? Okay. I thought maybe you didn't like ghost stories. Yeah? Go on. Okay. Patty Connors was the driver of the steam pumper that ran out of this station 20 years ago. He was a little guy, but big with women. (laughs) <laughs> like me. Sure, sure. Yeah. Only one day he met a woman he shouldn't have met. The pretty wife of the fellow who stoked the boiler of the pumper. Oh. One day, the fellow who stoked the boiler of the pumper came home when he shouldn't have come home. Yeah. Patty did some quick talking. And he thought he'd talked his way out of it. Because nothing happened. Nothing? Nothing. But the next day, there was some kind of a big celebration out in Grant Park. And most of the fire department went down there to put on an exhibition, leaving only a skeleton crew, three or four guys. And Patty and the fellow with the good-looking wife were two of them. The other fellas finally went across the street to get a beer. They were only gone a few minutes. But when they came back, Patty was gone. Gone? Just gone. And nobody knew just where. And he didn't come back. The chief figured he'd run off with some woman somewhere. So he crossed him off the department's lists. And that was that. Only it wasn't that, because a year went by, and it was Thursday, just about this time of night. Fellas were sitting around just the way we are, right in this room, everything okay, when all at once somebody said, Look, on the floor, what's that? That was a big stain. And when they looked closer and touched it, it was blood. What could they do? Nobody knew how it got there. So somebody got some soap and water and some sand, and they scrubbed it up in case the inspector came around. And everybody helped but one, the fellow who had the pretty wife. He just sat there. He didn't move. He just kept watching. 
A week went by. Thursday again. Same time of night. Fellas were sitting around here, just the way we are. And there it was again. The fresh blood. This time they called in cops. It didn't do much good, because blood is blood. And that's all it was, just a little blood on the floor. They scrubbed it up. A week went by. Thursday night came around again. And they were waiting. The floor was clean. They had a lantern sitting there. They waited. Nothing happened. And then all at once it did. The light went out. Everybody began to yell in the dark, running around, bumping into each other. At last, someone found a light, lit it, and then they saw there on the floor was blood again. Only this time, it was pouring out from the throat of the fella who had the pretty wife. Well, what? Who? He cut his own throat. At least that's what they say. And he left a letter telling what he had done to Patty. Cut him up and stuffed him in the boiler of the pumper all those weeks ago. Right here in, in this station. That's right. Right here in this station. And there hasn't been a night run out of this place for 25 years. Well, what do you know? Hmm. There was something else you fellas don't know about. Huh? Hmm. His confession. The murderer said that he had cut Patty up right in there. In there? You mean the place where we make our coffee? That's it. Oh. Well, how do you like that? I don't like it. Well, that's all there is to it. Gosh. Sure is a dark, quiet night tonight. Isn't it? Yeah. Say, Ryan. Huh? It's your turn to make the coffee tonight. Uh, uh is it? Sure. Well, well, Hank, would you, you like to come along and sort of help me? We return to Arch Obler's story of night drifting across America. A very extraordinary night, full of wonder and amazement and horror. The night is a memory book, a diary, a doomsday document, inscriptions in deep carved eternal stone and metals, a tape unerasable with memoranda, notes, and picture jottings of every brainwave of a million billion bits of depositions made since slime was random life. And life was slime. Yes? Who is it? It's Keith Linden, Mr. McGronick. May I come in? Of course. Come in, my young friend. Here. Let me have your coat. Oh, thank you very much. Forgive me for not phoning first, but... Oh, it's all right. I'm charmed to see you. Now then, sit down, please. Uh, what would you like to drink? A little spritzer with some nice imported red wine, maybe? No, 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 thank you. I must get back to the office rather quickly. Oh, the office. You, you Americans, always the office. Uh, please, please, you will sit down. You will tell your news, huh? It is good news, yes? Yeah? Oh, I can see it on your face. So tell me. Victory. Complete victory. Ah. The ruling just came through. You cannot be deported. Now we're in the foreseeable future, and your citizenship is completely validated. Oh, my friend. Wonderful. Wonderful. I shake your hand. I embrace you. It's all right. It's my pleasure. Oh, you're embarrassed. I embrace you. <laughs> I forgot you Native Americans are not so, uh, how, sh how shall I say it, free in emotions. All these years in America, I keep forgetting this. Oh, no, no, it's 
Perfectly all right. I, I can understand what a load this is off your mind. Off my mind? <laughs> off my back? Uh, how can you know what this freedom is? Oh, bless you, bless you, Mr. Attorney. Well, well, I really must go. I have a late meeting. Uh, you'll excuse me, the, the telephone. Of course. I'll let myself out. Uh, you will thank your confreres, please. Huh? Uh, tell them I am overjoyed with gratitude. I'll tell them. Uh, just one moment, please, and I will speak with you. Uh, Mr. Linden, you will also tell them I will write them letters of appreciation. Yes, huh? thank you. Hey. Hello. Hello, this is Gregory Margronick speaking. Oh, it is you, Carl. I was just saying goodbye to the young lawyer. <laughs> you have already heard the news uh, on the radio, huh? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. You can always depend on the sentimental Americans. For three days marching in front of the immigration idiots. Excellent. Oh, then you will come here on Friday? Oh, we will have a, a great celebrations. No, 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 no. None of them. Only my friends, my personal friends. Yeah. Now, no more worries. I can go about my business. No more threats. I am like, they say, wrapped around in the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, 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 all right. Goodbye, Carl. Oh, oh. Hey, it's getting cold. Let yeah. me make a nice fire. And sit in front. Have my own celebrations. Matches. Mm. Well, well, oh yeah. Uh. My bones. I am old. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> like they said, the persecuted old man. <sighs> the sofa is soft. <laughs> you want up, huh? <laughs> right. Up you go. Yes. You have earned to sit in front of the fire. The newspaper photos of the kind old man with his old cat were very good for propaganda. Very good, very good. <laughs> ah, the gas fire is warm. You never saw those other fires, did you, cat? No. Too many years ago for you, eh? The long lines of them marching, marching to the fires, like obedient cattle. Eh. Behind my eyelids, I can see them. Eh, such power I had. Such power. I alone chose who would live, who would die. Uh, must search out. Go down, cat. I must have more room to sleep. Tonight I must sleep. No more worries. I am a special American citizen. And I will sleep good. The screams... They are beginning again. The screams. No, 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 no. I have been vindicated. The lawyer said so. Then why do I still hear the screaming? Why do I still hear the screaming? We return to our story of night happenings as time inexorably moves across the face of our country. The night is a non-sectarian air-conditioned meeting house, echoing in a thundering chorus, Bible-pounding, Bible-reaching, hallelujahs, Lord's prayers, whispers, heaven-reaching, devil-catching, gospel-grinding, pitching, catching. The night is a meeting house. Well, brethren, 
Sistern, this concludes our great maiden for tonight. Bless you all, and don't forget to leave your free will offering as you go out to carry on the work of the Great Spirit. Hallelujah. Good night. God bless you. And don't forget to bring your friends next Saturday night, same time. Hallelujah. 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 The meeting is closed. Excuse me, Reverend. No, sorry, brother. Sorry, in a little hurry tonight to do the work of the Lord. See you later. God bless you, Reverend. Oh, uh, all right. All right. All right, all right. I heard you stop yelling. Well, if you'd answer me, I wouldn't have to yell at you. Well, well, how'd we do? Fifty dollars and eighty-three cents. Fifty dollars and eight... Why, the low-living, tight-fisted... Don't blame them. It's you. Me? Preaching. By the way you were going tonight, you couldn't raise a dollar out of a hard shell on his way to perdition. I've been doing all right. You were doing all right, but I'm telling you, you're slipping downhill faster than a pig on a grease Now, you look here. Now, you listen to me. Fifty dollars and eighty-three cents from a meeting like tonight. You better listen. Well, what do you got to say? I've been doing a lot of thinking. These West Coast amen snorters ain't what they used to be working in airplane plants and all that. They're getting modern ideas fast. Well, all right. Why shouldn't you get modern ideas? I preach from the headlines. Oh, that ain't enough. Charlie, we gotta throw off the old coat like a rattlesnake in the spring. What do you mean? Don't be thicker headed than you are. We gotta go out of business and come back into business again. Oh, talk words. Just this. Electronics. Huh? Electronics. I've been giving it a lot of thinking. Everybody's talking about electronics, radio and television and that new stuff. Yeah. Computers. Electronics. Mm-hmm. That's what they're thinking about, and that's what we'll give them. Well, you keep talking. This is the night we're starting over. Close right down and move right out and start up somewhere else. Long Beach or San Diego. New start with a new name. Well, well... The Electronical Pathway to the Cosmos. Oh. Now, don't you look down your nose at me. I'm talking sense. The Electronical Pathway to the Cosmos. Now, that's scientific. Yeah, yeah. Build a stage full of electrical stuff. Uh-huh. Sparks shooting around. Yeah. Sparks rising up to heaven. Yeah. Going up to heaven. Uh-huh. Ride the sparks to the fountainhead of all the cosmos. Yeah, that's pretty good. And give membership pins. Make like jagged lightning. Mm-hmm. Pins to wear at five bucks cash to show that they're a member. Yeah. The Electronical Society of the Cosmos. Yeah, the Electronical Society of the Cosmos. Right. Oh, Harriet, I see it now. Jagged lightning crashing down on sinners. That's right. Burning sparks lifting the repentant sinners up, up, up to the highest pinnacle of the highest cosmos. That's right. Oh, the prophecies seen through the eyes of modern science through electricity. Electronics. Right. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. That's it. We're in business. We return to our story of one hour of night as the tick of the clock deepens the darkness across our country. Night is restless. It stirs and turns and carries with it the restless thoughts of artists, architects, contractors and builders, bricklayers and masons, ministers and teachers, tinsmiths, welders, charwomen, tailors, freightmen, executives and politicians, bankers, window washers, soldiers, brewers, leather makers, printers, butchers, tinners, roofers, fishers, millers, bondsmen, carpenters, lawyers, judges, painters, senators and representatives, wholesalers and retailers, tycoons. All the associates, colleagues, workers, and co-workers of the land. Lawrence, uh, close that window. What? What did you say, Philip? I said close the window. One thing I don't need is to catch a blasted cold. Oh, sorry. I like to look down at the street this time of night. Wall Street. Might as well be Hootersville, Indiana. Not a car, not a pedestrian. The window. Okay. 
the window. Where in the devil is that brother of yours? He knew the importance of this meeting. Why is it, dear Philip, that Jason suddenly becomes my brother whenever there's a problem? All right, my brother, your brother. He should be here. There's no excuse for his being late. Patience, dear brother, patience. Don't patience me. The time for patience has run out. Your voice... There's no one on this entire floor. You know that, so I'll yell all I please. All right. Yell. You're right. Uh, uh, be a good fellow. Get me a drink, will you? Sure. Well, what'll it be? The usual? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, a bit of wine. Right. Uh, is there any of the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon I brought back with me from France last year? No. What do you mean, no? There was a full case. Call security. If I ever catch anyone sneaking up Don't here... Don't blame the hired help. Have you forgotten your daughter's sub-dead party last month? Well, who in the hell authorized anyone to take that prime stock out of here? You did? Oh. Well, uh, t tell me, Lawrence, uh, did the rains last month do any flooding at your place? If you mean my wine cellar, no, no, of course not. When Eileen added that new greenhouse, I had the contractor extend the drains to take care of all that. <laughs> well, at least you got something out of her. Passion for orchids? Me, I wasn't so fortunate. I mean, in those infernal rains. Water got into my garages. Six of my classics have been sent off for refinishing. Insurance? Oh, naturally, naturally. But the Ferrari will have to go back to Modena. Who in this jungle could do justice to the coachwork? Well, our prodigal brother arrives. Who is there? It's a night watchman. Who in the devil told you to come in here? I'm sorry, sir, but I heard... I that... don't give a damn what you heard. I gave strict orders. No one was to disturb us. Some heads are going to roll as soon as I find out who... Security? Who is this? Well, Mr. Whatever your name is, this is Philip Terrell. Yes, you do know the name, don't you? It appears on the plaque at the entrance to this building and on your paycheck, if you ever see another one. How dare you send a watchman up to the executive floor contrary to my express orders? No, I haven't time for your explanations. Just get him out of here, and if you value your job, no more personnel on this floor tonight. Do I make myself clear? Now, you, watchman, get the devil out of here, now. Yes, sir. Well, Philip, even in your old age, you haven't lost your knack of biting heads off with one snap of your jaw. You aren't amusing. Believe me, I've made a note of that security fellow's name. Tomorrow morning... Now, who in the devil? Well, well... Brother Jason at last. Sorry I'm late. Hi, Phil, Larry. What was that watchman doing hightailing down the corridor? Now you know how I detest your calling me, Phil. Uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, is that a drink, I see? Now you've had enough to drink. Don't you realize the importance of this meeting yet? Yes, Jason. Come along into the boardroom. Take my arm. Uh, I, I'm okay. I'm beautifully okay. Yeah. Then come along, will you? Coming, coming. Ah, the room I love. Where did you import the paneling from, Phil? Uh, Philip, uh, I keep forgetting. Out a castle in Spain? Ah, and these chairs out of Inquisition. That's quite enough, Jason. Let's get down to business. I haven't all night. Yes, sir, master. I won't waste any time on why we're here. You both know. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. Now, all I will say is that a $50 million organization is jeopardized by one case of myopia. Uh, blindness, if you will. Our majority stockholder as late as yesterday, adamantly and unconditionally refuses to permit us to use any of the capital funds to join with the Ketis Corporation or with Gentech in research and development on those areas of recombinant DNA, which can eventually bring immense profits to our own company. A lecture I don't need this hour of night. I'm trying to give you the facts. Lawrence, you've researched recombinant DNA. Speak up. Jason... All I can say is that unless we get into the business of inserting chosen genes into bacteria so that a new generation of bacteria emerges that, that can do everything from producing plastic to fertilizers to medicines without the need of huge factories like ours, my prophecy is that within ten years or less, our business will go down the drain of obsolescence like radial tube factories or, or, or buggy whips.
Well spoken. Well, Jason? Why exactly did our chairman of the board object? With the statement that in dealing with DNA, we'd be tampering with life itself. The hour is late. No more discussion. Action. We've got to eliminate this block to the future of our company. There is only one answer to the problem. She has the voting power to stifle this corporation. I repeat, there is only one answer to our company problem. One answer. We've got to murder Mother. The night is a sedative prescribed by the rhythm of life's molecules wearying in their sun dance. The night is an old medicine man mixing a dark brew of tremblings and laughter and fury and past ecstasy, terror and hurt, and the wordless murmurs of a woman talking in memory. The night is an old medicine man. Easy, girl. Easy. She's tired. Duster is, too. Aren't you, Duster? Have we been riding long? <laughs> What's the matter? We've been out for over two hours. Well, what do you know? I hope it rains soon. I mean, inside of a week. The barley... Yes. That county agent sure confuses me. About the plowing. I've used that kind of a plow on the north field for over 20 years. Now he talks about disking it. Sure got me confused. Ah. Ah, the wind feels good. Yes. I've enjoyed riding in the moonlight. Haven't you? <laughs> What's funny about that? Well, you of all people. <laughs> Talking about the moonlight. Yeah. <laughs> oh. When I think of how many times I've wanted you to go riding with me in the night. Yeah. You knew when you married me that I was a farmer, not a horseman. Oh, sure. <laughs> what does that mean? When you were courting me. Oh, yeah. We did do a lot of riding in those days, didn't we? <laughs> you wore a path all the way to the woods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking. In those days, we used to ride on other people's land. Now, we've been riding all this time, and we haven't left our own land. Yes. Yeah. Ada? What? What's the matter? Nothing. Your face. Suddenly gone so sad. Tell me. Ada? You said our land. Yes. If it was only... Buried on our land. Ada, don't. I wanted to say it to you ever since we started out tonight. It's been in me for days. If he was only buried out here. Now, what's the use of talking about it? Why shouldn't I talk about it? Everybody else's dead son has a grave you can go to to visit and put flowers on. Pat Talk to him and cry. <laughs> Why can't I cry over my son? Well, when there's a war... Oh, don't talk to me about war. <laughs> talk to me about my son. Where is he? Where is his grave? Why well, haven't they found him and brought him to me? <laughs> You know, I have no answers. Just Vietnam. (laughs) 
Oh. <laughs> Forgive me, Dave. I shouldn't have done this to you. And on such a beautiful night. It's all right. You had to talk about it sometime. Our son lies among strangers. No. When you're dead, there are no strangers. Night is a movement, east-west along the path grooved by the sun. The night is a movement, east-west. What time is it? Almost half past. Maybe we ought to start for the launching pad. <laughs> They'll let us know when. What's the matter, fella? Haven't you learned how to wait yet? <laughs> yeah. Can we get to talk to our wives again? Yeah, sure. From the inside. Oh, yeah. It's strange. Hmm? Uh, what? I thought about this waiting for months. First trip to the space station. Hallelujah. Now it's here. Doesn't seem real. Thought about it so much. Imagination gets mixed up with reality. What was the last word? Are they going to televise us to the public or keep it private? Uh, we beam in on NASA. Nowhere else. No, that's good. Yeah. With this new propellant, if we blow, I guess they don't want the taxpayers to get turned off. You know what I used to do on a night like this when I was a kid? What? I used to take rowboat rides in the park. <laughs> Same deal tonight. Bigger boat. Yeah. Only then it was with a girl. Florence? No. Long before her. Look. Night's so clear. All those stars. Yeah. Stars. I'm glad blast-off time is before daybreak. I've always liked the night. Stick around, night. Stay right here. I'll be coming back for you. Maybe. in darkness. The day, once capering with the promise of its allotted hours, has gone, creeping agedly over the edge of the sky. Night, soft veiling, lies thickly over the cities, county seats, towns and villages, over the plantations, ranches, farms and homesteads, over the mountains, buttes, dunes, knolls, over the rivers, lakes, the bays, and harbors. For a whisper of time, the night is on the land. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Night, was written, produced, and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. The narrator was Hans Conry. The cast was as follows. The screening sketch starred Shepard Mankin with William Phipps. The firehouse sketch starred Elliot Lewis with Byron Kane and William Phipps. Let's Murder Mama starred Shepard Mankin, Vic Perrin, and Byron Kane. Revival Meeting starred Virginia Gregg and Barney Phillips. Our Land starred Lorene Tuttle and Elliot Lewis. The Astronauts were Frank Brzee and Byron Kane. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow 
when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. Mr. Alexander Parker Crittenden, a prominent San Francisco lawyer, came to Virginia City, Nevada for the first time in 1863. The town sitting atop the rich store of silver of the Comstock Lode was rambunctious and unruly. At the moment, Mr. Crittenden is seeking accommodations from a Mrs. Laura D. Fair, proprietress of Rutledge House, which she has recently acquired. She is not a typical rooming house landlady. Indeed, at 26 years of age, she is seductively attractive, a fact that does not escape the experienced eye of our Mr. Crittenden, who, at 46, is the father of some seven children, not to mention a couple of grandchildren, prima facie evidence that he has... Uh, shall we say, been around a bit. Mrs. Fair is showing him a smallish bedroom, but as she moves about, his eyes are not on the room, but on her youthful figure. I'm sorry. The, the room is rather small, but it's the only one I have that's available at the moment. Oh, this will do very well. Very well. I, I wouldn't think of going elsewhere. The barber on the ground floor has bathing facilities. Very good, very good indeed. Um, Miss... Uh... It, it's Mrs. I'm Mrs. Fair. Oh. You run this place with your husband, then? No. You see, my husband is, is dead. Oh. oh. I am sorry. I didn't mean to bring up... Please forgive me, my dear. It's quite all right. About how long will you be wanting the room? I'm not quite sure, but it may be an extended stay. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, based on a true criminal case, Laura D. Fair, by Michael Raffetto. Our star, Tony Tennille. Mr. Crittenden told his landlady, the attractive young widow Mrs. Fair, that his stay at her rooming house in Virginia City might be prolonged depending on how complex the legal business which brought him from San Francisco might prove to be. He sent word to his wife in San Francisco that he was being detained by unforeseen problems in the case he was working on, but he hoped that he would rejoin her soon. Meanwhile, his southern charm had already managed to make him a welcome guest at Rutledge House. It is evening now, and he emerges from a bedroom adjoining the tiny parlor where his landlady is sitting reading a book. He closes the door quietly and comes to her side. Your little darling gave me a hug and a kiss. And I took her from my lap and put her into her bed, and she was asleep almost before I pulled the covers over her. Oh, what a sweet child she is. And so intelligent. It's hard to believe she's only four years old. Well, you've certainly won her heart. And she just loves the way you talk. <laughs> You'd think that all these years I've been out here in the West, I'd lose my Kentucky accent, but I can't seem to do it. I hope you don't. It's charming. Oh, those are kind words. And I thank you, ma'am. 
I was born in the South myself, but I left there so young nobody believes it. I knew we had a lot in common. What state? Mississippi. Oh, a blue-eyed beauty from old Miss. Won't you sit down? Thank you. My little girl Lilius's father, Colonel Fair, was also a lawyer. Oh, or did I tell you that? No, you didn't. Poor child. It's sad she never got to know her father. My mother and I don't mention him because his death was so tragic. Oh, I understand. Death is always tragic. Yes, but you see, in my husband's case, it was doubly so. He killed himself. Oh, my dear. How tragic indeed. Here, give me your hand. I dread the day when I shall have to tell Lilius the truth about her father. There, there, there. Come here. Sit on my lap. That's it. Now, just relax now. Let me hold you the way I held your child a while ago. Put your head on my shoulder. Oh, that's my good girl. It's hard being a widow. But then it must also be hard being a widower, which, from what you've told me, you must be. Yes, yes. Just close your eyes and let your cares vanish while I kiss you gently, as I did your little girl a while ago. Months have passed, and Alexander P. Crittenden's legal training is proving valuable in maintaining an amicable relationship with both his newfound mistress in Virginia City and his wife of some 25 years in San Francisco. At the moment, he finds himself in the unaccustomed role of a defendant as his wife confronts him with some hard questions. You mean to say you have to go back to Virginia City tomorrow? I'm afraid I do, my dear. But you just got home from there less than a week ago. Well, that's quite true. But as I have told you repeatedly, the situation there has become much more demanding than I ever dreamed it would when I first took on this case. Are you planning to stay at the same place, the, uh... Rutledge House? Yes. I presume so. It has proved to be quite satisfactory. Nothing pretentious, but, as I say, satisfactory. The same young woman still running it? Well, I... I presume so. I haven't heard to the contrary. A Mrs. Fair, I think you told me. I think you said she was a widow? Yes, she and her mother have the place. But didn't you also tell me there was a little girl? <laughs> my dear, you've lived with a lawyer husband so long, you've taken on all the attributes of my profession. Do you find my questions impertinent? Oh, not at all, not at all. Have I not proved to be a cooperative witness? Well, I... You, you sound doubtful. To be Why? honest with you, Alex, our friends are beginning to talk. About what? Well, for one thing, the way our social life has been restricted of late. Do you realize how many engagements, dinners, parties, receptions, heaven knows what else I've had to refuse because you've been out of town? Now, the social aspect of this isn't helpful to you because we move in an enviable segment of San Francisco society. And I don't think it's wise for you to jeopardize our position. But how am I jeopardizing it? I'm simply meeting the demands made on me by my profession. But that's my point. Are they simply the demands of your profession? Or are they... Other demands. It's the latter that's causing the gossip. Well, it's malicious gossip. And in the long run, that never hurt anybody. So why don't you stop worrying? I'll stop worrying, Alex, when I can be sure that it's only gossip and not the truth. You understand? Of course. Then it is only gossip? Come here to me and let me take you in my arms. Oh, Alex. You know that I love you, don't you? Yes. I guess that was all I wanted to hear.
Mr. Crittenden looked forward to his sojourns, and why shouldn't he? Almost a year has gone by since he first arrived there and became enamored with the sexually alluring young widow, Mrs. Laura B. Fair. Since neither of them was an amateur in the amatory field, it is not surprising that they became lovers soon after their first meeting, and with mutual decorations of love, it seemed that marriage of the worldly elderly man and the young lady of so arresting appeal was inevitable. But of course, there remained that formidable barrier, the fact that Crittenden still had a wife. How had he managed to keep that a secret, or has he? We shall see, for he has just arrived again in Virginia City. He engages a hack to speed him to Rutledge House. He hurries into the small reception room. His mistress sits behind the desk. He rushes to her side and tries to take her in his arms. She gives him a stern look and pushes him away. Please. What? My darling, what's wrong? A great deal is wrong, Mr. Crittenden. Well, I don't understand. You have deceived me. Did you hear me, sir? I said you have deceived me. Oh, come now. Let's talk this over in a rational way. Oh, no. I'll not be taken in again by your smooth tongue. Save that for the courtroom where you can charm a jury into believing what you know are lies. Well, you are being childish. I have never lied to a jury. There are subtle ways of lying, and you are a master of that. In what way have I ever been guilty of such an offense in so far as you are concerned? Very well. Why did you never tell me that you are a married man? And who told you that I am a married man? I'll not reveal the source of my information. Look me in the eye and deny that you have, at this very moment in all the months I've known you, deny that you have a wife. I have never, never said to you that I was not married. From the beginning of our relationship, you knew that I had children. Not only children, but grandchildren. Is that not true? But you led me to assume that you were a widower. I would never have permitted you to love me if I had not believed that your wife was dead. I didn't question you out of respect for her memory. Do you regret that I found you so irresistibly attractive that I couldn't restrain myself from making love to you? That is no longer relevant. That's the way you lawyers would answer that. Don't turn away from me. Look at me with your beautiful blue eyes. That's it. And you know what your eyes are telling me? No, 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 no. Don't, don't look away till you hear what I was about to say. It is this. That deep within you, you know I love you. Have I not spoken the truth? Please. Let's not make this parting any more painful than it already is. Well, this is not a parting, my darling. What else can it be? It is the beginning. You alone are going to be mine forever. That cannot be when you belong to somebody else. But I'm trying to tell you, that is about to end. The process of divorce has already begun. How can I be sure that you're not still deceiving me? Time will take care of your doubts. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm going to take you in my arms. Come, let us be husband and wife. For in the sight of God, we are. For a long period, Mrs. Fair remained confident that Crittenden would live up to his promise to divorce his wife and thereby free him to carry out his promise to marry his young mistress. Accordingly, she left Virginia City and came to San Francisco to live and to be readily available to her lover. But the months of waiting flowed by and became years, and she was still getting only promises from Crittenden that a divorce was in the offing. She grew desperate and began seeing other men, one of whom was a Mr. Snyder. Overwhelmed, finally, with disillusionment, she married the shadowy Snyder. Crittenden tried desperately to dissuade her from the marriage, and when she went through with it, he frantically set about to break it up. He bombarded her with letters of love, self-pity, promises of everlasting devotion. As Mrs. Snyder, she at last became the dominant one, and she treasured the supplicating letters that poured in. 
With visions of lying in Crittenden's arms, she would read his letters aloud to herself. I must see you tonight. Say yes and let me come. I cannot wait. This night is perfectly decisive of our fate. APC. She takes another from the desk drawer where they are tenderly stacked. It is now or never. If you won't see me tonight, we shall never meet on earth. Suffused with a warm glow of pride and passion, she takes up the next note. My darling, still, yes, still, my darling. It now wants but a few minutes to nine o'clock. At nine o'clock, I shall be near you, looking up to your window in the hope of seeing your dear face again. How I do love you. His frantic pleas eventually bring results. An assignation is arranged, and they are at last together again. He persuades her that she must divorce Snyder and make the arrangements to have him followed so that he is caught flagrante delicto with a woman of dubious chastity. A divorce from Snyder follows and our former lovers are back where they were some six or seven years ago. But a fateful change is imminent. It is the winter of 1870 in San Francisco. Mrs. Fair is now 33 years old, but as the uncertainties of the past are being replaced by a more sanguine prospect ahead, her beauty remains undiminished. At a lodging house on Kearney Street, she rents a bedroom and a parlor. Subsequently, Mr. Crittenden rents an adjoining room. The landlady, Mrs. Letitia Marilla, said he told her he wanted the room in order that Mrs. Fair might know that he did not stay with his wife. At this moment, this is academic because his wife is in the East and has been for some time. But that situation is about to change and the reconciled lovers are soon to be confronted again with the imposing figure of Crittenden's wife standing between them. You mean your wife is arriving back in San Francisco next Thursday? Is uh, Thursday the 3rd? November 3rd, yes. Well, that's it then. That's when she arrives. But why? I don't understand. What do you mean, why? I mean, why is she coming back now after being in the East all this time? Well, she's bringing home a couple of our children, a young Parker, who's been in military school, and our daughter next to the youngest one, who's been I'm staying with... I'm not interested in your children. I'm asking about your wife. Are you going back to her and, and leave me... My to... dear, her coming back has nothing to do with you. Oh, yes, it has. It is very important to me. In what way? Oh, come now. I've done some acting in my time, and I recognize it when I see someone trying it. Well, I wasn't trying to act. I simply asked you a question. Tell me this. Have you missed your wife? Why, I... Look, there's no point to this cross-examination. You surely can't any longer have doubts about my feelings for you. Yes, but my concern right now is your feeling for her. When she steps off the train, will you welcome her with an embrace? Or formally, as one would to a wife he has sworn to divorce? I shall act like a gentleman, particularly so in front of my children. Would you have me do otherwise? The train from the east comes to Oakland. Will you go across the bay to meet it? We shall see. Why? Because I'd like to know. But why? For reasons of my own. Now comes the fateful day of Thursday, November 3rd, 1870. That afternoon, Alexander P. Crittenden boards the ferry boat El Capita in San Francisco and goes across the bay to the Oakland Wharf to meet the train that is bringing his wife and children from the east. 
Unbeknownst to Mr. Crittenden, Mrs. Fair is aboard the same ferry. She watches him go ashore at the Oakland Pier. She sees him greet his wife and the two children as they get off the train. She watches them come aboard the ferry boat. They are smiling. The ferry pulls away from the Oakland Wharf as Crittenden takes his seat between his wife and daughter. He gives his wife a pat on the arm as she sits. She smiles. Before he can draw his hand, a woman, closely veiled, steps forward, stops in front of Crittenden, draws a pistol from beneath her long cloak, and shoots him down as she cries, You have ruined me and my child. She drops the pistol to the deck and disappears into the crowd. Three days later, Crittenden died. Mrs. Fair is indicted for murder in the first degree. This is Judge Samuel Dunell. I have presided in the trial of Laura D. Fair, which began March 27, 1871. The doctors who attended Mr. Crittenden in his final hours before his death on November 6, 1870, have already testified that the cause of death was in consequence of retarded circulation resulting from a gunshot wound. Prosecutor, Mr. Alexander Campbell, has just called his next witness, who has been sworn in and takes his seat on the stand. He is William H. Kensel. Would you tell us, Mr. Kensel, what your occupation was in the month of November of last year? Yes, sir. I was captain of Harbor Police. And you held that position on November the 3rd of last year, 1870, that is. Yes, sir. On that day, do you recall what took place aboard the ferry boat El Capitan? I do. I went aboard the boat at a quarter past five o'clock. At the San Francisco Terminal? Yes. We went across the bay to the Oakland Wharf. Was there anybody among the passengers that you recognized? Mr. Crittenden was aboard. I recognized him. I did not know the defendant until the evening of that day. In other words, the boat made the trip to Oakland and docked there without incident. Uh, Yes, that's right. The shooting took place after the ferry boat had pulled away from the Oakland slip. Now, just a moment, Mr. Kensel. I object, Your Honor. This witness hasn't been asked about a shooting. There's been no foundation laid for any such testimony. Your Honor, if the defense counsel will curb his tendency to cavil over inconsequential matters, I shall get on with the testimony. Your Honor, I object to having a legitimate... Oh, oh, all right, gentlemen. Now, let's get on with this witness's testimony. Frame your next question, if you will, Mr. Campbell, so that even Mr. Cook will be satisfied. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Kensel, let's go back to the point where the El Capitan pulled away from the Oakland Wharf and headed back to San Francisco. You were aboard, weren't you? I was. Now, did anything unusual take place as the boat got underway? Yes, sir. Just after the boat left the slip, I heard a shot. When you heard the shot, what did you do? I ran to the starboard side where I heard the shot come from. I saw Mr. Crittenden stagger to his feet. His wife was endeavoring to support him. I went to her side and kept the crowd back. I... I do not know where Mrs. Fair was at that time. When I first saw her, she was about 15 feet from Mr. Crittenden and standing perfectly still. The boat captain, Captain Bushnell, handed me a pistol. I was joined in by Mr. Crittenden's son, Parker. We went around the boat and into the cabin where Parker pointed Mrs. Fair out and said, that's the woman that murdered my father. Did she make any reply to this accusation? Yes, sir. She said, I don't deny it. I took hold of her and led her out to the after deck and kept the crowd away from her. When we got to San Francisco, I took her uh, in a carriage to the city prison. Did she offer any resistance? No, sir. All she said was she felt very bad and wanted a doctor. She said she had a doctor who lived on Kearney, who'd been giving her drops for a complaint she had. Officer Barney Murray went off to see about getting a doctor because she seemed very excited. Said she was cold. How was she dressed? She had a waterproof cloak on, a brown color, and she wore a brown veil tied over her head. And I think there was a hood on her dress and over her head. Could you distinguish her features? Oh, yes. I told her to put the veil down, but she didn't try to hide her face. You stated earlier that the boat captain handed you a pistol shortly after the shooting took place. Yeah, that's right. Uh, captain Bushnell. Did he say anything to you as he handed you the pistol? He said it was picked up off the deck shortly after the shooting. I show you this pistol, which has already been admitted in evidence. Do you recognize it? Yes, sir. It's the one the captain handed me. How would you describe it? It's what we call a small four-shooter. You examined it at the time? Oh, yes, sir. There was one empty charge. And three uncharged? Uh, Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kensel. No further questions, Your Honor. 
We shall recess until two o'clock this afternoon. Mrs. Crittenden, the widow of A.P. Crittenden, was called to the stand by Mr. Camel, the prosecutor. She came forward, leaning on the arm of one of her sons. She was attired in deep mourning. After being sworn, she took her seat, raised her veil, and turned a steady look with her clear, dark eyes upon the lawyer for the prosecution, who uh, asked her to state her name. I am the widow of the late Alexander P. Crittenden. I was not quite 33 years his wife. I shall try to keep my questions at a minimum, Mrs. Crittenden, because all of us here are aware of the suffering that has been visited upon you by the tragic death of your husband. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Mrs. Crittenden, you were aboard the steamer El Capitan on the afternoon of November 3rd of last year, is that correct? Yes. Would you please tell the court what took place on that day, from the time your train arrived in Oakland? My train arrived from the east, and my husband met me at the wharf. We went together on board the steam ferry boat, walked up the steps on the left-hand side, and then we crossed to see whether the seat we usually occupied was empty against the wheelhouse. We went around there and took our seats, my husband, my little daughter, my son, Parker. And were there other passengers standing about on the deck? Oh, yes. I naturally looked around to see who was there, having just arrived from the east. And uh, to my right, I saw a woman who, as far as I can remember, had a waterproof cloak on. Her face was covered with something. I observed her because I thought it was a strange dress for a bright, sunshiny afternoon. I turned away from her to converse with my husband. He had just made a gracious remark in his usual gentlemanly way to a woman passenger. And as we exchanged smiling glances, I put my arm through his. It was about five minutes after we'd come aboard. He... He patted my hand. <laughs> now, you take your time, Mrs. Crittenden. Would you like a glass of water? No, thank you. No, I'm quite all right. <clears throat> as I said... He patted my hand, and there came a flash and a report almost in my face, it seemed. I looked up to see who'd fired the shot, and I saw this woman, the same figure that I'd observed before. My husband fell to the deck. I sat down beside him, and I held his head. My son Parker came up, and I said to him, Your father's been shot, and told him who'd done it. I stayed with my husband till the boat arrived here in San Francisco, and then I went with him in the wagon in which a bed had been set up. Uh, the wagon took us directly to our own house, and, uh, well, I guess that's about all that's necessary. Just a couple more questions, if you'll bear with me, Mrs. Crittenden. Certainly. My question is this. Have you ever heard the defendant say anything of the, of the nature of a threat toward your husband? Yes. When and where? Please give us the circumstances, time and place. Uh, well, the first time I heard her threaten my husband was when she came to our house around the 1st of November. Of last year? Uh, no, 1869. Mm -hmm. Please go on, Mrs. Crittenden. What time of day was it when she came to your house? Well, it was about 11 o'clock at night. My son Parker was in bed asleep. I was also in bed but awake. My husband had just come home when our doorbell rang, and Parker ran downstairs, opened the door. My husband went to the head of the stairs and shouted, Oh, what is it you want, or something to that effect. I could hear a woman's voice, but I couldn't hear what she said. I put on a robe and rushed into the hall, and I saw my husband go down the stairs and join the woman who was standing just inside the front door. Could you recognize her from where you were? Oh, yes, the hall light was on. It was Mrs. Fair. The defendant. Yes. Please continue. Could you hear what was being said between the defendant and your husband? Both seemed to be angry and their voices were raised. Repeat what you heard. Um, she said, 
Mr. Crittenden, you have not been kind to me. This angered him, and he shouted, You women have unsexed yourselves. I utterly despise and abhor you. He used the plural, women. I don't know why. What else did you overhear? Well, she said something to the effect that my husband had ruined her life and that of her child. My husband threatened to have his son go to the police if she did not leave. She became almost tearful and asked him to walk her home. He refused, and I went back to my bedroom and I closed the door. Thank you, Mrs. Crittenden. That's all for now. Mr. Cook, um, you wish to cross-examine? I have only a couple of questions, Your Honor. Uh, Mrs. Crittenden, you were aware, were you not, of the relationship between your husband and the defendant, Mrs. Fair? What relationship? Oh, that's what I'm trying to find out. How would you define their relationship? As far as I'm concerned, there was no relationship. Oh, come now, Mrs. Crittenden. You surely don't contend that over a period of some seven years that the companionship that was so palpably apparent escaped your notice? I'm waiting for your answer, Mrs. Crittenden. I have no answer to something that never existed. Did your husband ever come to you and say that he wanted a divorce so he could be free to marry Mrs. Fair? I object, Your Honor. The conduct of the counsel is outrageous. And his treatment of this witness is a disgrace to the legal profession. I don't wish to engage in theatrics with my distinguished colleague, Your Honor. No further questions. This is Judge Dunell again. It is the fifth day of the trial of Laura D. Fair. Mr. Elisha Cook is about to open the case for the defense. Mr. Cook, you may proceed. If Your Honor, please. Gentlemen of the jury, we are all engaged and have been engaged for several days in a trial in which the defendant is charged with the murder of the man she loved. The man who had taken rooms next hers and slept there the night before he was shot. The man who, through the years, wrote her fervid, nay, passionate love letters, which we shall put in evidence for the purpose of showing the exact relations between Crittenden and the defendant through a series of years. Now, it's axiomatic that to be guilty of murder in the first degree, it must be shown that the defendant's state of mind was such that the intent to kill was there. And it's equally true that a person of a deranged mind at the time of the killing cannot be held responsible because the mens rea, the guilty mind... The premeditated desire to kill is wanting. Such is the case here. We shall establish before you that Mrs. Fair, not only at the time of the shooting, but for 12 months before, at stated periods, was not a responsible being. She was in what was called a state of partial intellectual insanity and partial moral insanity. We shall show you that she was a very excitable and a very generous person. I will show you that her emotions were so strong that they outran her intellect, that it was as utterly impossible for her at the time Mr. Crittenden was shot to prevent it as it would be for a rabid dog not to bite you if you met him in the street. After she shot the man she loved, did she try to hide the weapon or throw it into the water of the bay just two feet distant from where she stood? No. She dropped the pistol to the deck of the ship three feet in front of her victim. Your Honor, at this point... I should like Mrs. Fair to take the stand for one purpose, to identify the letter she received from Mr. Crittenden. I ask the defendant to please come forward and be sworn in. Mrs. Fair rose to her feet, looked at her mother and her 11-year-old daughter who sat just behind her, and after being sworn, took her seat on the witness stand. Mrs. Fair... I show you this package. Will you tell us what it contains? A portion of the contents are notes sent to me by Mr. Crittenden. Some while I was married to Mr. Snyder. How long did your correspondence exist? It commenced in 1866 when we were first separated and continued down to within a few days of his death. If the court please, I submit that the letters be turned over to the clerk to be marked. No, no. No, don't take them. No, I, I would remind the witness that it is only for the purpose of identification and is quite proper. My, my mother has another package of them. Your Honor, I submit that the letters be taken by the clerk and marked for identification. It is so ordered. Now, Mrs. Fair, I show you this letter. Would you please tell us when you received it? I received 
This last September, before my divorce from Mr. Snyder. And the letter is in whose handwriting? Mr. Crittenden's. May I see the letter? I was about to hand it to you, Mr. Campbell. No, no, stop! Just be calm, Mrs. Fair. The prosecution is entitled to examine such evidence. Your Honor, I object to the admission of this letter and of all the correspondence counsel for the defense is attempting to introduce. This is an attempt to introduce a new principle in the courts of justice. We ought to assume that a married man may form an illicit connection with a woman and maintain it for years, and yet, whenever he shows an indication to return to the paths of morality, then that is a cause of insanity in a woman who has borne that illicit relationship and excuses his murder at her hand. Why, it lifts the mistress above the wife and asserts the monstrous doctrine that the husband who has seen the error of his ways and intends to return to his wife may be shot in her presence by the mistress whom he has discarded. I submit, Your Honor, that the defense letter should not be admitted, for its only effect would be to heap old scandal on the dead and additional dishonor on the living. continued until April 26, 1871, upon which day, after a short deliberation, the jury returned with the verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Four days later, I pronounced sentence on Laura D. Fair. My sentence was as follows. The judgment of the court is that on Friday, the 28th day of July next, you be hanged by the neck until you shall be dead. And God have mercy upon your soul. Mrs. Fair did not hang. She won an appeal and was granted a new trial, which began in September of 1872. She did not take the stand, and after 17 days was found not guilty. And so, at age 35, she walked forth from the courtroom a free woman. And what, you may ask, finally became of Laura D. Fair, that strangely alluring woman who loved so deeply that it became madness and who almost became the first woman to hang in the state of California? Well, one thing we can say for sure. She was durable. She lived to be 82. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Laura D. Fair, was written by Michael Raffetto and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our star was Tony Tenniel. Featured in the cast were Les Tremaine, Harold Gould, Mary Jane Croft, Tyler McVeigh, Stephen Markle, and James McCallion. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Nesty Iced Tea. Nesty tastes good all over. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces.
This is Vincent Price. The housewarming, a pleasant tradition. The house goes up and the new owners step across the threshold to celebrate with friends the beginning of a new home. It is a tradition that dates back centuries and continues even unto this day, although its significance is perhaps somewhat diminished by the fact that so many of us live in rented apartments or in houses we buy but did not build. Our story is about a couple, Brent and Muffin Weatherby, who fall into the latter category. Brent and Muffin are the privileged descendants of two very old and very wealthy families. They have been searching the hills of western Connecticut for an isolated haven far from the city. They come across a modest cottage fallen into disrepair. Oh, but, Bren, it's just the thing. Our friends will just die. Oh, it's so quaint. And the real estate agent says it's guaranteed to be at least 150 years old. Mm, I don't know. It's no bargain. There's a lot of work we'd have to do. Then let's do it. What do you say? We'll do it ourselves and really make it ours. You can hire the carpenters and I can hire the interior decorators. And Muffin prevailed. Architects, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and interior decorators were employed. And on a fine, crisp autumn day, the young couple took possession of their perfect country cottage. A celebration? Yes, a celebration. Large or small? Small, I should think, since we still haven't been able to find decent help. They decided to ask only their closest friends, another well-to-do young couple by the names of Rob and Paige Knowlton. The Weatherbys and Knowltons both had summer homes in the Hamptons and belonged to the same clubs there and in the city. So it was settled. The Knowltons would be their first guests. What they didn't know is that they would also be their last guests. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Housewarming by Percy Granger. Our stars, Jack Edwards, Linda K. Henning. Jack Bannon and Vivi Janice. The hills of western Connecticut. An old cottage purchased and restored by a wealthy young couple from New York City who had decided to simplify their lifestyle to get back to basics. There was another reason, too. But let's allow the story to tell itself. Muffin? Muffin? I know, I know. I I just can't cope with all these pots and pans at once. Careful. And what's this that was boiling over? Oh, something. Uh, We'll have enough to eat without it. It's after seven and you aren't even dressed. I'll be changed. Just let me check the roast. They were due at seven. You're the only person I know who's ever on time. Don't worry, I'll be dressed. Oh, the stove. The roast is almost overcooked. It'll be so much easier when we get our help. Well, till we find a decent cook and a housekeeper, we'll just have to rough it. I'm beginning to miss New York already. Oh, we're not that far away. The train from Timpton will get us into the city in less than two hours. It won't be the same, though. Well, you won't be able to see certain people you're used to seeing. No, I meant the convenience of having the opera and ballet right there and all the parties. Well, I like it here. The peace and the quiet. Being so close to the woods and the ski slopes. And if we get bored, we'll just move back in, that's all. It is beautiful, that's true. Mm. You know, I heard in town this morning that the autumn colors are going to reach their peak this weekend. This was a good time to ask Robin Page to come up. Why did you insist we invite them? Why not? They're friends. You know what I mean, Brent. If we moved out of the city to get away from... We wanted to try a different lifestyle, that's all. Become a little more self-sufficient. To get away from certain things, to get over certain things, end them. Then why... 
Maybe I just want to see if it's really over between you two. Oh, but why tempt... Rob is my best friend, Muffin. He might quite possibly be my only friend. That's not what no, I... No, no, I'm well aware of my charm. And people like me can't afford to hold grudges, can they? Oh, Brent, it's going to be different now that we're all alone out here. I promise. You better get dressed. I want you to look smashing tonight. Muffin? Muffin, are you dressed? Muffin? Muffin? Yes, dear? Didn't you hear me? I called you. Oh, I didn't hear you. I had the hairdryer on. What was it you wanted? Well, they'll be here. What's taking you so long? I don't want to look frumpy, do I? You said you wanted me to look smashing. Well, stop fussing with your hair. I'm not fussing. Yes, you are. When did you get that dress? Oh, this one? Do you like it? When did you get it? Oh, uh, let's see. I don't remember, really. Last month, I think. They were showing the new winter lines, and I picked up a few things. Do you like it? Yes. Yes, you really look quite lovely. Thank you. What's the matter? Nothing. Yes, something's the matter. No, it's nothing. Are you ready? Brent, I told you before it's all over. There's nothing for you to be jealous about. I'm not jealous. You've never worn that dress before. There wasn't the right occasion for it. Yeah. Exactly. Will you open the bedroom doors up here? Why? Well, they've never seen the house. It looks homier with the doors open. Closed doors are so final. All right. All done. Ready? In a minute. You don't suppose anything's happened to them, do you? These country roads are so dark. Rob, get lost or have an accident? Rob, the all-American boy scout? I can see a light on the road. It's turning into the drive. That's them. Speak of the devil. Go down and let them in. I won't be more than a few minutes, dear. Hello, yourself, pal. Lord, give me strength to suffer the truly idle rich. Coming, coming. Hi. Hello, Brent. Hi, Paige. Hi, Tiger. Come on in. I'd shake hands, but they're kind of rough from chopping wood. <laughs> You're not wasting any time, are you? <laughs> Already the country squire. Where's Muffin? Oh, she's upstairs just tossing something on. Say... This is really something. I mean, look at all this polished wood in the fireplace. Very Elizabethan. Say, here, I brought some wine for dinner. Mm. Maybe I'll run up and say hi to Muffin. Uh, how about a drink? Uh, well... Page? Uh, spritzer, please. Well, I... Rob? Just pour me a splash of... Well, let's see. Is it going to drop below 40 tonight? <laughs> yeah, just bourbon, please. You! Man on two! It's a red wine we brought. You better open it and give it a chance to breathe. Oh, yeah. I'll fix my own drink. Make me feel right at home. So, the $64,000 question. If you and little Miss Debutante moved out here to try to revitalize your marriage, why'd you ask us out? You see how I've arranged my samovar collection on the beams across the living room? <laughs> Brent? Rob is my best friend. We went to prep school together to college. Our families are good friends. Well, I think it's probably over between them, though frankly I can't say as I much care. Anyway, that's not the only reason. It was time for a change. Hey, you know I walked three miles today. Oh, walking. Oh, and look at this. Out the window. The nearest house... Is a half mile down the road. You can barely see their lights. It's very peaceful out here at nights. The wind in the trees, the hills. 
Oh, and tomorrow you'll see the spectacular autumn colors. They're mostly yellow, red, and orange. Will you be coming into the city at all? Oh, sure. Muffin and I... I meant by yourself. Well, probably once a week to see my business advisor about the investment portfolios of our trust funds. Rob's off to Palm Beach next week for the polo tournament. Oh? I'm not going. Why not? (laughs) I just thought you might like to know that I'll be in our apartment all alone for ten days. Maybe you'd like to stop by. Paige, what are you... Me? Of course. Why? Why not? (laughs) Me? Well, I find you very appealing, Brent. I always have. You do? Of course. I'm attracted to men who collect things. You find me appealing, don't you? Oh, yes, but... Oh, shh, they're coming. Well, you will think about it, won't you? I mean, what else is there in life to offer but a little intrigue? Pete! Hi, Muffin. Oh, excuse me, I'm a little behind. But here we all are. And we're going to have a wonderful weekend together, aren't we? A nice, quiet weekend in the country with old friends. Nothing to do but sit around, drink in hand, and intrigue. On the surface, all is gentility. But beneath the breeding, the emotions simmer. Oh, they can keep the lid on, people usually do. But what they don't know, these four, is how close they stand, foot by shadow, with doom. Brent, Muffin looks A1 tonight. Country obviously agrees with her. (laughs) Well, I don't know yet. I had to cook dinner all by myself. So we stand forewarned. (laughs) (laughs) I can smell it all the way in here, and it smells terrific. Here's your bourbon, Rob. Here, here. I want to propose a toast to Muffin and what's his name on the acquisition of their latest home. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, what I like is how you can actually see the stars at night, not like the city at all. Come over here, look. Hey, it's a full moon and everything. Bright enough for a walk after dinner if anyone's interested. Brent has already walked three miles today. A muffin? Why don't I go see if the roast is ready? You need help? No. Well... I was just thinking what a laugh it's going to be, the expression on Mumsy's face when she hears what we've moved into. You haven't told your mother yet? Oh, she'd be mortified to know we were living in an old tenant farmer's cottage. It was built, as nearly as we've been able to determine, about 1792. Originally, all the land hereabouts was owned by the Van Rinskels. Oh. The same Van Rinskels who held the mortgage on the Mayflower? Oh, darling, they built this place to house several families of tenant farmers who worked the land for them. And surrendered half their crop to the ruthless landlord each year for the privilege? Probably. (laughs) Well, they didn't have it all that bad. I mean, keeping a place this size clean is certainly easier than a normal house with 35 or 40 rooms. Mm -hmm. Yoo-hoo! Everything's ready, folks. Take your seats. That's what I like to hear. Call me anything but late for dinner. (laughs) Uh, boy, girl, boy, girl? I think that's Muffin's cleverly original idea. Mm -hmm. Rob, you there? Aye, aye. And Paige, allow me. Oh, thank you. Did I tell you how nice your scrimshaw looks on the high boy there? Uh, uh, Brent, (laughs) where's the wine? Ah, on the sideboard by the liquor. I see it. Here, I want you to taste this. I got a whole case of it from Bobo de Palfrey. It's awesome. They say wine's a good investment now. Oh, good heavens, yes. I hired a wine expert to help me. You should look into it. There. Have a taste. All right. Hey, pal, what's wrong? Brent! What is that stuff? It's a Chateau Gaston Leroux, 1940. The last of the good vintages before the Panzers rolled over the vineyard. They've never been the same since. Are you okay? It's the worst stuff I've ever had. 
Oh, it's thick as mud. Oh, don't be silly. We just had a bottle last night. Well, look at it. Oh. I've never seen wine that color before in my life. It looks like... Like what? Blood. Blood? Oh, really? Look, I've been on enough safaris to know blood when I see it, Paige. Is this your idea of a joke? What? You want to tell me what this is all about? What are you talking about? Here comes the roast. What's wrong? I just got fed blood. Look, I'm as shocked as you are, pal. I don't know what happened. Where did you get blood? From the wine bottle. Oh. The wine's 40 years old. Maybe there was mold in the cork or bacteria. Maybe it was exposure to the air. You actually expect me to believe that? You really think I'm a chump, don't you? You really think that you can just put things right past me and I won't even notice? Look, I didn't change that wine into blood, all right? I am not Moses. Oh, someone finally told you, huh? And you believe that? Uh, uh, boys, boys, remember the old school tie. I really don't think I'm very hungry. Well, I am. Let's have a look at your roast muffin. Oh, would you take the lid off, dear? I'm afraid it may be a little overdone. What's this? What? It's roast. Look at it. It's raw. Raw? It's completely uncooked. It's totally raw. But I cooked it. You saw it. You smelled it. Okay, what's going on? What are you two up to? Nothing. I took this out of the oven not two minutes ago. It, w it was practically burned. And who else was in the kitchen? No one. And who else could have done this? <laughs> but I didn't. I took it off the roasting tray and put it right on the serving platter and covered it like the cookbook said to. Oh, and it just went raw on you, huh? All right now. All right. If Muffin says she didn't do it, we ought to accept that. Why? Muffin said she didn't do a lot of things. Brent, did this house come with a ghost? What? Well, that is all the rage now. No. You didn't invite us here to terrify us, did you? Don't you try to turn this around and... I'm not. But first the wine, and now this. What other possible explanation could there be? Very ominous happenings. A perfectly nice, ordinary meal is transformed seemingly before the very eyes of four astonished people into a grisly repast of blood and uncooked flesh. Is it sleight of hand by one of them? Or could there be another presence in the house, an unseen intruder who is tormenting them before making himself known? Or is it something else altogether? Something that has no shape? Paige, you really think we might have a ghost? Oh, rot. Nonsense. Well, such things happen. I've read about them. You read about everything. You, you know something about everything. My wife, the dilettante. Okay, now, Brent, calm down. There's got to be a more sensible explanation. I couldn't agree more, my friend. What is it? Well, how would I know? You used to dabble a bit yourself, didn't you? What's that mean? I seem to remember once being subjected to feats of remarkable prestidigitation by one Rinaldo the Magician. Rob. Rinaldo the Magician? That's a secret you swore you'd never tell. Back in prep school, old Bretzi here wasn't exactly Mr. Popularity. So he took up the study of magic. That's enough. You promised. I never knew that. Yeah, and one night we were all treated to a stage performance... Inexplicable illusions as performed by Rinaldo the Magician. Unfortunately, he hadn't perfected most of his tricks, and the whole thing was a fiasco. He was hooted off the stage. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so then what happened, Brent? Did you retire to your room in disgrace and vow then and there to perfect the ultimate illusion and someday have your revenge? Am I revenged? Would you say this is sufficient revenge for the betrayal I suffered from you? What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Brent. You and my wife. We don't have to talk about it. Yes, Brent. It's bad breeding to discuss infidelity at the dinner table. That's it. We're going. I'm not going to sit here and listen to this. Paige, get your coat. And as for you, Brent, your little revenge was about as effectual as everything else you've ever done. If I wanted revenge, I'd know how to take it, mister. I'd know how to take it. Well, I won't hold my breath. What's the matter with this door? A big, strong man like you can't get it open? 
It's stuck. It can't be stuck. The carpenters rehung it just last week. Well, you try it. <clears throat> the handle won't even turn. Muffin, did you lock it? No. Where's the key? Well, it should be on the mantel. I'll get it. Now you've locked us in, is that it? Rob, I haven't touched this door, all right? Then who did? I don't know. It's an old lock. Maybe it slipped or whatever locks do. Here's the key. What's the matter? The key won't go in. You're hopeless. Let me try. Hmm. It looks like it should fit. You sure this is the right key? Yes. It's like there's something in the lock, isn't it? Yeah. But I can't see anything in the hole. How about you? No. Well, for Pete's sake, then, why don't we go out the back door? Yeah, Muffin, get the flashlight, would you? Well, Rob, come on. Either we're mad at Brent or we're not. Oh, that's right. Uh, here, take your stupid key. Come on, Paige. We'll go out the back way. What's the matter? This one's stuck, too. The handle won't turn at all. What the heck is going on? What's the matter? What do you think? It won't open? Okay, Brent, you win. You've had your fun. Now, how much further are you going to take this? Rob, I swear to you, I'm not doing anything. Well, then who is? I don't know. Well, I want us out of here in 30 seconds. You understand? I don't like this one bit. But these are the only two doors. What about the root cellar? There's a trap door to it in the kitchen, and, and we had some workmen make an outside entrance. That's right, the root cellar. It's under the butcher block table. Rob, grab the other end and help me move it. Please, try not to scratch the floor. There's the handle. I'll do it. Be careful of your back, darling puss. It's stuck. It won't open. What, are we trapped in here? Why don't we just all sit down and relax? After all, we did come here for the weekend. But something very strange is happening to us. Sweetie, I wish you hadn't said that. Well, we can't just sit down. We've got to do something. All right. I vote we send for the cavalry. Paige. I mean, call the police or the fire department. You do have those things out here, don't you? Yeah, good. That's a good idea. Hello? Hello? Honey, what's wrong? It's dead. Dead? Listen for yourselves. There's nothing. No dial tone, no sound, nothing. You mean someone's cut the wires? Okay, folks. I know it's traditionally been my function to keep my head when the rest of you were losing yours. But this is beginning to get on my nerves, so it's amnesty time. Now, if it's one of us who's behind all this... Confess now, and we won't prosecute, okay? That was what I was afraid of. Oh, my God. What's happening to us? Nothing. The windows. Let's try a window. Have you got the catch off? Of course I do. I may be all American, but I'm not stupid. It won't open. Just break it and get us out of here. Is that okay with you, Brent? Yeah. I'll use a poker from the fireplace. All right, stand back, everyone. You've got to hit it harder than that. Let me try. You think I can't break glass? You think I'm too weak to break glass? Give it to me. Break! Break! Please, break! Hey, hey, Muffin, careful. Regular window glass. It's not possible that it wouldn't break. Oh, Brent, you're such a klutz. You've gone and bought a possessed house. Oh, I'm not a klutz. Well, they are the latest thing. You read about them all the time. Can cars passing by see the house from the road? Yes. Let's try sending an SOS. You got a flashlight? Yeah, on the shelf here. Oh, Rob, how merit badge. Have you got any better suggestions? As a matter of fact, yes. I'm going to pour myself a drink. Here's the flashlight. You know Morse code? Mm, they taught us in the Navy. 
We just have to wait for a car. Out here, that could take weeks. One should be by shortly. Muffin, would you like a stiff shot of something? Just leave me alone. I can't see a thing. Wasn't the moon out a while ago? Yes. I remarked to Paige there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was filled with stars. It sure clouded over in a hurry. It's pitch black out there now. Wait a minute. Something's wrong. The farmhouse... What farmhouse? Uh, our nearest neighbors. It's about a half mile down the road, but we can always see their lights. Where? I can't see a thing. That's what I mean. It's like someone's painted over our windows. There's nothing but a sheer wall of black, like... Like we've been shut up in here and sealed off from the rest of the world. Vincent Price again. And here's the fourth act of The Housewarming. Oh, we must be able to see something. Everything can't have just disappeared. Muffin. Why is this happening to us? What have we ever done? It's, yeah, it's a phenomenon, uh, that's all. It's some kind of natural occurrence. Uh, we'll find out soon enough. It can't go on forever. My attitude exactly, Brent. And until then... Uh, Paige, go easy on the booze, will you? Look, have any of you activists thought of going upstairs? Well, I, I mean, it's possible that we could get out through a window up there. Maybe our tormentor is strictly a first-story person. Yes. I had a window open in the bedroom. I was going to close it when I came down, but when Rob came up, I, I forgot about it. Really? Rob hasn't made me forget anything in years. Okay, Paige, that's enough. I could go upstairs and check that window, I guess. I think Rob should go. He's stronger. I'll do it. Yes, don't be so quick to volunteer my husband for sacrificial lamb detail. Look, we can both go up. That okay with you, Brent? I'm sure if there was anyone up there, we'd have heard them. Now, let's take the fire irons just in case. Here, Rob. Thanks. You ready? see? Nothing. The doors are all closed. Were they closed when you came down? I don't remember. I was looking around to see how you'd fixed it all up. I don't think I shut the doors, but maybe I did. Oh, no. What? I don't believe it. It won't open? Just like all the others, it's sealed shut. They're all like that. None of them will budge. Wait. Look. What? The door. The room at the end of the hall. It's open. What room is that? The guest room. You see anything? It's too dark. Turn on the light. It's right by the door. <gasps> oh, God. My God. They weren't here before. Not, not when I was looking around. Are they... Are they human? Yeah, I think so. How many? They're so bunched together, it's hard to tell, but it looks like eight. Two adults and six smaller ones. Brent, come on, let's get out of here. What happened? Are you all right? Well, what did you find? Why don't you ask Muffin? What? Or Rob? Me? Brent, what is it? Is someone up there? I heard the two of you laughing up there. Is this what you were up to? I, I don't know what you're talking about. 
What is up there? Skeletons. Human skeletons on the bed in the guest room. Very neatly arranged. Very artistic. Skeletons? You always said you wanted to be an artist, but you just never got around to it, did you? Well, this grisly little sculpture that you and your lover concocted is quite effective. Congratulations. Well, you ought to see it, Paige. Are you serious? No, thanks. There are eight of them. Two adults, six children. Symbolic of the family, wouldn't you say? Is that a fair interpretation, Muffin? Stop it! You're making this up just to torment me. And they're all huddled together on the bed, their arms draped about each other in loving harmony. Still on the right track? No! What's the message? That a house without children is like a tomb? Is this your way of getting back at me for choosing not to have children because I see no point in propagating the charade we call a human race any further? Leave her alone, Brent. She didn't do it, and neither did I. Hmm. That only leaves me. No takers, huh? Well, that's disappointing. I'm not even worthy of suspicion. I am truly a superfluous person. Look, I... I think it's pretty clear. I mean, we're in it, aren't we? We're really in it. The phone is dead, the doors and the windows are all sealed, and now... Do you want a drink? That seems to be the one thing I can offer. No. Brent? No, but thanks, Pidge. Well, perhaps we should review the situation. Now, I I don't think there's any longer much doubt what's happening. I mean, the, the question is... Is it random, or is there a purpose behind all this? Those skeletons have to be there for a reason. It just can't be arbitrary. There has to be a meaning. Well, then the question becomes, do we really want to find out what it is? Are we going to have a choice? Does anyone else think it's getting difficult to breathe in here? Yeah, it is getting close, isn't it? I'm not going to just sit here. There's got to be a way out. But where? Where? What about the chimney? We haven't tried that. How big's the flue? I I don't know. Let's find out. It'll be sealed up like everything else. It's worth a try. Give me a leg up, will you, Brent? All right. (coughs) Why don't you have this thing cleaned out? I've been going to. It's just hard to find someone willing to do it. Oh, I think it's going to be too narrow. I could just get a decent footing. And no, not that stone. It's loose. You okay? I can't get through. My shoulders are too broad. Maybe you could, or one of the girls. Paige is slimmer than I am. Me? Go up a chimney? No. No, I can see. It's less than a foot wide. None of us would fit. So there's no way out? These pants are a loss. Sorry. Forget them. So now what do we do? I guess we're just supposed to sit here. But I can't breathe. Look, I'd, I'd like to say something. I I want to admit that I'm scared. I swore once I'd never admit that to anyone ever again. Freshman year at St. Jude's Academy when the boonies dragged me out of bed at midnight and made me go up in the bell tower by myself. I called my father afterwards in tears. He hung up on me. That's when I swore. You never told me about that? Well, I guess I've been kind of an emotional eunuch ever since. But the the point I'm trying to make is I I think we're going to come through this. I really do. And I I think things will be different. They will be different. I will be. I will be, Paige, I promise. There are so many things I want to do with my life. A muffin... If if you still want a child... Oh, I do, Brent. I really do. You see, this is it. This is the meaning you were looking for, Rob. The four of us have become true friends again. I don't know what's happening to us any more than the rest of you, but it's a sign. It's a warning that we must change. We have to change. And we can do it, can't we? Rob's right. We're sharing an experience, and we're going to come through it as better people. Here, here. What... What, what is that? What? In the fireplace where Rob kicked that stone loose. See? There's something white sticking out of the hole. It's a piece of paper. It looks pretty old. There's writing on it. A secret message. Maybe it's the explanation to what's happening to us. What does it say? It's dated November 1822. My name is Michael O'Mara, 
and I write this note with the last strength that is in my body. My family of... What? Of six little ones and my wife. The skeletons upstairs? Are starving to death. It was a hard harvest this year by the grace of God, but our master still demanded his full share of the crop, leaving us without enough food to survive the winter. My pleas fell on deaf ears, and now that the winter snows are on the ground, we are unable to leave our house even to hunt the game. On the heads of the rich be the deaths of my wife, my children, and myself. Somehow... Someday, they shall pay. Several days passed, and then in response to a phone call from the neighbors two local policemen arrived at the Weatherby Cottage to investigate why its occupants have not been seen. Hello? Try the door. Hmm. Not even locked. Anyone home? Everything looks okay to me. Nothing's messed up. Look at this. The table's laid out for dinner. There's a roast and wine. The whole work's just sitting there. Kind of odd for ten o'clock in the morning, don't you think? Oh. Meat's cold. What are you doing? Tasting the wine. See how long it's been open? <laughs> Turning to vinegar. Maybe we should look upstairs. Yeah. What's the story on the people who bought this place? The name is Weatherby. Apparently they load it. Old family. All the guy has to do is live off the interest from his trust fund. <laughs> Some people got all the luck, don't they? Hello? Anyone up here? Doesn't look like it. All the doors are open. No one in any of the rooms. There's one down at the end of the hall. Let's check that. I don't get it. Why would they just all get up from the dinner table and vanish? Holy Toledo. Chief, are those what I think they are? Yeah. Human skeletons. They've all got their arms wrapped around each other. How many are there? Four. Looks like it was four adults. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Housewarming, was written by Percy Granger and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Jack Edwards, Linda K. Henning, Jack Bannon, and Vivi Janice. Featured in the cast were William Woodson and Cedric Scott. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Serta Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations with the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. And by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Cicely Tyson. Tomorrow at the same time, I'll bring you this week's romantic drama. 
a new play as unpredictable as love itself. This is Vincent Price. Edgar Bolton is as average as the average man can be. At 55, which certainly is not old by today's standards, Edgar lives in a modest, heavily mortgaged home in the suburbs. He has just made the sixth payment on a new car. Only 30 more and the car will be his. Edgar has an average wife named Helen. Edgar and Helen have two daughters. One is married. The other is still attending college. For the past 38 years, Edgar has been employed by the Hopkins Quality Shoe Company. He started out as an errand boy and then worked his way up to head bookkeeper and chief accountant. Up until the time that Peter Hopkins Sr. died, Edgar was looked upon as Hopkins' right-hand man. Because of his dedication and working knowledge of the business end of the firm, some people wondered why Edgar had never been made vice president. In any event, with all these things going for him, Edgar Bolton is the least likely person in the world to become embroiled in murder. But that's exactly what is going to happen to him. And that's only the beginning of our story. <laughs> Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Accidentally on Purpose, by Martin Ryerson. Our stars, Vic Perrin and Jim Hamilton. Edgar Bolton's involvement in murder started on a Monday morning at the breakfast table in the Bolton kitchen. As Helen picked up the coffee pot and filled Edgar's cup, she said, With food prices the way they are, Edgar, I simply can't manage any more on your salary. Please, Helen, don't start that again. I'm not only going to start it, Edgar. I'm going to keep at it until you ask young Mr. Hopkins for a raise. But it's hard to talk to Junior. He isn't like his father. No matter, Edgar. You've got to ask him for more money. Okay. But I know what he's going to say. He can't afford it. <laughs> raise, Edgar. I can't afford it. But I haven't had an increase in salary in more than three years, Mr. Hopkins, since long before your father died. I'm sorry, Edgar. As a matter of fact, I've been meaning to call you in here to my office and talk to you about the new computer I've ordered for the company. Computer? Well, this is the first I've heard about it. No one's been told about it yet, but it'll be here in a few days. It will handle all the bookkeeping chores, as well as much of the other office work, and will require only one person to operate it. Which means, of course, that we'll be eliminating several jobs in the office, including yours. Mine? You mean, you're going to let me go? But what'll I do? Well, it's hardly my concern, Edgar. But it is. I've given 38 years of my life to this firm. Blood, sweat... Oh, please, Edgar, let's not get melodramatic. But I'm 55 years old. Where will I get another job? Besides, your father always promised there'd be a place for me here at Hopkins Shoes for as long as I live. My father was given to sentiment and rash promises. I have a wife and teenage daughter to support. I have obligations to me that... Yes, Frida? Your wife is on the phone, Mr. Hopkins. I'll take it in a moment, Frida. Well, Edgar, it looks as if that ends our conversation. Of course, you'll receive suitable severance pay. No, no. If you don't no. mind, Edgar, my wife is on the phone. I'd like to talk to her... Privately. You just can't turn me out like this. I, I'm not a stranger. I, I knew you as a little boy. You used to call me Uncle Edgar. I'm not a little boy any longer, and you are just another employee who's outlived his usefulness to the firm. Now, I'm going to ask you again to please leave quietly. If not, I'll have you escorted out. <laughs> Edgar, 
Good evening, Mr. Hopkins. I had every intention of talking to you further at the office today. And then I remembered Frida saying that your wife, your mother, and the children were away for the summer and that you'd be here alone. So I thought it might be best if I came here to your house and talked to you. I hope you don't mind. But I do mind. I resent very much your coming here to my home. Please don't close the door on me, Mr. Hopkins. It's very important that I have a few words with you. May I come in? You may not come in. I'm in my bathrobe, ready for bed. But I'll only take a few minutes of your time, please. Oh, very well. Come in. But remember, only for a few minutes. Now, we can talk in here in the study. Now, Edgar, what's so important that it can't wait until morning at the office? I haven't been home since I left work. I just couldn't face my wife and tell her that I've been fired. I, I know she'll go all to pieces. You're being melodramatic again, Edgar. No, no. I just want to impress on you the desperate situation we'll be in if I'm out of a job. Progress, Edgar. You can't expect the world to stand still because it might inconvenience one man. But it isn't just one man. It's my entire family. They'll be completely destroyed. Please, Mr. Hopkins, I'm not asking for my old job back. I'm just asking you not to discharge me. Maybe uh, I could learn to operate the computer. That would take too long. Besides, we've already hired someone. But, well, that, there must be some place in the firm I can fit in. In the, in the plant, maybe. Maybe I could become a cutter or, or, or learn to operate one of the machines. Perforating, crimping, sewing. Or <laughs> you may know the business end of the firm, Edgar, but obviously you know little about manufacturing, how shoes are actually made. Those jobs you mentioned take years to learn. By the time you were qualified to take your place on the assembly line, you'd have reached retirement age. Please, Mr. Hopkins, in my whole life I've never begged. But I'm begging you now, sir. Not for myself. For my wife and daughter. Oh, stop it, Edgar. You're becoming rather tiresome. I'm only trying to make you understand the seriousness of my situation and what will happen if I lose my job. I'll do anything you say. I'll, I'll sweep the floors. I'll act as night watchman. Anything at all. I'll, I'll even take a cut in salary. I'm sorry, Edgar. What I told you this morning still stands. There's no longer any place for you in the firm. Not in the office, not in the plant, not anywhere. You're through. You... Just don't want me around because I remind you of your father. and makes you aware of how inferior you are to him. Now, that's quite enough, Edgar. I want you to leave right now. No, no, I, I won't leave until you promise not to fire me. I dislike violence, Edgar, especially with older men. But I can see there's no other way to deal with no, you. No, now, stay away from me, Junior. Don't call me Junior. And get up out of that chair and go quietly. No. Then I'll have to use force. <laughs> Take your hands off me, Junior. Stop it. You're choking me. Let me go. Put down that paperweight, Edgar. I said, put it down. No, Edgar, don't. Don't hit me with that. Junior. Junior, wake up. Open your eyes. I didn't mean to hit you so hard. I only wanted to make you let me go. You... You were choking me. I, I can hardly breathe. Blood. Your head's bleeding. Uh, oh, no. No, please, Junior, wake up. Your pulse. Where's your pulse? It should be right here in your neck. On your wrist. But it's not. There, there's no pulse beat, and, and you're not, not breathing. I, oh, God, no. It can't be. You... You can't be dead. It took a long time for Edgar to appreciate the full impact of what had happened. To realize that Peter Hopkins, Jr., son of the man who had been his longtime friend and employer, was really dead and that he had killed him. True, it had not been premeditated. He never meant to kill Junior. He only wanted to stop Junior from choking him. My first impulse was to call the police and make a clean breast of the whole thing, but who would believe I hadn't come here to kill him? 
especially if they found out that Junior had fired me. I finally decided that the safest thing to do would be to cover my tracks and leave. Carefully, I wiped everything clean of fingerprints, especially the paperweight. I made sure no evidence was left behind. And then, to make it look like robbery, I pulled out the desk drawers and I emptied their contents and turned over some of the furniture. When that was done, I hurried into the corridor. I looked up the stairs that led to the bedrooms. Everything up there was in total darkness. I listened. There was not a sound. So I left by the front door and hurried to my car parked in the driveway. I drove around for a while until my nerves were steady enough to go home and face my wife. It wasn't until I got there and found the note Helen had left for me that I remembered this was the night she played bingo at the church. It was past 11 when Helen finally got home. That you, Helen? Yes, Edgar. You been home long? Uh, usual time. Have you eaten anything yet? I had a sandwich when I first got home. That was a little after six. Oh, I must have just missed you. I left the house at a quarter to six. You must be starved. I'll see what's in the refrigerator. No, no, I, I'm not hungry. Are you feeling all right, Edgar? Of course. Why? Oh, you're so pale and your hands are shaking. You're coming down with a cold. I'll get you an aspirin. No, no, no. I'll be all right. Now that you're home, I'll get to bed. I'll get some more milk for you. Oh, by the way, Edgar, did you ask Mr. Hopkins about that raise? I didn't get a chance. I was pretty busy all day, but I'll make it a point to speak to him first thing in the morning. And you be firm with him, Edgar. Don't let him talk you out of it. Edgar! Uh, Edgar, wake up! Uh, oh, what's the matter? What time is it? Six thirty. Why did you wake me so early? Young Peter Hopkins has been killed. <laughs> killed? How? I don't know. The report just came over the radio. The police think the motive might have been robbery. I think you'd better hurry and dress and get to the office. Oh, yeah, you're right, Helen. With nobody there to take charge, everything's probably in a mess. Good morning, Frida. Hello, Edgar. I'm glad you got here. Isn't it terrible about Mr. Hopkins? It sure is, but where is everybody? The office is deserted. I sent everyone home. You sent everyone home? Who gave you that authority? Mrs. Hopkins. The senior Mrs. Hopkins. She called from the country as soon as she heard about her son. She wants the entire plant closed down until after Junior's funeral. Then, she says, she and Junior's wife will decide what to do about the company. How did his mother take Peter's death? A lot better than that soupy wife of his. No wonder he couldn't stand her. I thought they were very happily married. Only his secretary would know for sure. Now, I hardly think this is the time for joking, Frida. But I wasn't joking. I'm the one who intercepted their calls and made excuses when he didn't want to go home. I think I'd prefer not to hear about it. Okay. But I wonder what Mrs. Hopkins and her daughter-in-law will do about the company. Suppose she decides to close shop. I'm afraid there isn't very much we can do about it one way or the other. The only thing I know is there's still work to do. Even if the plant is closed for a few days, I've got billings to get out, orders to be filled. If not, Mrs. Hopkins will find that her son left her a liability instead of an asset. It was a lovely funeral. Don't you think so, Edgar? Yes, Mrs. Hopkins, I do. Now, you're probably wondering why I asked you to see me so soon after Junior's burial and what plans Junior's wife and I have for the company. Yes, ma'am, I am. Well, Edgar, you and everyone else at the plant can put away your worries. My daughter-in-law and I have decided to keep the plant open and to continue making Hopkins quality shoes. Everybody's certainly going to be relieved to know that, ma'am. But that does not solve all our problems. We're going to need someone to run the company. At first, we considered Mr. Penny. While he may be a very competent plant manager, we found he's had no experience at all in business administration. On the other hand, we know about your business experience. And that, coupled with your loyalty and length of service, convinced us that you're the man we want. You mean head the entire company? Yes, Edgar. To be in complete charge. 
with no one to answer to except my daughter-in-law and me. Yes, Edgar? Frida, would you come in for a moment, please? Certainly. Close the door, Frida, and sit down. Yes, Edgar. Frida, I've given you three weeks to adjust to the fact that I'm no longer an office flunky, that I am now the boss, and that you are my secretary. I wasn't aware that I'd overlooked that fact. Oh, but you have. You've continually made decisions without first consulting me. Also, I found a number of letters that you've written that were not dictated or authorized by me. Junior never objected to me handling little details like that on my own. I am not Junior. And in the future, you will not measure me by his standards. Something else I don't understand is your salary. It's almost $100 over what the position pays. I guess Junior must have liked what I was doing, Edgar. That's another thing. The way you call me Edgar sounds as if you're addressing one of the office help instead of your superior. In the future, you will call me Mr. Bolton. Yes, sir. I'll remember that, Mr. Bolton. And when I get to my desk, I'll call the haberdasher. Haberdasher? What for? To order a size larger hat for you. Just uh, one moment, Frida. I told you before, I do not appreciate your sense of humor. I'll remember that, too, Mr. Bolton. In view of your service with the company, I dislike having to fire you, Frida. I know how inconvenient it would be for you. I'm sure you do, Mr. Bolton. I'm sure you know better than anyone what it means to be fired. What exactly do you mean by that? Simply that you'd naturally know what it would be like to be discharged after that little talk you had with Junior here in his office the day he was killed. Uh, Close the door, Frida. Come back here and sit down. What do you know about my talk with Junior? Maybe first you'd better make sure that the key on the intercom is closed, Mr. Bolton. It's closed. It wasn't closed that last day you spoke to Junior. You mean you heard what he said? About firing you? Mm Mm-hmm. I heard what he said and what you said. I know it isn't nice to eavesdrop. But sometimes a girl needs a little insurance for her future. Nobody would believe he fired me. It would only be your word against mine. Correction, Mr. Bolton. It would be your word against mine and his. What do you mean? Like poor Richard of Watergate fame, Junior liked to have his conversations, telephone and otherwise, on tape. And you have the tape? Yes. Where? In a safe place. And you know that sense of humor of mine? The one you don't approve of? It almost got the best of me that day the police came here looking for motives. I just about cracked up when, with a straight face, you said you didn't have a motive. And all the while, you had the best reason of anyone for killing Junior. But I didn't kill him. Didn't you, Edgar? Didn't you go to the Hopkins place that night and plead with Junior not to fire you? Beg? Wasn't that the word you used? Did you offer to do anything, even sweep floors, if only he'd keep you on the payroll? How do you know all those things? You weren't there. Wasn't I, Edgar? Did you bother to go up the stairs? You might have been quite surprised if you had gone up and looked in the master bedroom. You were there? Uh Uh-huh. Waiting for Junior. In the same house that... that he shared with his wife? Don't look so shocked, Edgar. Are you trying to tell me that you and Junior... Didn't you think I was his type? Junior thought it might be better if I deglamorized myself for the office. I've been thinking that the same idea might uh, appeal to you. Me? Well, you can't possibly mean that you and I did... Are going to share a very cozy relationship? Of course we are, Edgar, darling. You see, I've discovered that a girl like me, all alone in the world, can never carry too much insurance. So the furrows with sin and reap the devil's harvest. Yes, it is written that no man or woman can break the commandments and hope to escape retribution. Edgar Bolton had killed a man accidentally or not. 
He had compounded his act of murder by trying to cover his tracks and refusing to accept his part in the killing. Here is Edgar now, standing at the door to Frida Hale's apartment. At her invitation, he is visiting her for the first time. Well, good evening, Edgar. Frida? Is it really you? Uh, who else? Come in. Well, I, I never saw you look like this before. Your hair down, falling over your shoulders. And you're not wearing your glasses. But I am wearing a very attractive gown. You don't approve, Edgar? Uh, oh, but I do. It's just that... Well, I can't believe it. You're actually beautiful. Well, thank you, Edgar. I guess that proves the wisdom of the old saying about never judging the contents of a package by its wrapping. <laughs> Just as you proved that you weren't the meek little man you appeared to be for so long. Let's go into the living room where we can sit down and talk. Now, you sit right there on the divan, Edgar, and I'll mix a couple of drinks. Oh, uh, thanks, but I don't really drink. But you're a big executive now, darling. Head of a major shoe company? Drinking is one of the requisites of a job like that. How about a scotch and soda? Oh, all right, but very little scotch. You asked me to come here, Frida, because you said you wanted to talk. That's right. What did you want to talk about? Well, for one thing, I received a notice in this morning's mail. My rent is being raised $75 a month. Mm, that's a pretty stiff hike. I'm so glad you agree. Your drink, Edgar. Thank you. First, a toast. Here's to a lot of nice things happening for you and me. Oh, I'll drink to that. Drink isn't too strong, is it, Edgar? <sighs> no, just right. Good. Now back to the rent problem. I can't possibly afford to pay $75 a month more. Unless, of course... My boss was to give me a raise. Oh, impossible, Frida. I told you the other day, your salary already is way out of proportion to everyone else's. The payroll wouldn't stand it. It would if you let someone go. In the shop, for example, with that new stitching machine that's being installed, we won't need all the help we have now. You could very easily eliminate one or two of those jobs, if you really wanted to. For one, you could let Henny Frickin go. But Henny Ficken's been with the firm for almost 20 years. I couldn't do a thing like that, Frida. Move over, darling. Let me sit next to you on the divan. Then we won't have to shout. Now, about that raise... I can't okay it, Frida. But it's for your benefit as much as mine. Well, how do you figure that out? You're going to be spending almost as much time here as I will. Same as Junior used to do. Oh, no, 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 no. You've got the wrong man. I'm not getting involved in anything like that. Oh, you disappoint me, Edgar. From the way you've been staring at me, I thought you'd want to. It's just that I'm not used to being alone like this with a woman wearing a tight-fitting dress with a décolletage like that. Doesn't your wife ever wear sexy-looking gowns or negligees? Helen, good heavens, no. What a pity. No wonder you're never in a hurry to get home. I can see where I'm going to have to take you in hand, darling, and give you an education. Oh, no, no. I, I happen to love my wife. Edgar, my sweet, no man who loves his wife stays half the night at the office when he doesn't have to. But in my case... Suppose it... you stop trying to fool your secretary and give me your empty glass. You need a refill. But I feel kind of woozy. I... I haven't had more than one drink since I don't know when. It does a person good to let go once in a while. It helps get rid of all your inhibitions. For instance, I'll bet right now you'd even have courage enough to put your arms around me. You'd like to put your arms around me, wouldn't you, darling? Yes, I would, but... but go right but... ahead. I won't stop you. There. Mm -hmm. Isn't that better? When you don't suppress your desires? I, I never had any idea a woman as young as you could be even interested in a man my age. Oh, age makes no difference, Edgar. Especially not when a man is as important as you've become. When he can guarantee a woman's security. Security? Now that we've discovered each other, darling, you certainly don't think I'm going to let you go. But... 
Well, what about Helen? We can decide what to do with her later. Do with her? I don't know what you mean. Oh, it isn't important right now. We have far more interesting things to do. For instance? Let me get you another drink. Then we'll talk about them. No, no, no more to drink. I, if I have any more, I'll have to spend the rest of the night here. <laughs> that, my dear one, might prove a lot more interesting than you think. Is something troubling you, Edgar? Troubling me? What makes you ask that? Oh, you seem so preoccupied. You've hardly touched your dinner. I guess I'm just not hungry. That's more than that, Edgar. You haven't been yourself for a long time. Imagination. No, it isn't just imagination. It's that job you have. It's too much for you. Ever since young Mr. Hopkins was killed and Mrs. Hopkins put you in charge, you've been like a stranger. Please, Helen, don't nag. I have problems enough at the office without being bugged when I get home. I knew it. It's that job. And and that woman you have as your secretary isn't helping any. Frida? What's wrong with her? Everything. When young Mr. Hopkins was alive, she was always so sweet and courteous. But now, when I call and try to get through to you, you'd think I was an interloper or trying to collect money. Half the time, she won't even let me talk to you. She simply says you're busy and hangs up. And when she calls to tell me you'll be working late or that you have to make an unexpected trip out of town, why, well, she sounds as if she actually enjoys letting me know you won't be home. Oh, that's a lot of nonsense, Helen. You keep talking like that, and I'll start to wonder if you aren't the one who's changed. Why, in the 32 years we've been married... Ah, I... you see, you don't even remember how long we've been married. It happens to be 33 years. All right, in the 33 years we've been married, I've never known you to be jealous before. Uh, well, I'm not jealous. Okay, suspicious. Not suspicious either. I just don't like that woman. I don't trust her. I think you should get rid of her as quickly as possible. Fire her. Fire Frida? Yes. I think she's an evil influence. And I also think she knows a great deal more about Junior's death than she's letting on. <laughs> Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of Accidentally on Purpose. That woman! How dare she say that I'm an evil influence, or dare to accuse me of having anything to do with Junior's death? Now, you can't entirely blame Helen, Frida. Why can't I? Well, you told me yourself you've had several brushes with her on the telephone. That doesn't give her the right to say I'm an evil influence. Oh. I wonder what she'd say if she knew her darling husband killed Junior. Stop saying that. You make it sound as if it were intentional. You know I never meant to kill him. Now, come here. Come on. Sit down beside me on the divan. No, Edgar. I'm not in the mood. And I just can't stand that woman. Well, that sort of makes things even. She says she can't stand you either. And I suppose that gives you the feeling of a superior male, having two women fighting over you. Oh, not really. It makes me a little afraid. In fact, just the thought of it makes me want a drink. Can I get you one, too? No. I'll go to the bar with you and get my own. You know, it's funny. What is? Six months ago, when I first came here to your apartment, I wasn't a drinking man. One scotch and soda was my capacity. Now I can have three or four and think nothing of it. The influence of an evil woman? Oh, forget that, Frida. I only told you those things so you'd know how Helen feels, so you'd know better how to handle her. There's only one way to handle her. Get rid of her. Get rid of her? How? Divorce her. <gasps> divorce Helen? You must be joking. She'd never consent to a divorce. Her religion wouldn't permit it, and she'd never go against that. She's too devout. I've told you that. She's also dangerous, and she's standing in our way. Not really dangerous, Frida. She'd never do anything drastic. And as far as standing in our way, she hasn't stopped me from doing what I want to do so far. Did it ever occur to you that I might not be completely satisfied with our little arrangement? But I've done everything you asked. Given you everything I can, including a couple of very sizable raises. What more could you possibly want? I want to be Mrs. Edgar Bolton. That's what. I want to be the wife of the head of the Hopkins Quality Shoe Company. I want a big house, and I want to sleep in that big bed you say you share with her. I want it to be our bed. 
I want you to divorce her. I can't do that, Frida. I just told you, Helen would never give me a divorce. Then it's up to you to find a way to make her do it. How can I possibly do that? Helen has never so much as looked twice at another man before or since we've been married. I'm sorry, Edgar, darling, but you've got to find a way to get rid of her. Before I get desperate enough or frustrated enough to unseal that tape and play it for the district attorney... Oh, now, you wouldn't. You couldn't do such a thing to me, Frida. There's one way to make sure, darling. Get rid of Helen and marry me. A wife can't testify against her husband. Ah, uh, but you'd still have the tape. Only as Mrs. Edgar Bolton, it would hurt me as much as you. So on our wedding night, darling, I'll give you the tape with all my love. Frida left me with little choice. I had to find a way to get rid of Helen so I could marry Frida. It was the only way I could get hold of that incriminating tape and shut the door permanently on my part in the death of Peter Hopkins, Jr., so at the first opportunity, I talked to Helen. Using a couple of our friends as examples, I broached the subject of divorce. It didn't take long for me to see that it was an impossible subject to even discuss with her. It was an absolute taboo as far as she was concerned. Next, I suggested that she take a prolonged trip. I hoped that if she got away and stayed away long enough, it might convince her that life could be a lot better for her without me around. Of course, I hopefully fantasized that she might find someone else to take my place. I offered to make all arrangements for her to travel to Europe, to the Orient, South America, go any place she wanted and stay as long as she cared to. But her answer was no. And all the while, Frida kept up the pressure on me, and she had very potent weapons. Aside from the tape with my voice and Junior's voice on it, Frida, it must be remembered, was years younger far prettier and definitely not the frigid woman Helen had become. I never really admitted it, but I was in love with Frida. As she had promised that first night in her apartment, she had educated me to a new kind of life, a new kind of love, far more exciting and satisfying than I had ever known. One thing was certain. I could very easily live without Helen. But now that I had come to really know Frida, I would not care to exist without her. I weighed my problem from every angle. I exhausted every possible means of dissolving my marriage to Helen so I'd be free to make Frida my wife. Perhaps if I had not killed Junior, murder might never have entered my mind. But the knowledge that I had killed once made the thought of killing again not nearly so improbable. But this time I would make certain that no one knew. I would make sure there were no tapes, no open intercom keys, no evidence of any kind. To our friends, our relatives, and even to our two daughters, Helen and I were perfectly compatible. Everyone considered ours the ideal marriage, and for 33 years it had been. No one would ever begin to guess that I might have any reason to kill her. The only person who would know I even had a motive was Frida, and I had no intention of letting her know what I planned to do. If later on she learned the truth about what I'd done, it would be too late. By then, Frida would be my wife. It took several weeks for me to formulate my plan and work up courage enough to carry it out. And don't ever let anyone tell you it doesn't take courage to kill the woman with whom you've lived for 33 years. The night I chose to carry out my plan, I worked late at the office. I let the night watchman know I was there, but kept the door locked. At 11 p.m., I left the office and slipped out through the back door, making sure the watchman did not see me leave. I tried not to think about what I was going to do. But the thought was there every moment. I didn't go to Frida's apartment. Not that night. I didn't want to see Frida again until after Helen was buried. I felt it would be better that way. My plan, of course, was to return to the office after the deed was done, slip back inside without being seen, and then let the watchman know I was there. Make him think I'd been there all the while. Perfect alibi. 
My main concern was that at the last moment I might lose my nerve. The only way I could be sure of avoiding that was to keep remembering that tape Frida had. To keep telling myself that I would never be safe until I could get hold of the tape and destroy it. It was well past eleven o'clock and pouring rain when I got to the two-story stucco house that Helen and I had lived in together for most of our married life. Helen always retired early, so I knew she'd be in bed and fast asleep. I let myself in through the side door. When I got inside, I didn't turn on the lights, but kept the house in total darkness. I took off my shoes and left them just inside the side door where I could grab them on my way out. Then I went to the staircase. I paused a moment to steady my jumpy nerves. Then I climbed the stairs slowly. When I got to the top, I could see the door to our bedroom was open. I dared not hesitate or even stop to think I might lose my nerve. I went directly into the bedroom and halted beside the bed. I could see Helen's sleeping figure lying there in the darkness. I picked up a pillow, got a good grip on each end of it. Then I brought it down over her face and held it there. turned and staggered out of the room. I had just started down the stairs, my heart pounding, my body drenched with perspiration, when all at once the landing and the hallway below became a blaze of light. Edgar! But, Helen, where in God's name did you come from? Well, the rain changed my plans. Uh, plans? What are you talking about? Didn't that woman tell you? Woman? What woman? Frida, didn't she tell you about me going away? Going where? I decided to take your advice and take a short vacation. I made arrangements to fly to Chicago and spend a couple of weeks with Lois and her family and then go on to Wisconsin and visit Sally at college. And what happened? I told you, because of the storm, all flights were canceled, so I decided to come home and wait until tomorrow to leave. Then how could you be in bed? Me in bed? Whatever you talking about, Edgar? How could I be in bed? I just came from the airport. Well, then who... who... Edgar? Where are you going? Edgar, what's gotten into you? What's in the bedroom? I... No, no, don't switch on the light. Of course I'm going to switch on the light. I can't see a thing in this darkness. Oh, my God. On the bed. It, it's her. Frida. She couldn't have known about the storm. And she thought you were gone. She must have come here before the rain started to surprise me when I came home. She said she wanted to take your place in our big bed. And that's exactly what she did. And you thought it was me lying there. You thought it was me you killed. Oh, Edgar! <laughs> Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Accidentally on Purpose, was written by Martin Ryerson and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Vic Perrin and Kim Hamilton. Featured in the cast were Gene Howell and Byron Kane. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.
Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Cicely Tyson. At the same time tomorrow, we'll bring you my kind of story, a new play about the problems of people in love. This is Vincent Price. The R.L. Senius Memorial Hospital is in the West Village area. The huge rambling structure has been here for so long that most people have forgotten who R.L. Senius was. Although research will show that R.L. Senius was the brother-in-law of one of the old-time city bosses. This hospital holds a special place in the hearts of Gary Green and Dale Klosky. They met here. At the time, Gary was a struggling actor who lived in a dirty closet of a room in the old part of the village. He woke up in the middle of the night because a huge cockroach was stuck in his ear. Always a bit of a hypochondriac, Gary panicked and raced to the R.L. Senior's Memorial Hospital. Quivering, he clung to a pretty young nurse who was on emergency duty. She persuaded an intern friend of hers to remove the bug immediately, and Gary was out of his misery. As Gary was recovering, he asked the nurse to join him for a cup of coffee when she got off duty. It was very late, and she was tired, but there was a helplessness and desperation about the young man which touched her. She accepted his invitation. Then she smiled shyly and told him that her name was Dale Klosky. As the two young people left the hospital, dawn was on its way and the air was fresh and cold. It seemed like a nice beginning to a relationship. But Dale could not begin to guess what a treacherous and frightening path this romance would take. But then again, this is only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Best Role of His Life, by Patricia Joyce. Our stars, Joan McCall, Robert Towers, and Miss Joyce as Karen. The romance developed quickly between Gary and Dale. For him, she was a sweet, patient angel who would stand by him no matter how cruelly his talents as an actor were rejected. Dale had become a nurse because she liked to care for people and feel needed. For her... Gary was a person who had personal and career problems, who only needed a little patience and understanding to be healthy and well-adjusted. She felt needed because she knew that she could give that patience and understanding. They had exchanged spare keys to each other's apartments and were just beginning to feel comfortable with each other when trouble began. Dale brought some groceries over to Gary's to cook dinner. There on the kitchen counter, she saw a woman's compact and lipstick. What's this? Hmm? This lipstick. Oh, who's that? Uh, that's some makeup I needed for an audition. Oh, yeah? yeah they wanted you to have a, a red birthmark. Gary, don't lie to me. I'm not lying. Well, if you're seeing another girl, I'd rather know. But you'll get upset. Well, probably, sure. I mean... We're just beginning to feel close, and I don't want to mess things up. That's just it. You'd mess things up. Mm, not necessarily. Just remember, if I'm doing anything, it serves you right after that intern. What? The guy who pulled the cockroach out of my ear. Don? <laughs> what about him? 
Don't you think I know what's going on with you two? Oh, that's silly. Nothing's even remotely going hey, on. Hey, I don't like being lied to either. I'm not lying. You know I have a call back for an important Broadway play tonight, and I don't need an argument right now. Okay, let's drop it. Sure, because you don't want to admit that you're seeing somebody else. Jerry, this is crazy. It's crazy that you're being so selfish when I'm under pressure. You know, you couldn't have picked a worse time to start worrying about that lipstick. Well, what did you expect me to do? Why don't you just go home and leave me alone for a while? Oh, come on. Let's let's just stop arguing and have dinner. I mean it. Leave me alone. All right. If that's what you want, I'll leave the groceries. Take the groceries. Leave my key. Okay. So goodbye then, huh? Go on. Get going. Okay. Oh, hi. How you doing, Karen? Tired. I had ten zillion kids for polio vaccines today. My saintly nurse's halo was definitely slipping by the end of the afternoon. Are you all right? Oh, Gary and I had a fight. A bad fight? Weird. Want to talk? No, you're too tired. Anything you say is going to be more interesting than watching those kids put packs on each other's chairs. Okay, <laughs> come on in. You want some supper? I have groceries for two. Yeah, I'd like to try out this uh, new recipe for chicken. Okay. Uh, what'd you fight about? Well, I found the lipstick at his place and I got upset. What's so weird about that? I walked around a lot after I left Gary's. I, I was trying to figure out why we started fighting and, well, I realized that he put the lipstick out so I would, so I would find it. Really? Yeah. It was sitting out right where I always put the groceries. I had to pick it up and move it before I could put the bag down. Then he wanted you to start an argument. Yeah, I think so. He accused me of seeing Don, you know, the intern? Yeah, sure. That's really strange. I can't imagine anyone being jealous of Don. He's a nice guy, but kind of unattractive and milk toasty. I don't know. The trouble is, Gary and I were just starting to be really close. Maybe that's it. What? Oh, you're starting to feel close. He's a messed up, struggling actor. I don't mean to offend you, but he strikes me as kind of a messed up person. Well, a little on the surface, but deep down, he's adorable. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Anyway, he does have his problems, and he's probably afraid of making a commitment. You're probably right. It wouldn't be the only time in the world that's happened. If only I could make him see that I don't care if he has problems. I'd look out for him. He may know that and be... Too proud to really... Oh, just a minute. Who is it? It's me. Oh, hey. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, too. Oh, that's okay. I just came to tell you that I'm sorry, Dale. I knew I couldn't face going to that audition tonight if I didn't try to straighten things out with you. Well, I know you're under pressure and tense. So, I hope you'll still see me? Sure. Good. Okay, now. Well, I'll go now and you can go back to your visiting. Hey, look, um, why don't you guys talk and, and have Dale's supper and all? Well, uh, there's r enough for three. Oh, that's okay. I'll just run down to the corner, get a falafel. You sure you don't mind? Oh, I'm sure. See ya. Hey, come here. I'm so sorry we fought. <laughs> only the first of many such scenes, and also the gentlest. There was a pattern to them. Every time Gary and Dale were feeling close and happy, they argued. Usually the quarrel began with Gary leaving clues that he had other women friends. He always left them in places where Dale was sure to find them. Sometimes the fight started because he accused her of seeing other men, which wasn't the case. Dale was docile and devoted. There was something self-destructive about the way Gary picked these fights. It was as though he couldn't really allow himself to be happy. Finally, the constant arguing became a trial even for Dale's patience.
But you like him, don't you? Don't you? I think he's a nice guy, Gary. Ah, that figures. You know the agency recommended him over me for that new play. Well, maybe Marty's more right for the part. But he isn't. Even my own girl can't see that. I wonder what I'm doing in this business. See, I haven't even read the play. What do I know? And I've only met Marty twice. Mm, that's a laugh. I thought Marty was your friend. Well, that never stopped you before. Please, Gary, let's not start this again. Start what? Gary, I'm not having any more of these fights. I'm just not going to do it. Now, now just go on home and don't come back here until you cool off. You can't turn me out of here. I mean it. Don't do that. I have an important audition in a couple of days, and I'm nervous about it. No, I, I just want you to leave. Please, don't ask me to go. Please. Go on. You're just trying to get rid of me, so Marty can come over. Well, you know what I think of that. This is what I think. Ah! You broke my China Shakespeare mug. Oh, get away from me. God, Gary, what do you think you're doing? I Get away from me. Ah! Oh, what? what? No, you're going to choke me. Ah! Gary, what the hell do you think you're doing? Uh. Hey, I was, you know, just... Gary, you coward! Dale, what'd he do? Are you okay? I don't ever want to see him again. I should hope not. Are you okay? Uh, I bet I'll bruise. Oh, poor Rainbow. Poor little kitty. Don't worry, kitty. It's going to be okay. I promise. Poor Rainbow. This is only the second day I've had her. She probably thinks she moved into a madhouse. <laughs> hey, Gary, here's a terrific review. Yeah, what's it say, Tony? Well, it says, probably the most exciting thing about the play is the introduction of unknown actor Gary Green as the killer Robert Silkington. Hey. hey. Green handles his role with the finesse that we only expect from a much more experienced actor. He grimly exposes the jealousy and self-hate that would cause his character to murder his younger brother, Tom. The skill with which he torments and tortures his innocent victim is frightening to behold. Oh, oh, oh. oh hey, Gary, now wait a minute. Here's a quote we can use in the ad. Listen, this is easily the best performance of a psychotic killer to be played on the Broadway stage in recent years. Who would have thought? Well, I knew you had it in you. Yeah, well, it's a good part. Probably the best role I'll ever have. We'll see about that. It's my job to get you other good mm. parts. You think that broad will take me back? Broad? You know, Dale, the nurse, the broad who thought she was hot stuff and threw me out. Well, that term broad really annoys me. As far as I'm concerned, broad is the kindest word for them. A dirty, slimy canine. Now, wait, wait, wait. I'm married with three kids. One of them happens to be my best friend. <laughs> well, that's your problem. Anyway, I think that Dale is a very nice girl. If you really like her, call her up. A good, steady woman might settle you down a bit. Who's there? It's Gary. It's really late, Gary. Um, I have early shift tomorrow. Can I call you when I'm off? I need to talk to you now. Please? I really don't want to see you. I've changed. Oh? Really? Didn't you see that I'm the lead in the hit show? Yes, I did. Congratulations. I saw it twice already. You're great. <laughs> I was going to send you some flowers or something, but I didn't want you to think... Yeah, that you wanted me back. Right. But things will be different. I've calmed down a lot. I feel less anxious. Mm -hmm. Ask Tony Berger, my manager. No, I'll take your word for it. Can I come in and I'll tell you about it? No, I still don't think that's a good idea. Come on, Dale. I promise I'll never hurt you again. I don't know. Please. Let me think it over. I, I want you to be my friend again. I, I don't have any real friends. That's silly. It's true. Other guys have friends, even if their careers aren't as good as mine. But I feel like I don't have anybody. Can you understand that? Yes. I want to change, but I can't unless I have a chance. Please. I don't know. I'll stay right here until you say I can come in. Okay. I guess it's silly to make such a big deal about it, huh? Right. Thanks.
A month or so after Dale and Gary became involved again, Karen came home from the hospital and heard Dale crying. She went into Dale's apartment and saw her sitting on the couch, clutching her kitten, Rainbow. When Dale started to talk, Karen noticed that one of her front teeth was chipped. Karen knew right away that they had had another fight. You want me to take you to the dentist? No, it's not that bad. I'll be okay. Did he hurt you anywhere else? No, not really. Why do you even put up with it? I don't know. I really can't figure you out. I can't either. I mean, there's lots of reasons why I went back with Gary, I guess. He's pretty famous now, and he gets asked to parties. Tourists come up to us in restaurants and tell him how good he is in the play. It's not worth getting beat up over. Tell me about it. I really hate that guy. Oh, Karen, the only reason he does these terrible things is it's because he's hurting. Everybody's got an excuse. It's because he never had any real friends. He was kind of an outcast as a kid. It hurt his feelings a lot, and he got to thinking that he isn't worthy of love. He isn't doing much to earn it. Well, I'm in a double bind because he seems to think there's something wrong with anybody who would love him, including me. Uh Uh-huh. I just wish I could reach him. I don't know, Dale. Just because you're smart enough to understand why he acts the way he does doesn't mean you should excuse his behavior. I suppose not. As far as I can see, you're just as much to blame as he is. After all, you took him back in the first place. Well, come on, Karen. I thought he'd changed. I thought success would mellow him out, really. And what do you think now? Well, I think the bottom line is that we still love each other. Since when is love abusive? Well, maybe it isn't the easiest romance I've ever had, but it's the most exciting. But that excitement could be because Gary's so darn crazy you never know what he's going to do next. It may not have anything to do with love. Well, I told him I wasn't going to see him anymore, so you you don't have to get so worked up about it. I think this is where I came in last time. I mean it. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be hard, but I'm just... I'll just have to be strong. Oh, come in for a while, Karen. It's still early. Boy, that was a terrific restaurant. You think so? Yeah. How'd you hear about it? It was Gary's favorite. Oh, great. You still hear from him? He called a couple of times. Then I saw something in the Daily News about him and that dress designer, Jill Myerson. But later it said they broke up. Oh, brother. If the public only knew the truth. (laughs) If the public knew the real truth, they'd like that even better. Probably. One problem with Chinese restaurants... No dessert. I have some frozen yogurt in the freezer. I'll get it. You want any? Maybe a little. (gasps) Dale! Dale, it's it's your kitten. It's your little kitten. What is it? Poor scared little little thing. How the hell did it get in there? Oh, give it to me. It's okay, Rainbow. Oh, poor kitty. Poor little kitty. How'd your cat get into the freezer? You think she's okay? I hope so. Oh, she's shaking. Why don't you wrap her up in a blanket and hold her against you? That should warm her up. Okay. I'll get some more milk for her. Good idea. (sighs) Doesn't she look all cozy wrapped up like this? How, How do you suppose she got into the freezer? I'm not sure. That's so weird. I have the scariest thought. What? Well, you know that play Gary's in? Uh Uh-huh. That's one of the things his character does. How do you mean? Well, the part Gary plays is the part of this real sicko. Yeah, I know. Everybody's talking about it. He torments his younger brother and then kills him. And one of the first things he does is he kills his brother's dog by freezing it to death. You're kidding. No, isn't that disgusting? You think Gary did this to Rainbow just to get at you? Well, he still has the keys to my apartment. You'd better get the lock changed. I don't know if he'd really do anything that mean. But we can't swear that he wouldn't. Oh, darn. You'd think they'd keep the stupid hall light lit. 
Okay, where's that key? Oh, darn. I gotta move. This place is getting to be a real dive. Ah, here. or something. I'll get my flashlight. I sure wish they'd keep the lights working in this dump. Hey, it's three o'clock in the morning. Will you keep it down? I'm sorry. No. There was a... I brought an extra light bulb. And believe me, I'm going to deduct the extra 46 cents from my rent. Can you shine the flashlight over here? I lost my keys. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what is it? I think there's a rat tied to my doorknob. Ooh, flash the light on it. If you don't shut up, I'm going to call the police. Don't bother. We're going to call the police ourselves. That must be them. Who is it? It's the police. Hi. Uh, are you Karen Sabasinski? Yes. I'm Officer Isabel Martinez. Uh, may I come in? Please do. How do you do? I'm Dale Klosky. My partner's taking care of the rat. Poor thing is just hanging there, tied by its tail. The poor thing probably carries a number of diseases. All right. Sorry. Uh, you're the one who said that someone you knew was harassing you. Yes. Uh, see, I broke off with my boyfriend because he was too violent. Physically violent? Yes. He chipped my tooth. You see? I see. Uh, did you ever report any of his actions to the police? No. Were you ever hospitalized because of his violence? No. Then what makes you think he's harassing you now? Well, he, he was really upset when we broke off, and uh, he wanted to come back, but I said no, and he said I'd be sorry. You know, all that stuff. Uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, I found my kitten in the freezer. <laughs> you found a kitten in the freezer? Oh, I forgot to explain. My ex-boyfriend is Gary Green, and he's playing the lead in a Broadway play. Do you know about him? No, I can't afford Broadway prices. Well, he plays this crazy guy who torments somebody, and he's doing the same things to me that he does to his victim in the play. In the play, Gary's character ends up killing his victim. We aren't sure how far he'll carry out his game with Dale. I'd like to get some sort of restraining order. I don't think you can do that unless you have some documented proof that he had hurt you in the past or that he is the person who is harassing you now. But it has to be him. It's all the same stuff he does in the play. Gary is pretty messed up. There's one thing I can do, and that's talk to him. Do you think that'll help? Well, a visit from me just might make him settle down. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, where can I reach him? He just got a better apartment, so uh, you should probably try to reach him through his manager, Tony Berger. What about Dale, officer? Someone's being harassing her. You're kidding. Was she hurt? No, she's just frightened. What can I do? If she wants, she can use my apartment. I have an extra bedroom and bath. No, that's not the problem. Miss Klosky thinks that you are the person who's harassing her. Oh, my God. It's terrible. What a lot of nerve. Hey, hey Tony, can I sue her for libel? Well, is Dale Klosky making a formal accusation? No, 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 not at all. I don't think the problem is that serious. Well, then why are you here, Officer Martinez? To Martin? clear this up. If Mr. Green is harassing Miss Klosky, he should stop immediately and then... Well, you don't understand. I wouldn't hurt Dale. I, I've never even thought of harassing her. She claims that the scare tactics you used on her are the same as the scare tactics your character uses in a certain Broadway play. She does? Oh, that's great. Thousands of people have seen that play. Any one of them could have followed that particular plot line. But why would they victimize Miss Klosky? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. It's common knowledge that she was going with me. Everybody she worked with knew about us. And then there was that picture of the two of you together in the Daily News. That's right. I forgot about that. I'll bet a million people read that paper. Any one of them could know enough about the play and myself and Dale to cause us a lot of problems. Ask her to use my spare room, Officer Martinez. I'd feel a lot better if I could look out for her. Miss Klosky said that she ended your relationship because of your violent behavior. Yes, that's true. I see. It's something I deeply regret. I'm sure. It's easy to sit there and pass judgment on me. Decide I'm a violent, no-good idiot. And I suppose I do have my share of personal problems, but 
I refuse to be intimidated because Dale points an accusing finger at me. I did hit her. I'm not proud of it. When I knew Dale, I was going through a very painful time. You've heard of starving actors? Well, I was shoplifting packages of Jell-O and living off that because I didn't have money for food. I got a job demonstrating vacuum cleaners in department stores. I was paid below minimum wage, but I took the job because they said they'd let me out for auditions. I was fired after one week because I left early for an interview. They refused to pay me for the work I'd already done. Oh, it was really devastating. And Dale was around through all this. She didn't know quite how bad things were for me. I was angry at the world, and I took it out on her. Is that an excuse? Well, I know that I can't use the pain I was in to excuse my actions. Then why are you telling me all this? Because the situation that caused me to be rough with her and myself and everything else is gone now. I'm making a comfortable living. I, I, I feel a lot better about my life. Mm, I can understand that. Now, if she's worried, I'd be glad to have her here. Or, or if she wants to move to a safer building, I, I'd be glad to help her financially. That probably won't be necessary. But I will tell her you're concerned and willing to help. Thank you, Officer Martinez. Yes, thank you, Officer. Uh, by the way, Miss Martinez, I did have Dale's apartment key. I was saving it as a keepsake, but she'd probably be more comfortable if I returned it. Under the circumstances. I believe she's already changed the lock. She did? Yes. Then may I keep this key? I don't see why not. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of the best role of his life. Hello? It wouldn't be Dale Klosky I'm talking to now, would it? This is she. Uh, who are you? I'm a friend of a friend. It's a little late to be calling, isn't it? Oh, I have an important message and it won't keep. Oh, tell me. It's from Robert Silkington. He said he's going to kill you. What? He's going to kill you, you filthy little... <sighs> What do you want? He's going to hold your throat so tight you can't breathe. Then he'll watch the veins in your head swell till they're fit to burst. <sighs> oh, please be home. Who is it? It's Dale. It's 2.30 in the morning. Uh, hey, are you okay? Karen, I'm so scared. What's wrong? Can I come in? Yeah, sure. Come on. Uh, I just got the weirdest call. It was from some guy who told me Robert Silkington was going to kill me. Who the hell is Robert Silkington? Oh, I keep forgetting you haven't seen it. It's, uh, Robert Silkington is the name of the character that Gary plays in his show. Oh, damn. Call the police. You think I should? Yes, right now. You dial, and I'll listen on the bedroom phone. <sighs> Department. Hello. My name is Dale Klosky. Yes. Um, uh, I made a complaint. Um, my ex-boyfriend has been harassing me. I spoke to, uh, um, Isabel Martinez. Is she there? No, I'm sorry. She's gone for the night. Uh, would you like me to check your file? Oh, yes, please. Oh. Yes, Miss Klosky. I have Officer Martinez's report. Uh, you spoke to her about a Mr. Gary Green on the night of the 25th. Mm. Um, at your request, Officer Martinez spoke to Mr. Green on the afternoon of the 28th. His, his manager was also present. Oh, she already talked to him. Uh, yes. Uh, Officer Martinez felt that Mr. Green was in no way involved with the harassment. Uh, he seemed concerned and offered to return the key to your apartment. Uh, she declined the key on your behalf since you had already informed her that the lock was changed. Apparently, you have nothing to worry about. Well, somebody just called me with a a death threat. Did you recognize the person's voice? Well, it was an Irish voice, but uh, it could have been my boyfriend doing an accent. He's an actor, and he's really good Ms. at... Miss Klosky. Yes? 
Officer Martinez also wrote that the person harassing you is likely to be a prankster who has decided to annoy you. But if you think there is still a reason to be concerned, I'd be glad to send someone over to talk to you again. Otherwise, un unless someone's caught attacking you... No, no, I, I guess that's okay. I'll call again if I need anything. Bye. That bit about the key was ridiculous. Gary must have known you changed the lock. How can you be so darn sweet and polite? I don't know. You still think it's Gary harassing you? Yeah. Me too. Well, I don't know what to do about it. Dale, what if you get hurt? If I understand it, they have to catch him beating me up. I'm calling his manager. What's his name? Tony Berger. Hand me the phone book, okay? Hey, why are you doing that? I want to find out how he charmed Officer Martinez into thinking he was such an innocent. Are we calling a little late? Who cares? Hello? Is this Tony Berger? Speaking. My name is Karen Sabasinski. I'm Dale Klosky's friend. I'm sorry to call so late, but Dale just got a death threat from someone called Robert Silkington. Oh, God, I was afraid of that. We have to talk. Good. Can you and Dale meet me for breakfast? But I know Gary Green, and the Gary Green I know was not the Gary Green who put on a performance for Isabel Martinez. Now, she's a tough lady, but he charmed her. The guy's a consummate actor. He played the role to the hilt. I think he was acting the part of the Irishman who delivered that message. Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Another thing about Gary, I know how much he hates and fears people, especially women. There wasn't a trace of that attitude when he talked to the police officer. I knew something was wrong. I knew he was covering up something. But I was hoping he'd lay off once Martinez talked to him. Then you agree that Gary could be tormenting Dale? Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, Gary has been getting really close to this character of Robert Silkington. The character has the same fears that Gary does. One thing that's been gnawing at me ever since Officer Martinez's visit. What's that? Dale's personality is so much like the personality of Tom. That's the brother that Gary kills in the play? Yeah. Really? You think I'm like that? Well, yes, I do. Well, why? Well, there's an innocence about you, Dale. I noticed that just as soon as Gary introduced us, you also seemed to want to help him. Now, don't you think that the character of Tom is innocent and giving? I suppose. The strange thing is that Gary would carry Robert and Tom's relationship into his relationship with you, Dale. Well, the guy has problems. That's not news. Yes, but how do we get him to admit that he has problems? We don't. We call the police. Well, we can't prove anything. And then Gary will just charm away their suspicions. <laughs> Maybe if we just talk to him. Stop being his nurse and mother confessor, Dale. The guy needs professional help. Yes, he does. I've talked to him about it, even before I heard about him terrorizing Dale. I've known all along that Gary has emotional problems. I wanted him to go into therapy before they started interfering with his career. Well, he won't even admit that he has these crazy fears gnawing at him. <laughs> right after the play opened, he caused a terrible scene. He took a couple of swings at the stage manager. And afterwards, Gary just pretended it never even happened. I noticed something like that the time I caught him choking Dale. He was really bizarre. He acted as though nothing had been going on, and then, and then he ran away. I guess he couldn't face himself. Well, so the thing to do is to catch him on one of those violent moods and make him admit he needs psychiatric help. Well, it isn't easy, is it? I don't know. Maybe we can. We have the script. He's been following the action of the play pretty accurately. And we have the characters, Gary and me. But what if we don't second-guess Gary well enough? You really could get hurt. No, I won't. I think it's crazy to set yourself up as bait. Why don't you just get out of the city for a while? Go to your folks' house in Jersey or something. Well, how long am I supposed to stay? Yeah, that's not a bad idea, Dale. You could stay until we can persuade Gary to start handling his problems. Well, how long do you think that'll take? A month? A year? Maybe? Oh, Dale. I'm sorry. I can't live that way. Besides, I, I, I have to go to work. Gary could find me at R.L. Seniors. You could always work at a different hospital. Oh, forget it. 
Anyway, the reason I'm volunteering to be the bait, as you said, is is that I'd like to help Gary. I think he's really talented, exceptional, and, and once he gets over these weird psychological hang-ups, he can do Will you stop being such a starry-eyed altruist? In the play, Gary kills his victim. I've got my mind made up. Anybody back there? I know you're back there. Who are you? Carrie! How'd you get here? So, you went to the police. Well, yes, yeah, sure, but I guess I was mistaken. <laughs> I apologize. What do you mean, you were mistaken? Well, I thought you were, you know, harassing me. <laughs> Silly of me. Wrong tense. Not I was harassing you. I am harassing you. Oh, right. Very funny. Listen, I was just no, going to meet him. Oh, no, I think you'll stay right here. Well, I thought you weren't trying to bother me or anything. That's what I told the police officer. But it wasn't necessarily true. I have a very important message, and it won't keep. It's from Robert Silkey. Gary, why would you want to hurt me? I don't understand what I did. Gary, why would you want to hurt me? I don't understand what I did. Can we talk sensibly, please? Can we talk sensibly, please? I never did anything to you. I never did anything to you. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Come on, now let go. The door will yell. Quiet. Go, Gary. I will. I'll let you go right into the river. Right over by that pier. I can't swim very well. There are rats in there. In the water. Oh, Gary, please let me go. Please, you have to. Who says I'm that girl? I'll tell the police. I'll have them arrest you. <laughs> it's my word against yours. Throwing me in the river. It's just like your character pushing his brother in the lake. They'll have to know it was you. <laughs> no, like I said to the officer, thousands of people see that play. Oh, Gary, listen to me. I might drown. So? Oh, please. Please don't do this. I mean it. Don't. <laughs> Dale before you hurt her. Oh, I wasn't hurting Dale. You idiot. We saw what you were trying to do to her. Oh, I was so scared. Are you okay, Dale? Yeah, just shaking is all. I'm sure you're not hurt. <laughs> what is this nonsense? Nothing was going on. Don't try to get out of it, Gary. Tony and I are witnesses to your little performance. Well, that's just it. It was a performance. We were kidding around. You knew that, didn't you, Dale? You weren't kidding. I was. I'm just a good actor. What's going to happen now is that Dale will charge you with assault, and Karen and I will witness it. Oh, you can't do that. We won't prosecute if you'll go along with the restraining order saying you'll stay away from Dale. Oh, terrific. And you agree to go into intensive psychotherapy. You can't threaten me like that. Come on, come on. We're going to file a complaint right now. You really expect me to go through with this? Yes, I do. Dale? <sighs> what are you thinking? <sighs> About how quickly Gary gets ugly and violent. I really did want to help him. But his problems are much too sophisticated and complicated for me to deal with. Lucky you figured that out in time. Yeah. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Best Role of His Life, was written by Patricia Joyce and produced and directed by Livia Granito. 
Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Joan McCall, Robert Towers, and Patricia Joyce. Featured in the cast were Jerry Hausner and Marilyn Lightstone. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. And by the Singer Store, where right now you can save $150 off regular price on one of the world's easiest-to-use sewing machines. This is Cicely Tyson, inviting you to join us tomorrow at this time for another story about love, the most unpredictable of human emotions. This is Vincent Price. Hear that thunder? A storm out there somewhere. The beginning of a mood. Uneasiness. And that, what was it? Something outside trying to get in? Someone outside? The hair rises on the back of your neck. Our story has those elements. Listen. That is the sound of a movie projector. I doubt that any of us will ever forget the absolute wonder we felt when we saw our first movie, silent or talking. How strange it all was. The fixed rows of theater seats facing one direction, forward toward that large silver-white screen hanging on the front wall. And oh, how justified was the almost religious attention which we and our fellow members of the audience showered upon that silver screen when the theater went dark. Because when the theater went dark, that screen came alive. People ten feet tall talked, walked, and performed other physical feats infinitely more intriguing than our own lives. What secret magic was this that could create such absolute wonder? With maturity, and I dare say a good number of movies under our belts, we discovered the process behind movie magic. Those ten-foot giants up on the screen were images produced by the light from a motion picture projector. These images were the captured actions of people telling a story through a series of moving photographs called film. Whether we realized it or not, we enjoyed being held helpless witnesses to the sensations movies induced. Laughter, tears, anger, fear. The evening's final screening of Hollywood's latest blockbuster has just ended. The audience files out of the theater exits sharing their comments, their judgments. The ushers will clean up the theater before turning out the house lights and going home themselves. Night after night, this scene is repeated before the silent silver screen. That poor, silent screen could tell so many stories if it only had a memory. Imagine one tiny theater somewhere in the world which did possess a memory. What stories would such a theater tell? And to whom and for what reason would it speak? And that's only the beginning of our story. <laughs> Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Freeze Frame, by Bruce Martin. Our stars, Vic Perrin and Lou Horn. The stage is set for innocence to be altered or something evil to happen. Innocence and evil. They're the key elements in the story I'm about to tell you. I didn't hear about this first scene until after it happened, but it belongs up front here so you can understand how it all began. 
Imagine a rain-slicked street in West Los Angeles. The time is three minutes past midnight. A sports car makes a sharp, hazardous left-hand turn, then speeds off down the street. The car's driver is Russell Long, a 34-year-old entertainment critic for a local Los Angeles television station. I'm his editor and his friend. I'll be turning up later. Right now, Russ is in trouble, as you can hear. Oh, hell, not tonight. Do you have any idea what the speed limit is on this street? Oh, I don't know, 35. Officer, would you mind shining that flashlight someplace else? Do you have any idea how fast you were going? Uh, 40? Oh, really, man, that light's killing my eyes. Try 55. Do you consider yourself college educated? Oh, come on. Give me a break. I just had a fight with my wife. And a couple of drinks, maybe? Yeah, I had a couple. Right after the wife and I didn't kiss and make up. Look, that flashlight's really annoying. I mean, it's not like I killed anybody, you know. Recite the alphabet. Oh, I can tell you're going to top my evening. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. What's the matter? Didn't they teach you the alphabet in college? L M N O P Q R S N T U V W and X Y Z. Okay. Let's see your license and registration. The registration's in the glove compartment. I can wait. I'll send LAPD the bill for my eye examination. Oh, please. Ah, uh, here. The department has very little sympathy for drunk drivers, Mr. Long. Is that you, Russell Long? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Now, look, I, I made a bad turn back there, but I am not drunk. My wife's talking about a separation, and, and I'm a little upset. I know how that goes. Me and my old lady used to fight for days. Don't I know you from someplace? Probably the Beverly Hills Country Club. I caddy on weekends. No, 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 your face... I couldn't see it before when you were shining your flashlight in my eyes. Oh, skip it, huh? I've heard this old pal routine before. You're him. Hey, relax. I'm not writing you up for doing 55 and a 35. Well, what do you want from me? In fact, I'm not writing you up at all. You're the one, aren't you? Oh, drop it already. I'm with you. I know how nuts a guy can get when his old lady puts him in the doghouse. No, no, answer me. Do yourself a favor. Don't press your luck. Uh, listen, I, I lied. I, I'm stinking drunk. If, if you're a cop, then take me in. Who are you? What do you want? What do you want from me? Hello? Peggy, it's Jason. Oh, hi, Jason. How are you? Well, I'm fine. It's Russ I'm worried about. He hasn't called in sick or anything, but no one's seen any sign of your gifted husband. Our generalissimo station manager's been screaming for his head all morning. Russ and I are on the outs, I'm afraid. We had a very loud fight last night. A uh, regular 15-rounder, huh? Yeah. We didn't spend the night under the same roof. He hasn't called me either this morning. Well, not yet he hasn't. I'm sure he'll come home soon, surprise you with roses or something. I've had my share of surprises from Russ the past few weeks. None of them pleasant. Uh, if you're seeking a sympathetic ear... I am, Jason. Russ hasn't been his old charming self for quite a while. I suppose that's the reason he's been so quiet. You too? I thought it was just me he was ignoring. No, no, unfortunately his work falls into that same category. He's never mentioned it, not once. I was blaming a lot of our problems on Russ's pressures down at the station, but now you tell me he hasn't been working. Oh, it's not like he's retired, but his work certainly hasn't been up to par. I probably shouldn't worry you this way, but if Russ doesn't shape up, you'd be hearing about it from Herb, and that'd be worse. No, 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 please. I, I want to know what's going on. His reviews, even his interviews, have been nothing short of insipid. It's oh. totally out of character for him. Well... This may sound strange, but I'd, I'd be very happy if work were the only part of Russ's life that was out of character. What's come over him? I'm not sure I know. Whatever it is, it isn't good. Well, you must have some idea. He's been behaving like a closet alcoholic. Jason, I wish I knew. It's so hard to understand, and 
And it's getting to be a little frightening. What is? I don't mean to be evasive. It's it's just just. I'm good at keeping secrets. You know that. It's hard to cover for him with Herb when I'm left in the dark. Oh, it's gotten to the point where I have to tell someone. Russ thinks somebody's been following him. Who? Some man. Well, what for? Russ doesn't know why, but he's so insistent about it. It's all he talks about anymore. Oh, man, he sounds a bit paranoid. No, Jason, not just a bit. This obsession of his with this stranger is driving us apart. And the worst part is I can't get Russ to talk rationally about it. Russ, open up. I know you're in there. Come on, Russ. Who told you? Charlene. She says you've been locked in there with a second reel of stagecoach since six o'clock this morning. What the devil are you doing in that editing room? Taking an opinion poll. Oh, for crying out loud, Russ. Herb's been screaming for your head all morning. Well, Herb can jog his tiny little feet right off the end of Santa Monica Pier. Charlene's threatening to tell Herb where you are. Herb will fire you this time. Charlene promised not to tell anyone. Well, she doesn't want to lose her job, and she needs her editing room to meet a deadline. Tell Charlene I'll be out in a few minutes. Russ, are you okay? Oh, terrific. There's nothing bothering me. Pretty kettle of fish, as my grandmother used to say. She meant that everything was at sixes and sevens. You understand. But what I didn't understand was why my friend Russ had locked himself in an editing room with the second reel of John Ford's classic western stagecoach. Why only the second reel? And what was he planning to do with it? Russ, open up. Charlene's got two film crews coming in with deadlines to meet. Boo. Boo. Oh, very funny. You look like you were expecting a werewolf to step out of here instead of me. I didn't know what to expect. Where are you off to now? Uh, Some place that's got coffee, a couple of slices of bread with something in between. Maybe a side order of surf and turf. How about telling me about the second real estate coach first, hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you already saw it. Oh, the rest of you may be changing, but not your sarcasm. It still doesn't have any wit. (laughs) <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Who do you think covered your television review for you? Oh, you did that, Turkey? To my everlasting shame. Yeah, well, I guess I do owe you an explanation. You owe me a lot more than that, but I'll settle for an explanation. Peggy and I had a rotten fight last night. I hunted around for a project to keep my mind off her and, and came up with this stagecoach thing. <laughs> I'm preoccupied, nothing more. So I noticed... Your hands are trembling. Well, I I didn't sleep much. Or you're working on something that's frightened the air out of your lungs. Peggy told you. I called her earlier looking for you. She's very upset. Now, now look, my my personal problems are none of your business. When your personal problems affect your work, they become my business. Your hands are shaking so bad you can't even light your own cigarette. If people would leave me alone around here, maybe I wouldn't be so edgy. If people keep leaving you alone, you won't be around here anymore. Come on. Buy you a cup of coffee in the office. One coffee, black. Huh, thanks. Yeah. Care to expound on the importance of the second reel of stagecoach? Or do I just go on thinking your mind has gone out to seed? I am not crazy. Okay, okay. Don't take me so seriously. After I tell you what's been happening to me, you think I am crazy. I knew you were crazy the day you started reviewing that dribble they call television. Look, light me a cigarette, will you? So, you believe this cop who stopped you last night is the same guy who's been following you, like the taxi driver you mentioned? Yes. Jason, I was stinking drunk. Cursing at the top of my lungs. And this cop still let me go. I told him to take me downtown, for God's sake. Did you get his badge number? I I told you, I was drunk. 
By the time I realized who he was, he was already getting in the squad car. Well, if he ran a radio check on your license... He couldn't run a radio check on my license or anybody else's. Because you don't believe he was a real cop, right? No, because I don't believe he exists. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? I don't find much sanity in that statement. Do you? I am not crazy. That is the second time you've reminded me. Well, the more I tell you my story, the easier it is to forget. It's agreed. You are in your right mind. Now, that leaves three other possibilities. One, you saw a certified policeman. Two, you saw someone who wasn't certified LAPD but wanted you to think he was. Or I think... Or you think... Or I think taking into account the emotional stress of your fight with Peggy and your inebriated condition, you hallucinated the whole episode. It wasn't a hallucination. He spoke to me. I touched his hand when I gave him my ID. Then we can assume he does exist. Well, if you believe phantoms exist, then he exists. There are people in this world who are skilled at making other people believe they are phantoms. For example, yourself of late, whenever you have an assignment that's due. Jason, do you believe in ghosts? Oh, you're losing me again. Maybe you should continue this conversation with someone who can keep up with you. Someone better trained at irrational behavior. Oh, I, I knew you'd end up suggesting a psychiatrist. Isn't that the point of this whole conversation? Nobody mentioned a psychiatrist. Yeah, well, I considered one. And? And after what I found this morning, I know a shrink couldn't help me. You're talking about the second reel of stagecoach. What does your phantom have to do with that? He's in it. You found his face in the film? That's right. I cut out a damn good picture of him in the editing room on the movieola. Same age, same build. He's wearing a cavalry hat. You found him in the charge scene, then? Yeah. Third extra over from the bugler. <laughs> I hope you're kidding. I'm not. It's, it's pretty incredible, huh? Not at all. I, I heard this exact storyline last week at Universal. How did you know your policeman was an extra in stagecoach? <laughs> oh. oh, I see. Oh, you think it's real convenient of me finding my phantom in a 40-year-old film. Now, if you'd stop being so defensive, Russ, you'd realize I'm only asking the same questions anyone else would. And, yes, I do think it's remarkably convenient, if not utterly implausible. Oh, damn it, I know what I found. Wonderful. Tell me the whole story, okay? You are really pushing me, Jason. I am. Besides being your editor, I consider myself your friend. Okay. I spent the night in a motel on Little Santa Monica. Twelve dollar room. Even had an antique black and white TV set. I was too upset to sleep. I had Peggy on my mind, sure. But him, he was what wouldn't let me sleep. A and guess what the station aired on the 1 a.m. movie last night. Oh, that one's obvious. Stage coach. Yeah. You took the print from Charlene into the editing room when you came in early this morning. Yes. I, I, I don't remember actually seeing his face while I was watching the movie last night. It, it was it was more of a feeling. Sort of a premonition. More than that. I knew I'd find his face somewhere in that film if I looked for it. Look, do you remember that Return of the Ringo Kid piece I did about three months ago? Uh, the sequel to Stagecoach Paramount was shooting. Herb sent you out to the valley with a film crew, didn't he? Yeah. We went to the Belton Stables in Chatsworth. John Ford had used some Chatsworth locations in Stagecoach, and Paramount naturally wanted to cash in on the nostalgia publicity. Well, so did Herb, if I remember. While I was out at the stables, I saw him, this guy for the first time, for the first time that I remember, anyway. He worked as a cowboy extra in the Ringo Kid sequel. Well, how many times have you seen him since then? Uh, five that I'm aware of. Who knows how many times he was watching me when I didn't know it. What do you think he wants? Me. I'm not arguing with you now, Russ. You probably don't even have an answer for this. But why you? What makes you so important you get this supernatural visitor spying on you? You're right. I, I don't have an answer for that. I just know he wants me. The same way I knew I'd find his face in the second reel of Stagecoach. <laughs> Now we're in a pickle. 
The kettle of fish is spilled, and the sixes and sevens are scrambled. Is there no way out? Suppose you found yourself encountering a stranger on an infrequent but recurring basis. A stranger whose face seems buried somewhere in your past, but for the life of you, you can't remember where. Add to this disturbing situation the fact that each time you see this stranger, he appears comfortably settled in in a different occupation. First you notice him as a cowboy actor, then as a taxi driver, then a policeman. Now, imagine your shock when you discover his face. You're absolutely certain it's the same face in a 40-year-old movie. That's the puzzle my friend Russ is trying to solve. Settle down, girl. Gotta cool off where you can drink. Good afternoon, Mr. Hayes. Well, that it is, young fella. A right beautiful day. Uh, we met once. I'm Russell Long. I with... remember. You're the TV fella that was out here two, three months ago. Yeah, that's me, all right. Uh, my body might be sagging, but there ain't nothing wrong with what I got upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, I'm doing a story on an actor, an extra, actually, who might have worked here about 40 years ago. You really are digging up the past, ain't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping I'll get lucky. <laughs> uh, I had this picture blown up from the charge scene in Stagecoach. The man I'm doing the story on is the third one over from the bugler. Charge scenes wasn't filmed around here. Mr. Ford used Monument Valley up in Utah. Yeah, I know. You know, I first met the Duke when Mr. Ford brought his stagecoach crew here to Chatsworth. Of course, nobody called John Wayne the Duke then. Fine young man he was. Made a great Ringo kid. Yeah, <laughs> that must have been quite a thrill. The Duke was the best. You don't remember meeting this man, though, do you? Uh, let me have a closer look at that picture of yours. No. No, that face there means nothing to me. Uh, I wish I could say the same. But that face won't leave me alone. Isn't there some way of finding out if he ever worked for the Belton Stables? This story's real important, huh? Uh, it could be the most important story of my life. Well, you come to the right place to do your digging. Just follow me, I... Gotta walk this filly into the barn. Uh, this album here has the pictures of every hand that worked the belt and stables between 1933 and 1940. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> Hope you ain't allergic to the dust. Ain't too often anybody comes in here anymore. Yeah. Oh, I think this tack room is terrific. More mausoleum than tack room these days. I'd guess that most of the old hands in these photographs are dead now. Mm, well, the man I'm looking for isn't dead. Oh, hey, go back a page. Uh, listen? Yeah, yeah, right there. Well, what do you know? It sure looks like the fellow you're after. <laughs> it's him, all right. His stagecoach was made in 39, so I was... Thumbing through the picture album until we come to 39. It's a lucky thing you was paying attention. So, say, you feel all right? You're, you're looking white as a ghost. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, what year was this picture taken? Uh, well, uh, let's see. We're in 37. <laughs> it must have been one cocky fellow autographed his own picture. Ward Egan. Uh, I guess my memory ain't as all get out as I'd like to think it is. Ward Egan. Now, I don't remember the name or the face. I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. You've been a big help. Yeah. Finding Egan's name oh, has been a big help. Now, just follow me, Peggy. You sit in a dark screening room for a couple of hours, usually alone, watching fictional characters act out fictional events. And you squeeze your mind, quite often to its limits, searching for those tiny traces of reality which will make those fictional characters real to an audience. Now, the psychological pressure... No, no, I see what you're leading to, and I don't agree. Russ is not losing his grip on reality. Did you consider that some someone really may be following him? Yes, but Peggy, Russ believes the man who's been following him is the same man who played as an extra in Stagecoach 40 years ago. Well, we should help Russ find this old man and confront him. 
Then we get some answers. No, 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 no. Russ insists, and I mean insists, that this man hasn't aged in 40 years. He has the same build, the same face as the extra he found in a 40-year-old film. He's absolutely convinced it's the same man. I, I, I can't believe this. Jason, what are we going to do? Well, that's what I wanted to discuss. I know an excellent psychiatrist who I'm certain can help Russ. I, I guess you're right. He does need help. Has he called you yet? No. Well, when he does, get him to come home and then give me a call. We'll get Russ the help he needs and we'll make sure nobody but the three of us will ever know about it. Entertainment desk. Jason, it's Russ. Well, the wanderer checks in. Where are you? Never mind where I am. Jason, I know his name. Ward Egan. Ward Egan, huh? Oh, that's great. I, I went out to the Belton stables. They had this dusty old tack room crammed with movie memorabilia. <laughs> oh, creepy, though. Re real creepy. What uh, made it creepy, Russ? It took us a while to find the right scrapbook, the, the one with Egan's picture in it. I spotted it first. The page was being turned, and I, I just stuck my finger out right on Egan's picture. I, I felt this real weird chill. Like somebody poured a bucket of ice water over me. All right, you accomplished your detective work. Call it a day. Peggy called again. She's anxious to see you. Yeah, I, I called Peggy a little while ago. We're meeting for a drink in half an hour. Oh, good. Uh, uh, do me a favor, Jason. I'm not covering any more boob tube reviews for you. The haunted aquarium is your domain. No, no. Uh, look in the bottom right-hand drawer of my desk. All right. What am I looking for? Just, just... Tell me what you see. It, it definitely stands out. Well, I don't see very much in here. A bunch of papers. Wait a minute. There's a directory. No, no, no. Oh, I must have left it in the trunk of my car then. Russ? What was it he kept in this drawer? Hey. Under the directory. That's where... God Almighty, what did he take his gun for? Peggy, Peggy. Oh, you better be there, Peggy. When you said Boyle Heights on the phone, I never dreamed you meant this section. Oh, I like the atmosphere in this bar. The atmosphere comes from the slums outside the door and the derelicts in here. This used to be Ward Egan's neighborhood. Oh. Huh. I suppose I should have guessed that was why you wanted to meet here for a drink. Honey, I think it's morbid to be so obsessed with someone you never knew that you make me drink my scotch and water in his old neighborhood bar. Let's go home. No, no. You, you, you want to hear how Egan died? Uh, I found out a lot about him today. Russ, please. Some joker shot him to death over a woman. He was 32 years old. I had hoped. I, I, I really hoped that you wanted to meet me so we could talk about last night, work out our problems, and, and make up. I asked you to meet me here so you'd see him. Him? Yeah. I'm waiting for Egan to show. When you see him, then you know I am not crazy. Give me your hand. Mm. Come on. Come on, give it to me. Now. Now, I think the two of us should talk to a doctor. Just tell him how we feel and what's been happening to us. What for? What for? You sit there telling me you're waiting to meet a dead man. Honey, don't you think you need help? I brought help. And I'm going to prove to you I am not crazy. Look out the window. See that man across the street? That bum in the raincoat? You know him? That's Ward Egan. It's almost dark. You can't tell who that is. I don't have to see his face to know it's Egan. He's waiting for me. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of our story. Look, 
He can turn the corner. Ross, following that bum up ahead doesn't make sense. Oh, he moves fast. Don't ignore me. You're the one who isn't listening, Peggy. There is no rational explanation for Egan's ghost, or whatever that thing is walking ahead of us. Ross, that's a man up there, not a ghost. Ghosts don't exist. Oh, this one does, and I'm going to get it before it gets me. The way he's dressed, he belongs on Skid Row, but not in a graveyard. <gasps> he stopped at that streetlight. Let's see what he does. All right. All right, he wants you to follow him. He's, he's luring you someplace. Honey, let's do the smart thing. Let's get the hell out of here. Oh, I can't run from him. He'll only come back again. Don't worry, Egan. I'm coming. Oh, did you see what he did? Oh, he smiled. Russ, I'm frightened. I want you to take me home. Oh, come on. Egan's heading up the next street. Will you please listen to me? I wanted you to see him, to know he was real. Listen, you have your car. You go home. I'll be all right. Okay. Okay, I'll believe he's a ghost, but why follow him? Make him come to you. We can get help. Oh, 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 nobody can help me. I have to do this myself. Why you? Why does he want you? Well, luck of the draw, I guess. I brought a gun. Honey, honey, please. We'll go together and talk to someone. Someone No! Who... No, 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 just take the car and go home, Peggy. Oh, what good will a gun do you against the ghosts? Ghosts are already dead. Well, Egan's ghost has a physicalness. I saw him ride a horse at the Belton Stables. I actually touched him. When I handed him my ID last night for that speeding ticket, I touched him. We had a fight last night. You were drunk. Well, whether he bleeds or not is something I'm going to find out. Egan just walked into that deserted movie theater. Oh. Let go of me. You, you'd shoot him? Oh, Ross, don't! Oh, stay out of this. Don't! Don't! You could be shooting the wrong man in that theater. You saw him smile. Oh, they'll put you in jail or, or in asylum. Oh, I, I know what I'm doing. Oh, please. Please put the gun away. What a mess. This isn't a theater. It's a garbage dump. It hasn't been occupied for years. Oh, yes, it has. Look at that door to the lobby. It's partly open. Oh. Oh, Egan must be just inside. Oh, please, Russ, come home. Do it for me. I'm waiting oh. in the theater, Bond. My name's not Bonds, Egan. What? I've waited a long time, Bond. Well, you won't have to wait any longer. Russ, who are you talking to? Egan, can't you hear him? It's me, Russ. Peggy! You're talking to Peggy! You were always the type to hide behind the skirts of a woman, Bonds. Out of my way, Peggy! No! Oh, Russ, don't go in! Egan! Egan! Oh, God, no! Oh, Jason. I suppose you're checking up on me again. Not this time. I brought something I think you should see. Come on in. I tried calling you at work, but your supervisor said you left early. I had a slight relapse. I'm feeling better now. Would you like something to drink? Peggy, are you aware you're crying? No. Let's sit down. You're having one of your I Miss Russ spells again, aren't you? Yes. I'm not handling Russ's death very well. You are a lot tougher than you think. I was sitting at my desk looking up licorice in the dictionary when one of the girls told me. I couldn't remember how to spell licorice. I didn't even realize my tears were falling on the page. The police called earlier. Anything new? Yes. They they think they've come up with a motive. They found the man you followed into the movie theater? No. They found a bag of heroin stuffed into one of the seats in the theater. Heroin? The police believe the theater was the site of a heroin buy. Russ walked in on the dealers and they shot him. Yeah, in that neighborhood, something like that isn't just possible, it's probable. They still don't know the identity of the man you and Russ followed? No. No witnesses. The police told me that that isn't unusual for Boyle Heights either. I wish I'd never agreed to meet Russ there. Oh, then he'd have gone alone. You didn't see how desperate he was for me to believe in Egan's ghost. 
Now it's too late. Now I believe, but... I, I, I still can't bring myself to tell the police. They'd, they'd never believe me because I hardly believe it myself. I just know what I think I saw. I honest to God don't believe there was anything you or I or anyone else could have done to prevent Russ's death. <sighs> I really have to work on stopping these crying spells. Uh, take a look at these pictures I brought. Okay, I'll try. I followed up on the research Russ did on Ward Egan. Uh-huh. I hope what you see will help you stop blaming yourself for playing a part in Russ's death. That's the picture Russ edited out of Stagecoach. Yeah. And this other one is a studio still I dug up through a friend of mine at the Screen Actors Guild. Ward Egan played a small part as a cop in a 1936 gangster film. That that other policeman in the picture, the the one behind the, the wheel. He looks like Russ, doesn't he? Yes. The resemblance is amazing. That actor's name was Tom Bonds. That's the name Russ said just before he went into the movie theater. He He yelled... My name isn't Bond. Yes, I remembered you told me about that when I read Bond's name on the back of the picture. I thought Russ was out of his mind hearing voices. Don't ask me to explain it, but it's just possible Russ did hear a voice you couldn't hear. Are you saying the man we followed to the old movie theater really was Ward Egan's ghost? Yes. I found an old Times article to go with that photo. Here. Why, this is a murder story. Peggy... In October of 1940, Thomas Bonds shot and killed a fellow actor named Ward Egan. They were in love with the same woman. Bonds was sent to the gas chamber for Egan's murder. What does that have to do with Russ? Bonds shot Egan in the very same Boyle Heights movie theater where Russ was murdered. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. My friend Russell Long, the Tom Bonds of an earlier lifetime and the late protagonist of my story, might have done well to ponder William Wordsworth's poetic speculation on reincarnation. Sadly, the idea of a connection between past events creating the terror Russell confronted in the present never occurred to him. He blindly assumed that Ward Egan's ghost was terrorizing him for no other reason than random chance. And blindly, he followed Egan's ghost to his death in the same Boyle Heights movie theater where Egan had died four decades earlier. At this point, you may desire some explanation for the connection between Egan's spectral revenge and Tom Bond's reincarnation as Russell Long. After all, supernatural revenge and reincarnation are most often considered strange but exclusive events. The explanation I offer is based upon the nature of reincarnation itself. We all know the basic tenet of reincarnation, that souls out of the past with all traces of their prior lifetimes forgotten, are reintroduced into the scope of contemporary humanity. Just what determines which souls return to earth at what time remains a mystery. But imagine a soul which returns before its appointed time. Such a premature return would require some cosmic action, a correction of sorts. Perhaps Ward Egan's revenge can be understood in this light. Tom Bond's violent soul returns to Earth far ahead of its appointed time. Couldn't this event provide Ward Egan's soul the opportunity to arrange his revenge for the unjust death he received at Tom Bond's hands in his previous lifetime? Well, it's only a private speculation. But don't forget it. If you ever notice a disturbingly familiar but unnameable face that seems to be following you.
The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Freeze Frame, was written by Bruce Martin and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Vic Perrin and Lou Horn. Featured in the cast were Janet Waldo and Parley Bear. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater, the presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Tomorrow at the same time, I'll bring you this week's romantic drama, a new play as unpredictable as love itself. This is Vincent Price. Isn't there something almost magical about being asleep? I find it amazing that we can willingly transform ourselves into a different state of consciousness and enter a new realm, another world suspended between reality and illusion. For most of us, sleep can be the serenity of rest and pleasant dreams. But for others, it may be torture. And on this night, we see a figure wildly thrashing in a bed, embroiled in a nightmare which has plunged the mind into fear and wrapped the body with anxiety. No. No, please, Elmer, don't. Keep away from me. Mommy! Mommy! No. No, stay there. Stay there. Mommy! Donald? What happened? Honey, are you all right? It's him. Elmer wanted to murder me again. He was chasing me with a knife. Sweetheart, it was only a dream. He's always after me. Make him go away. Away! That's impossible. You know we all have to live together. I'll talk to Elmer about this. You love that... that thing more than me. That's not true. It is. It isn't. I love both of you. Both of my boys. Why did you have to become a ventriloquist anyhow? You should have stayed as a singer. I'm more successful with Elmer. We're a team. There is no reason for you to be jealous. He's an ugly, disgusting dummy. I hate him. Behave yourself. I wish he was dead. That's enough. Go back. I don't want to talk with you anymore. I hope somebody sets him on fire. Isn't that interesting? A ventriloquist, a wooden dummy called Elmer, and it appears the nightmare has only begun. But for whom? And that's only the beginning of our story. <laughs> Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Altered Egos, by Ken Gerard. Our star, Sherry Lewis. In contrast to the backstage hubbub of the Las Vegas nightclub, Carol Lane's dressing room is deathly still. She sits motionless, staring into the dressing table mirror, and beside her, in a chair of his own, is Elmer. A small cowboy hat covers his painted face. His arms dangle at his sides. He's inert, lifeless. Or is he? What's the matter, kid? You got troubles again? No. Just thinking. Sure, tell me another one. Donald's been at it, huh? I tell you, kid, he's going to ruin it for us. Just like the Big Apple. Just like Chicago. 
You thought of that nightmare routine, huh? We shot the whole thing. You know, Maury was lucky to get you this gig. Why must you constantly fight? Every time I get close, a break, it's the same thing. He has nightmares, and you... Yeah, yeah, you know what you do. I'm not blowing this chance. No way. Just remember that. Hey, don't blame me. I'm only a dummy. I want to make it. I am tired of these second-class nightclubs, lounge acts. Oh, listen, kid, you could be dynamite without him. Get off it. Hey, slow down. Don't get on my case. You know, he thinks you want to kill him. Are you kidding? How am I going to do that, huh? You could. For Pete's sake, Carol, what am I going to do? Wait a minute. Maybe you want to do it. I'll get the blame, but you'll do it, right? You're a hideous little monster. You made me. And I can destroy you. And yourself. Without me, <laughs> you're back to singing. And we know what a success that was. Oh, no, no, no. I'm the meal ticket. The gimmick. You'd never dump me. I'm the one they pay to see, not you, you washed up. <laughs> Shut up! Don't start. Don't ever step out of line. Remember, I can make others. Maybe I should create a hand puppet. Or finish Amy? That's not necessary. You're the whole number. <sighs> Why do we argue, huh? I understand. You got opening night jitters, huh? Yeah, that's it. Opening night jitters. <laughs> Boy, I need to relax. Take a snort. That'll settle you down. I shouldn't. Come on, what's one drink? I promised Murray. Murray ain't performing. Go on. Okay. Just one. Here's looking at you, kid. You want one? You want me to warp? <laughs> Do you drink? No, ma'am. Do you smoke? No, ma'am. Do you run around with girls? No, ma'am. Don't you have any vices? You know, this routine went out with vaudeville. Carol, you ain't gonna make it with the same rotten jokes. No way. Ten minutes to... Showtime. Murray, Murray, just the man I want to see. How many of those you had? One. Half. Half of one. Really? Scout's honor. Carol, you blow this and you're finished. I won't bail you out again. Why are you throwing it away? It's only a lounge act. You're kidding. This is Vegas. I got agents, producers, even the talent coordinator from the late night show is sitting out there. Oh, baby, it's your chance. Murray, put me on last. You're the opening act. Carol, I'm counting on you. Please, I don't feel good. How do you feel split ahead? Set for anything except a bonfire. Hey, what's green and travels a hundred miles an hour? What? A frog in a blender. <laughs> you think that's dumb? You should meet my uncle. He keeps racing pigeons, but he's always falling off the roof. <laughs> my aunt wanted a vacuum. He told her to use the one in her head. You're ready. <laughs> We're going to knock him dead, right, Carol? Remember, keep off the booze. Huh? Oh, I wouldn't touch it. it. Makes my varnish crack. Carol, you'll be great. Now, believe me, just take it slow. I'll see you after the show. Not if I see you first. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way. Now, laugh it up. I'll be fine. Murray, I love you. Sure, kid. Uh, remember, huh? No booze. Get yourself together. Fix your hair. You don't feel well, do you? Well, don't try to ruin my chances. If you botch this performance... I'll never work with you again. Never. Despite Carol Lane's hopes, her Las Vegas debut was anything but a success. The audiences were bored by her contrived routine, and the critics were less than kind. Murray tried to shield her from the truth, Yet, playing to virtually empty rooms spoke for itself. Uh, what are you carrying on? Maybe Vegas ain't the right spot for you. Listen, they loved you in Chicago. Yeah, that's Chicago. Murray, 
Maybe we ought to cancel the rest of the week. Eh, don't be ridiculous. I didn't tell Elmer we got a bad review. But he knows. Why must you talk with that dummy so much? I wish you wouldn't refer to him as a dummy. Elmer wants more respect, and I want that phone taken out of here. What's the matter? Somebody bothering you? You getting crank calls? Yes. It always rings when Elmer's napping. I think, I think she's found us again. We'll, we'll, we'll change your dressing room. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk to the club, okay? They haven't stopped since... Since we left Chicago. Day and night. Murray, Murray, it's driving me insane. You've got to do something. You've got to tell her to stop. Yeah, uh, all right, Carol. I I'll handle it. And Elmer said, come here. She might be outside. Elmer said, he's being watched. What? <laughs> he thinks she's out there again. <gasps> Murray, she might kidnap him. Oh, Carol, come but on. Call, call the... You know, they're, they're all part of her plan. This time it's serious. Uh, sure it is. Sure, sure, sure. I'll tell you, let's keep it secret for a while. We'll get some help, like a security guard. No. You can't trust anybody. Anybody. But, sweetheart, look, I, I know this man. Best in the business. Special situation. Trust me, huh? You think I'm making this up? No. No, I don't. I, I, I really don't. I, I know it's serious. you got to have protection and somebody to talk to, huh? All right. But don't tell him everything. Well, of course not. Listen, get some rest. I'll, I'll find the man, and, and they'll change your dressing room. No phones. Right, right, right. Stay here, will you? I'll, I'll take care of everything. I won't leave the room. Yeah, promise not to leave the club, huh? Yes. That's right. Lock it good. What's in that, a nervous kid? She's got you running around in circles, huh? Murray's going to take care of it, sure he will. He didn't believe you. He did. No way. He thinks you're loony. Calls. Ha! Huh. You know what's happened. You've seen her sitting out there every night. She wants you back, doesn't she? Well, at least we had some laughs together. You rotten... Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. My paint chips. Have a drink. Take two. They're small. Why didn't you tell? Murray would have listened to you. Tell him what? Jokes? The story of my life about her. About the incidents, the calls. Ha, ha, ha. Speak of the devil. Don't answer it. Answer what? I didn't hear anything. Sir. You're hearing things. There again. I didn't hear nothing. That, that. It's all in your head, Carol. All in your head. You're going crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Elmer's words rang in Carol's ears. But isn't Elmer part of her? Isn't he another extension of her personality? Perhaps more than she'll admit. Murray! Murray! What's the matter? She called. <laughs> she wants Elmer back. Murray, she threatened to kill me. All right, take it easy. Take it easy now. Come on, sit down. Who is he? What is, what is that man doing here? Get him out. You relax, out. relax, will you? This is the guy I mentioned. He's going to help you. He's okay. Now, don't worry, will you, please? Are you sure? Are you sure he's all right? Well, I'm telling you he's okay. Now, you, you can tell him anything, right, Lang? If Miss Lane wants to. Are you a doctor? Yes. Murray, get him out. Oh, honey, you need help. You're tired. Talk to Dr. Lang. He's a psychiatrist, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He is. Now, j j just sit with him for a while. What's it going to hurt, huh? You think I'm insane? You think I made up all this stuff about that woman? She is real. She called. Ask... Oh, ask please, Elmer. Please, sweetheart, talk with Dr. Lang. I, I, I think you're fine, right? But, but you need to unburden yourself. Uh, uh, Carol, for me... All right. Yeah. I gotta go. Uh, uh, I'm gonna check some publicity. Look, I'll be back. I better tell Elmer that you're here. Elmer, we the guest. Who's this clown? A friend of Murray's. I'm a doctor. What's up, Doc? Not funny, huh? He's a psychiatrist. What? A shrink? Did Donald put him up to this? I'll bet he did. 
Okay, Toots. I warned you. We're finished. I'm never talking to you again. Never. Oh, you'll talk again. Just remember, I control you always. I'm sorry. Sometimes, Doc, sometimes he gets out of hand. After we left New York, he was impossible. And she... It doesn't matter. She? Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. I was having some trouble with my material, that's all. Sure you were. I was trying out a new routine, and some of it didn't play well. No routine. Ho, ho, ho. The bells were ringing for me and my pal. And it wasn't the parson, Doc. You see? He's always butting in. Were you bothered by this woman? No. Yes. Well, it's none of your business. All right. All right. There were some calls. Oh, that is a hot one. Ding-a-ling-a-ling. Of course she called. I don't know how she found us in New York, in Chicago. Why didn't you tell Murray about her? I did. He didn't believe me. And she is out there. I'm telling you the truth. Say the secret white and I'll tell you the truth. I told you to keep quiet. There. Get her to keep her hands off my mouth, Doc. And I'll tell you about a certain band leader. I told you not to talk about him. Don't never mention his name again. Sorry, Doc. You gotta keep the secret. I'll tell you later when she's not around. You're very good with the dummy. He is not a dummy. Oh, were you always a ventriloquist? You're getting close, Doc. No. Uh, no. I used to sing with a band. Until... Something happened. It didn't work out. I hated the travel. Oh, tell me another one. I did, too, yeah. Yeah, what about the little incident with uh, you-know-who? Shut up. And then the phones really started ringing. Doctor, I'm sorry. I'm tired. I need to take a nap before the next show. Um, I'll talk with you tomorrow. Fine. Why don't you call me in the morning? Me, too, me, too. And I'll give you the lowdown. He'll lie to you. He's a liar. Elmer doesn't know anything. No way. Ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. Stop it! Carol, is there something you haven't told me or discussed with Murray? Make her stop following us. Make her stop calling and hounding us. Make her stop. I am not hearing voices. She is real. Ask Elmer. He spoke with her. He did. Elmer, what hasn't Carol told me? Ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. Tell him. Please, tell him... Elmer, please, you spoke with her. Tell Dr. Lang I get a lot of calls. Her. About her. I don't remember a gal named her. Uh, Elmer? That's my name. Joke's my game. Elmer, was Carol threatened? Hmm, don't think so. You heard her. She said she'd get me this time. Really? You did. You did. He's lying. He always lies when we talk about her. And now she'll take Elmer away from me. You can't let it happen. He is all I have. All I have. Yeah, what about darling Donald? Or is someone else on tour with you? Yes. Yes, my son. Well, I'd like to meet him. Well, later. He's not feeling well. He has nightmares. Would you be quiet? Just for once, I don't have to talk at all. Go to sleep, sure. Better than being with you. Put me in my bed. Comfortable? Just great. Do you mind if I go back to the hotel? Give my love to darling Donald. Doc, maybe I should take him with me. No, that would disturb Donald. I gather there's a problem between them. Oh, I've got to keep them apart. They would kill each other. <laughs> Anybody here? Miss Lane? What a nice dressing room. Quite different from the one in New York. Or the one you had in Miami. You remember Carol? I bet you do. Well, little man, where's your darling Carol? Seems she ditched you, too. But she does that very often, doesn't she? Love them and leave them. Or is it steal them and forget them? 
Tell me, darling Elmer, which is it? You know she'll toss you in the heap, too. She will. She always does. Hey, how did you like Chicago? No matter how many times you changed rooms, I found you, didn't I? I called you. And New York? Oh, serves her right. Next time she'll be careful whose husband she plays around with. I bet you've seen your share of husbands come through here, little man, haven't you? Because she doesn't care who she hurts, does she? But I do. I am not going to let her get away with this one. I'm not letting her alone for one minute. I remember what she did to my marriage and my husband. Well, I tell you what. Let's show her who's in charge now. Let's tell her. We'll leave her a note. There we are. Now, little man, you're coming with me. Thank you for dinner, Dr. Lang. I really feel much better. Oh, would you like to come in? I mean, if you don't have another appointment. I'd like to. Uh, wonderful. I want you to meet Donald. Sorry, it's not the best room. Murray tried, but... Sit down. I'll get him. Donnie? We have company. He's so shy. Oh, Donald, don't hide under the covers. I don't want to meet anybody. Don't be that way, darling. Dr. Lang is a very nice person. He's a friend. Here we are, Dr. Lang. I want you to meet my son, Donald. Isn't... Isn't that Elmer? Oh, no. Oh, of course, they are twins. But Elmer's only a stage person. <laughs> Were you honestly expecting a child? I thought Donald was a real boy. Mommy, I'm tired. I... I want to go back to sleep. Are you hungry? No, I had a big lunch with Franklin. That's his teddy. Did you miss Mummy? Yeah. Why is that man staring at me? He thinks I'm only a dummy. I'm not, am I? Oh, that's not true, is it, Doctor? Well, certainly not. Uh, Donald, how old are you? Nine. You enjoy traveling with Mommy? As long as I don't have to see him. Him? Elmer. I wish he was dead. That's not nice. Well, it's true. He always ruins everything. That's enough. Now, Mommy wants to talk with Dr. Lang alone. Night. What a good boy. I I'll only be a moment, Doctor. Sweet dreams. Oh, here's Franklin. Night, night, darling. Donald likes you. time you thought he was a real boy. At least he is to Carol. And what of the caller? Isn't she a real person too? We'll let you decide that for yourself. You, you, you gotta be kidding. She doesn't have a son. That's the spare dummy in case anything happens with the other one. Murray, Carol believes she has a child. It may be Elver's twin. However, it has an identity. No, 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 no. Listen, Doc, she, she's putting you on. No, no, no. Donald is an individual. He's the good son, the nice child. She sees him as everything Elmer isn't. Now, now you're telling me Elmer's a kid, too, huh? They're her sons. Distinctly opposed, different temperaments, and right now they fulfill most of her needs. Well, what does that mean? Right now, translated, means things can change, huh? Give it to me straight, will you? If she continues, on stage and off, with this obsession, this duality, well, it could destroy her completely. I think Carol should be hospitalized. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. I better talk to her. She'll she'll listen to me. <laughs> or will she? I thought I had locked it. Elmer, I'm back. I had a marvelous time. Dr. Lang is quite nice. We had a wonderful dinner. Elmer? Come on, don't be mad at me. Where are you? Oh, don't hide. Elmer! Elmer, don't do this. Why are you punishing me? Where are you? Hello? Are you missing something? You? Haven't we finished with you? Never. Because now I have Elmer... Give him back. He's mine. Not any longer, he isn't. Isn't that right, darling, Elmer? <laughs> you can't. You can't. How does it feel to lose something you love? Tell me, Carol. Just tell me. Please. Please, I need him. Well, he doesn't need you because I'll take care of him. Remember how I begged you to stay away from my husband. Now you begged me. <laughs> no. no, no. Did you read my note? Note? I left you a message. Like the last time. And Carol, don't try to find us. Don't. Hello? 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 Elmer, please. Please, Elmer. Carol, what happened? <laughs> She's kidnapped him. No, no, no. Take it easy, kid. Now, would you She's take it got easy? him, Murray. He's gone. The woman, she's taken Elmer. Oh, Murray, she's going to kill him. Oh. I know it. Shh, shh, shh. Everything's going to be fine, okay? The doc here and I will take care of you. I, I Maybe prom- she's after Donald. I better get to the room. Carol, sit down. No, get out of my way. Hold it, doc, will you? Let go! Let go! <laughs> get her some water. This is crazy, crazy. Carol, Carol, listen to me. It's Dr. Lang. Don't believe me. You think I'm losing my mind. That woman has him. I spoke with her. I told Murray. Was she here? In the room? No, on the telephone. She threatened me. She's always after us. Never, never stops. I can prove it. I can prove it. I can. She left a note. It's here. It's got to be here. Murray, Murray, help me tell him. No, no, look for the note. She said, here. Look. Look, read it, read it, read it, read it. All right, all right, all right. I will. Give me a chance, huh? Sit down, honey, will you? Come on, it's okay. You see, th- there was a letter. Somebody is really after her. I told you. Oh, Murray, this is a shopping list. Let me see that. No, uh-uh, it's a letter. She's got him. Sure, 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 I understand, honey. What are we going to do, Doc? I mean, she's not responsible anymore, is she? No, no, she isn't. Murray, we've got to get her to it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But how... Do we have the right to put her in an institution? She needs a private rest home where she can be watched. Oh, I don't want to put her away. No, we're not. We're not. But, Murray, she needs help desperately. You think... You think she tried to kill herself? Perhaps. She... Okay. L- let me handle it, will you? Carol? Carol? Honey... Would you do me a big favor, huh? You want me to go away? Is that it, Murray? Uh huh. Yeah. You've been working too hard, honey. You know, you could use a rest. I'm tired. I can't fight them anymore. Oh, sure. And that's why you should take it easy, honey. I, I, you know, I got just the place. That, it's like a resort. It's out in the desert, and the food. Oh, it's sensational. And. Do I know about food? I... It's a mental hospital, isn't it? No. Oh. It, it, it's a rest home, honey. Does it have bars? Oh. <laughs> no way, sweetheart. It, it's only until you get in touch with yourself. Will you take care of Donald? Oh, sure. You can take him with you. How would you like to see your mother in an asylum? You want him there, too, huh? Both of us locked up in the loony bin, in the madhouse. Watch it. Grab her. Crazy, crazy. Hold her down. I can't, I can't. 
Carol, Carol, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Carol, look at me. We want to help you. You understand, don't you? Yes. I wouldn't hurt you, honey. I wouldn't never. I love you. I, I want you like the old Carol. Everything is coming apart. The boys are killing me. They really are. And that woman. Oh, that woman is... Oh, you don't have to explain, honey. Murray, she really exists. There is a note. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll find it. You'll see. Here. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Uh, may I read it, Carol? I love Elmer. And he's in love with me. He's mine. Elmer hates Carol. Murray... Is this in her handwriting? I don't know. I said there was a letter. Ah, now, are you convinced? Now, will you believe me? Yes, Carol. Yes, yes. We believe you. Uh, do you have any more letters? No. No, that's the only one since I left Chicago. I burned all the others. I always burn them. <laughs> Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of Altered Egos. Suppose you were threatened and nobody believed you. How would you feel? Undoubtedly frightened. No, frantic, almost irrational, as the unseen and the unbelieved move closer and closer. Is there really somebody holding Elmer hostage? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I, I expected Miss Lane. No, she's busy. Is she looking for someone? Who is this? A friend of hers. You can tell Carol Elmer's with me. It's some woman. She says she's got... It's her. She's got my baby. Give me that. Give him back or I'll kill you. Hello, Carol. I told you. I warned you. He's mine. Not anymore. I will do everything for him that you can. Please. Please. Elmer doesn't like being dragged all over the country. He needs a home with me. Why? Why are you doing this? Are you serious? After what you did to me, to my life, you destroyed my marriage. I will never forgive you, and neither will Elmer. Neither will Elmer. But he didn't tell you that, did he? Did he? Well, he didn't have to. He'll never speak unless I'm there. Go ahead. Make him talk. You can't. You can't. He talks to me. Elmer loves me, not you. Liar. He hates you. I want to hear it myself. Let him tell me. I hate you. <laughs> that wasn't Elmer, was it? Yes. Was it? Yes. No. Oh, anything you say. You make him talk. No. If you don't, Cut off his arms. <gasps> or both his legs. No, please don't. And then his head. Oh, please. I will murder him if he doesn't talk. No. And it will be your fault. You oh. will be responsible. Oh, please. You make him talk. Make I him can't. talk. Unless I, unless I hold him. Murderer. No, no, no. Murray, take her into the bedroom. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Hello? I want her. If she doesn't make Elmer talk, I will punish her. Is Elmer with you? I wouldn't leave him alone. Oh, no. He will never be alone again. I will always be with him. Always. Did you write the letter to Carol? Oh. You're one of her boys. She wants to trick me, doesn't she? I know she can change her voice. Will you tell her to make Elmer talk? You'll have to tell her yourself. If she doesn't, I will kill him. You wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, I will. She kept us apart. She stole him from me. You ask her. You ask her. You mean Elmer belongs to you? She took him away from me. We were happy until she came between us. She enticed him. Yes, he belongs to me. How do you know that's really Elmer? It has to be. He didn't tell you. Because she's poisoned his mind. Or the real Elmer is hiding from you. What do you mean, 
hiding? Where? Oh, he could be here in Carol's hotel room. Why don't you come here? Yes, come here and find out for yourself. Now, this isn't going to work. It's crazy. Suppose she doesn't show. Let's take Carol to the hospital. Let this wacko disappear. She won't. She's followed her across the country. Now, we're going to bring her into the open and put an end to Carol's nightmare. <laughs> You make it sound so simple. Suppose the woman's got a gun and wants to blow us away. Think of that, Doctor. I want to get the police in on this. What are you going to tell them? Two women are vying for the affections of a ventriloquist dummy, and one of them's a potential murderess? Yeah. <laughs> you lock me up. We'll wait. A bit longer. She's coming. You think it's her? Yes. Oh, I have the wrong room. Oh, no, no, no. Won't you please come in? Uh, is Miss Lane here? Yeah, yeah, she's in the bedroom. Is that Elmer underneath the blanket? Yes, I had to wrap him up. It's so chilly. I'll let you out now. There you are. Please, sit down. All right. Did you have a good dinner, Elmer? Why doesn't he talk? Well, he's he's shy. Of me? Are you shy, Elmer? See, he's nodding his head. You moved it with your hand. I did not. Oh, but you did. Look at him now. He's smiling. Murray, get Miss Lane, please. With the other one? No, no, alone. Why did you take Elmer away from Miss Lane? I didn't. He told me to come and get him. He's so unhappy with her. It was just a matter of time. She's got him. She's got my Elmer. He is mine. He's mine. Get him back. I will not. He hates you. Always traveling, always in cheap hotels. You tell them, Elmer. He can't. Elmer only speaks for me. Tell her. He won't. <laughs> Stop laughing. Stop it. I can make him talk any time. Elmer, who do you love? T -t Tell her you love me. <laughs> Say it. Say you love me. He doesn't. He will. Say it. Tell me. Y you want to live with me. I'll give you everything. Please tell me that you love me. I hate you. You filthy thing. I'll kill you. Don't do that. Be careful. Kill you. Be careful. Get around. Get around. Get around. Hold on to her. Carol, Carol, move back. Move away, Carol. My baby. 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 He's dead. He's dead. Oh, you look terrific. Thank She's you. looking great, huh, Doc? How you doing, kid? Mary, I feel like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. Oh. I'm like a new woman with an entire life in front of me. Oh, you don't have to talk about it. Oh, but I want to. I can talk about it, Murray. It's part of my therapy. Sure, babe, sure. I was so mixed up. Elmer was real. Donald was my son. I'm glad it's in the past. All of a sudden. I'm so happy it's over. Murray, I have really purged myself of those voices and those problems. Ah, oh, that's sensational. Right, Dr. Lang? It's an excellent start. And my career is still ahead of me. Yeah. You, you want to go back on the stage again? I, I mean, you, you want to sing this time? Not at all. Murray, I'm a great ventriloquist. But, uh, I, I thought you put Elmer away. I did. This is a new concept, a mother and daughter act. You'll love it. I wish you could meet Amy, but she's sleeping right now. The 
The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Altered Egos, was written by Ken Gerard and produced and directed by Livia Granito. Your host was Vincent Price. Our star was Sherry Lewis. Featured in the cast were Leslie Woods, Robert Rockwell, Shepard Menken, and June Foray. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. And by Pillsbury Frosting Supreme, so smooth and creamy you can spread it with a paper knife. This is Cicely Tyson, inviting you to join us tomorrow at this time for another story about love, the most unpredictable of human emotions. This is Vincent Price. It made the headlines, of course. Wife killer pleads for death. Ludlow Case, a nice guy who before the tragedy had done nothing more violent than crush an ice cube, had killed his wife, choking her to death. It made the radio and the television news. Listeners were informed Ludlow Case, confessed murderer, goes berserk in court. Hysterically demanding his own execution. There was bedlam in the courtroom until deputies managed to grab Ludlow Case and restrain him. Ludlow sobbed pitifully and mumbled that his wife was a good woman, a fine woman, repeating it over and over, crying that he loved her and she loved him. But he killed her and wanted only to die. He even asked for a knife or a gun so that he could do the job himself. Well, Ludlow got his wish, the death penalty. It was over. Yesterday's news, the Sob sisters stopped speculating as to what bizarre set of circumstances could have led the big, heretofore gentle man to kill the good woman he professed to love. The defense lawyer went ahead with the usual appeals, Ludlow too indifferent to even realize what was happening. As far as the public was concerned, the case was closed. The execution would be covered, of course, but it would be routine. And then, three short days before he was scheduled to die, the man who had begged for the electric chair asked to see his lawyer. It was urgent. Something horrendous had happened. He had to see his lawyer right away, right that minute. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Love Spelled Backwards by Marion Turk. Our stars, Harley Bear and Virginia Gregg. Attorney James Folliday could not comply with Ludlow Case's demand that he see him right away. Holiday was in trial defending some other poor soul, but he made it to the death row cell that evening. Hi, Lud. You okay? Lud, it's me, Holiday. Mm -hmm. Come on, Lud, snap out of it. He didn't come. Well, I'm here. I came as soon as I could. I need him, and he won't come. Lud, get up. Move around. Leave me alone. I want my lawyer. What do you think you're doing? Keep your hands off of me. You're up. Oh, it's you. Well, about time. Uh, sorry I had to do that. You were really out of it. So you finally got here. What's the problem, Lud? Problem? 
I'm sitting here on death row. That problem enough? In a few stinking hours, they're going to march me down that hall, strap me in that chair. You think I don't care? I did my damnedest, you know that. You've only got yourself to blame. All you did was scream that you were guilty, that you wanted to die. I changed my mind. How come? All during the trial, you had this passionate flirtation with death. Well, why the turnip? I got reasons. It's a little late. You've got to help me. I can't die now. I got to live. I got to live as long as possible. Well, all I can do now is try for commutation to life. That, that's it. Do it. Get me life. Life. All right, but I can't go in empty-handed. I've got to have something to present, some new evidence, or at least some extenuating circumstance. You never even told me why you killed your wife. She was a good woman. You said that. You kept saying It's true. Then why? This lousy cop creaks every time you move. You'd think the least I could do for a guy is give him a cot that doesn't creak. Love, I'm asking you why. I'm no monster. Just because I look big and tough doesn't mean anything inside. I'm a marshmallow. So what happened? She was a good woman. Lord, try to understand. You'll have to give me something to work with. In all the time we were married, she never yelled or screamed or cussed me out. I'd get uptight, but she'd stay cool, cool, calm, and chock full of love. Well, a minute ago you were fighting mad. Now you're going dreamy on me again. I've heard all this stuff, you know, a hundred times I've heard it. She, she was the perfect wife, the greatest housekeeper, the most fantastic cook. Her souffle never fell. I mean, never. Okay. Uh, she was too good to be true. So why did you kill her? She loved me. Go figure, women. I never thought I had a chance with her. I'm just a slob. But she loved me. We're not getting anywhere, love. She did everything for me. Bought all my clothes, laid them out for me in the morning, got up early to fix my breakfast. So? Her name was Eva, you know. Yes, it's an odd name. Well, don't you get it? E-V-O-L. Love. Spelled backwards. Oh. Her mother's name is Legna. L-E-G-N-A. Try spelling that backwards. Ah. Oh. When Evol was twelve, her father killed himself. You never told me that. Nobody could understand why. He, he seemed to have everything, especially the perfect wife. Well, go on. One day, he came home from work, drove the car into the garage, turned off the motor, put a gun to his head, and pulled the trigger. Good Lord. Every night when I drove home from work, I'd think about him. I'd put the car in the garage and sit there for a while. I bought a gun, kept it in the glove compartment. Sometimes I'd take it out, raise it to my temple, but I never had the guts to pull the trigger. So I'd steal myself, because I knew she'd be there waiting with a great big smile. Was your day full of love, she'd ask. It's cute. I thought so, too, at first. And I'd answer, well, not exactly, but the night's going to be. And I'd take her in my arms, and she was all round and soft like a rag doll. Lud. Uh, like I said, way back at the beginning, I never thought I had a chance with her. It didn't enter my mind to ask her to the senior prom. I went stag with Brad and two other guys, and she was there with Willie Pomeroy. She was all rosy pink and white in a fluffy kind of dress. She looked good enough to eat. I couldn't keep my eyes off her. But I'd never have had the nerve to ask her to dance. And then, towards the end of the evening, she walked right up to me. Hello, Ludlow. Uh, uh, hi. Aren't you ever going to ask me to dance? Who, me? Ludlow Case, don't you like me? Even a little. Well, uh, sure, I... I uh, uh, you... You you really want to dance with me? Oh, silly. Come on. You're a very good dancer. 
Who? Uh, me? Who, oh, me? Is that all you can say? Who, me? <laughs> Sorry, I guess I, I'm just kind of... Surprised? Yeah. I've been admiring you for a long time. Me? You have? You're so, so strong, and yet so well, kind of tender. And you're not all full of your, of your own importance. Mm. I guess that's because I'm not important. Not important? When you're just about the best player on the football team? You should have been captain instead of that stupid Jess Fallons. You really think so? You can run rings around any fellow in school. Why, the way you got Pat and Jerry to stop fighting last week? Oh, well, all I did was bump their heads together and got them talking instead of punching. All you did? Oh, you're so modest. You should toot your own horn more. No, never mind. I'll toot it for you. <laughs> you want to know something? What? I almost flunked English Lit because of you. Because of me? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't concentrate. Not with you sitting right in front of me. I, I, I kept looking at your hair oh, and... Oh, Ludlow. She came just about up to my shoulder. I drew her closer and we kept on dancing. Sometimes I can still smell the perfume she was wearing. It was like holding a whole bunch of lilacs. After that, we started going steady. I got a job in a hardware store and went to night school to learn bookkeeping. And when they made me assistant bookkeeper at Johnson's Lumber Company, we were married. She was the one who proposed. <laughs> She'd have waited for me. I'd still be trying to get up the courage. sprawled on the creaking cot. It was as though the pain of remembering was draining his last bit of strength. But Holiday kept probing like a surgeon with a scalpel, hoping to ferret out the cancer. So you got married? Yep. A nice church wedding. All our friends were there. And then? There was a reception in the back yard of her aunt and uncle's home. Her Mother was in a sanitarium. had been there ever since her father did what he did. Evol's aunt and uncle didn't like me much. They thought she was throwing herself away so that... Well, they thought she could do a lot better. It was true, of course. She could have had almost anybody. Des Felons was on the top of her aunt's list. His father was vice president of a bank. But she loved you. Yeah. The honeymoon was great. I discovered feelings I never knew I had. I hadn't been around women much. My own mother died when I was a kid. And my dad never remarried. The two of us just batched it. I thought it was really something the way she fussed over me. I even let her crack my breakfast eggs and spoon feed me. When I took my shower, she asked me to leave the bathroom door open. She didn't want anything to come between us. So when did it go sour? I don't know. It wasn't any one thing. Maybe if we'd had children. She had two miscarriages, you know. No, I didn't know. Funny thing what the doctor said. I, I never believed him, of course. Well, what'd he say? That she brought on the miscarriages. That she didn't really want children. Maybe she was afraid they'd come between you. Oh, with all that love to give, why wouldn't she want kids? After each time she lost the baby, she'd cry for days and cling to me. All I have is you, she'd say. Then she'd dry her eyes and tell me, you're all I need. She was being brave about it, you see. Oh, I see. After she lost the second baby, we gave up crying. And she clung more than ever. She used to say she hated to see me leave for work in the morning and she could hardly wait to meet me for lunch. Every day she'd go to all the bother of taking the bus downtown just to be sure I ate right. We'd go to a health food cafeteria. She'd take one tray for the both of us. Cozier that way, she said. Dear 
Charlie, doesn't that carrot salad look divine? Looks like carrot salad. And I can't stand it, especially with coconut and marshmallow. Carrots are good for you. The chock full of vitamin A. I have a great idea. Let's live dangerously and eat something sinful. <laughs> I love it when you're facetious, darling. You take some sprouts. I hate sprouts. Nonsense. It's the best thing in the world for you. Here. Would you like some soybean loaf? Would it do any good to say no? Oh, darling, you're so funny. Hey, there's something I want. Chocolate pudding. Carob, dear. But it must be left over. They had it yesterday. Take the prune whip. No, no prune whip. Anything but prune whip. What did you say, dear? Uh, not a thing. I I didn't say a thing. Well, while you're paying, I'll run and get that nice table over by the window. Sure. Isn't this a lovely table? Absolutely. How was your morning, honey? Okay. Pete wanted me to have lunch with him. Oh, he could have joined us. Here? <laughs> you couldn't pull him in here with a tractor. He's strictly a hamburger and beer man. Oh, well, you must insist he come sometime. He should learn to eat right. I'll tell him you said so. His wife should take better care of him. He's not married. Well, someday he'll meet a real nice girl, and then all his troubles will be over. Why don't you ask him for dinner, and I'll invite Mabel Gordley. He's got a girlfriend. And anyway, you, you don't want to waste your elegant cooking on him. Why, he wouldn't appreciate it. Darling... Don't talk with your mouth full. And don't put so much margarine on your roll. She did cook real elegant, believe me. Lunch out was soybeans and sprouts, but dinner at home was gourmet all the way. She made all kinds of fancy things and tried to teach me how to pronounce them, but I never could. Vichy sauce and all that. It was mostly kind of soft, creamy stuff. She wouldn't ever just slap a big, juicy steak on the pan. When I'd tell her that was all she had to do to make me happy, she'd smile that soft, understanding smile she had and say she liked to fuss and bother for me. A most unusual woman. Taking care of me was her mission in life. If I had to work late, she phoned every half hour to warn me not to get overtired, the slightest cold, and I'd be put to bed with a vaporizer, heating pad, and hot lemonade. And on Valentine's Day, she... You know what she did one Valentine's Day. Maybe that's what did it. <laughs> Who can fathom its many guises or control its power? Like all power, love has the capacity to heal and also to wound. What was it Evil did to Ludlow on that Valentine's Day, the day of love? To find out, we go to the offices of Hunter and Company Builders, where Ludlow had a desk in a very large room that accommodated bookkeepers and accountants. A messenger boy is walking towards Ludlow's desk. Uh, you Mr. Ludlow Case? Right. I got something for you. Okay, where is it? It's downstairs. Uh, see, it's, it's kind of big, so I didn't want to lug it up here till I was sure. The address was blurred. So what is it? It's a valentine, sir. I I'll be right back. You getting the valentine, Lud? I'm afraid so. Yeah, I got one this morning. Overdrawn bank statement. I have a feeling mine will be worse. <laughs> Here you are, sir. Uh, would you just sign for it, please? Well, oh, will you look at that. Hey, that's as big as I am. A great big red satin heart. <laughs> hey, what does the ribbon say? Evie loves Lud. Oh, ain't that the pits? Get that thing out of here. <laughs> no, you haven't seen it all, sir. See, there's this round box in the center, you see? And you're supposed to open it. I've seen enough. B but that's the main attraction. See, you open the box, and then a Cupid doll springs out. A Cupid doll? And she talks, too. Here, I I'll do it for you. Kissy-poo, kissy-poo, I love you, kissy-poo. <laughs> Are you going to get that thing out of here, Doris? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right away. 
I'm just doing my job. I'm sorry about that, sir. Oh, kiss me, Paul. I love you. Well, Folliday, your wife ever do a thing like that? Hardly. Did you talk to her? Did you try to get her to listen to reason? Are you kidding? I tried everything. It was like talking to water. Can you make a river flow any different by using words? She'd listen, she'd agree with everything I said, and then she'd go right along the same as always. In desperation, I got the idea that maybe if somebody else talked to her, a, a, a professional, you know, maybe even a, a psychiatrist. Mm, sounds like a good idea. Well, of course, I couldn't come right out and say I thought there was something wrong with her. I, I had to make her believe I was the one needed a head doctor. Well, how'd you do that? Well... I'd been having the same kind of dream almost every night. I'd, I'd be at a phone booth, and it would be very important that I call Evie. It'd be life or death, but no matter what I did, I couldn't get her. I'd dial, and nothing would happen. I'd call the operator, and she'd come on, and then go off before I could say anything. And I'd look around for someone to help, and there was never anybody there. There, there was nothing but the phone booth and the darkness and... I'd keep on dimes in and dialing and dialing, and then I'd wake up in a cold sweat. What did the psychiatrist say? Oh, he... He said it was a sign of frustration. I already knew that. I'd read a book on dreams once. But I, I told Evie I was worried and was going to see this doctor and wanted her to come along. Well, she went with you? Oh, sure. She couldn't wait. Of course, I saw him myself the day before even though I had to pay extra. Uh, I, I, I had to explain the whole situation, that he was to pretend I was the patient, but that what I really wanted was to see if there was something he could do about her. His name was Roselle, Dr. Leon Roselle, and he had a foreign kind of accent that sounded put on to me. Ah, dear people, come in, come in. Sit, sit, sit. I'll be with you in a moment. Ah, here it is. Yes, of course, Case. Monsieur and Madame Case. Uh, monsieur's having dreams, no? Yes. I'm always dialing this phone and... Uh, uh, dreaming is uh, not too serious. Anything else bother you? Well, y y you know, Doc, like I said, when I made the appointment, my wife, Evie, she, she came along... Yes, yes, of course. But, Iridius... I want to help that low see it through. Most commendable indeed. Tell me, madam, you and your husband, uh, you have a good relationship? Oh, our relationship couldn't be better. We love each other as much now as the day we were married. Maybe more. No complaints? Complaints? About Lud? Every day I thank the good Lord for sending him to me. He's my whole world. Oh, so uh, perhaps uh, he should not be your whole world. Perhaps... Uh, oh, you... I'm sure your wife feels the same. My wife? Uh, <laughs> my wife? Uh, oh, what can I say? Are you all right, Dr. Rossell? You look so tired. I'm tired? <laughs> oh, you poor man. You're exhausted. <laughs> and no wonder... Listening to people's troubles all day long. Day after day. Oh, you should take a vacation. How oh, can I? Appointments, appointments, nothing but appointments. Paranoiac, psychopaths, manic depressives, all needing me. They're draining me. They're draining my life's blood. Now, what you should do is quit. Go on to another line of work. How oh, can I quit? How else can I make so much? I'm up to my beard in debt. My wife throws money around like it was Kleenex. Oh, I wish I could help. Oh, nobody helps a psychiatrist. Nobody thinks we have problems. You must calm down now. Do not excite yourself. Just relax. Just relax. And let me massage the back of your neck. Madame Case. Call me Evie. In just a minute, you'll feel much better. You'll see. Uh, Madame Evie. My. All the muscles back here are so tight. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, you have the touch, <laughs> definitely. Oh, you have the touch. Now, about your wife. You must be firm. Very firm. 
She'll respect you for it. She will? Of course. Now, I'll tell you what you must do. You must tell her that the next time she buys anything without asking you, you will shave off all her hair. Oh? <laughs> you, you think it will work? I guarantee it, Dr. Roselle. Call me Leon. Hey, stop kissing my wife! Only oh, on the cheek. What man could resist this feminine delight? Oh, you're so fortunate, Monsieur Kessel. I hope only you realize how fortunate you are. Oh, I'm sure he does. What about those awful dreams he's been having, Dr. Leon? Oh, so he dreams, everybody dreams. Uh, not to worry, dear lady. And you, miss your case, you take nice long walk after dinner, then no more telephones not working in your dreams, sir. Oh, that well, wasn't that wonderful. All you need is more exercise. Great. Just great. Uh, Madame Evie, uh, please wait in the outer office, dear lady. I uh, must have one moment with your husband. Of course. Goodbye, and merci. Merci to you. I must kiss your head. <laughs> uh, with your permission, of course. Go ahead. Mm. Au revoir. Doctor, you didn't... You much. are frustrated. <laughs> Mr. Fife, like that, you're frustrated? Get out of here! You are crazy! What a fiasco. You know, I thought maybe I was crazy. Crazy anyway to pay 50 bucks an hour to be told I was. <sighs> I just gave up. Went along as best I could. Then she did something else. And I decided to have it out with her once and for all. That night, I came home. Washed up. Went into the kitchen. Listen, Evie, I have to talk to you seriously. Oh, good. But not now, darling. I'm fixing dinner. Escargot or bourguignon? You, who wants fancy schmancy? Can't we ever just have hot dogs? You're overweight as it is, honey. Yeah, but now, look I here. I know, dear. You're being considerate. You're trying to save me work, but I enjoy doing it for you. I am not being considerate. I'm trying to talk to you. Evie, I'm not a baby. I'm not your child. I'm your husband. Of course you are, dear. What a silly thing to say. Girl, you treat me like a child. You embarrass me. Oh, I would never do that. I know you don't mean to, but you just don't seem to realize how humiliating... Hand me that big spoon, will you, darling? You want a little taste now? No, I don't want a little taste now. I want you to listen to me. Evie, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading for us. I am about at the end of my rope. Now, you've got to listen to me. I'm listening, dear. I wouldn't humiliate you for the world. Well, you do it all the time, and you did it again this afternoon when you brought my galoshes to the office. But it was raining. Drizzling. I'm a grown man, Evie. I have a right to get my feet wet if I want to. Oh, but you don't want to, do you? Yes, I do. I want to get my feet wet. Now, you are being childish. No, you are being childish. In fact, you're being infantile if you can't see what's wrong with bringing my galoshes to the office. If you can't or won't see that, you're hopeless. You're hopeless, and I can't take it anymore. I'm leaving. Dinner will be ready in five minutes. Well, enjoy it. I'm going out for a hamburger with French fried onions. And then I'm going to a hotel for the night. And in the morning, I'm going to see a divorce lawyer. If you're really running away from home, you'd better have dinner first. Goodbye, evil! You actually walked out on us? Yeah. But I went back. I had the hamburger and the onions, and and I dropped in at a drugstore for some antacid tablets. I was within a couple of blocks of our house when I heard the siren. My heart started pumping like mad. Somehow I knew the siren was for Evol. I got this dank feeling like my gut was just a big hole, and I was being sucked into it. By the time I got to the house, they were carrying her out. I grabbed hold of one of the medics. He, he told me she'd taken a whole bottle of sleeping pills. I rode with him to the hospital, and I paced the emergency waiting room while they pumped out her stomach. I, I hadn't tried to understand her. She, she'd lost her mother and father when she was a kid, and 
I guess she was scared she'd lose me, too. It was a long wait. And then when one of the doctors came to tell me she'd be okay, he looked at me like I was some kind of villain. Mr. Case? That's right. How is she, Doc? Is she all right? Well, fortunately, the ambulance got to her in time. You're a very lucky man, Mr. Case. Oh, yeah, I'll say. Your wife is a wonderful person. Her first thought was to protect you. The moment she regained consciousness, she said you were in no way to blame for what happened. Well, we had... It's just fortunate that someone called. A neighbor, perhaps. (laughs) You'll want to thank whoever it was. Oh, sure, sure. Can I see Evie now? Mm Mm-hmm. For a moment. Hi, Evie. I'm sorry, Lud. You're sorry. It's all my fault. No. It's mine. You were right. And I promise you, I'll try. I'll try not to love you so much. Well, that just tore me apart. What do you do with a woman like that? Well, did you ever thank the neighbor who called? And you know, I never could figure out who it was. Evie said she didn't know. When we got home, she told me again. She understood what I'd been trying to say and that things would be different. But they never were. I just tried to accept it as best I could. She just didn't have it in her to change. Well, we all have our hang-ups. I guess so. Maybe if I hadn't gone on the camping trip, but... Oh, Lord, how I wanted to go. I can't remember ever wanting anything so much, except maybe my first bicycle. There were ten of us, guys I used to pal around with in high school. Every year in September, we'd go up to the mountains for a weekend. But I hadn't gone with them since I was married, because Evie was afraid I'd get snake-bite or... Poison ivy or something. That year, though, Brad, my buddy, kept insisting. One night he dropped by the house unannounced to try to talk me into it. Maybe if he hadn't, everything would have been different. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of Love Spelled Backwards. Evol has welcomed Ludlow's friend, Brad, and is serving refreshments. Some more mint frappe, Brad. Don't mind if I do. Hey, this is just great. Old Lud here sure hit the jackpot when he got you. <laughs> I'm the lucky one to have him. Now, Evie, now, you sure wish you'd reconsider, Lud, and come along. You know, we always used to call ourselves a terrible ten, but without you, we're just the nasty nine. Why don't you go with them, darling? What? What'd you say, Evie? Why don't you go on the camping trip with your friends? It would be a nice change of pace for you. You've been working so hard. But I didn't I know you're worried about leaving me, but I'll be just fine. I'll wash my hair and hem up those curtains. The first thing I know, you'll be back. You mean it? Well, sure she means it. Like my Alice. Can't wait to get rid of me for a couple of days. I promise to keep all the doors and windows locked at night so I'll be perfectly safe. Sounds like she was trying to change. Yeah. She sent me off with a brave smile and the world's largest first aid kit. Golly, that was a beautiful spot. Only a couple of hours from town, but like a whole different world. I hadn't felt so good, so relaxed, and I don't know when. The air was crisp, and you could smell the pine trees, and I felt, well, how would you say it? Attuned. Attuned to the guys and the earth and the stars. Attuned to God Almighty. That sounds great. We were sitting around the fire that first night singing, and... Laughing and telling jokes. <laughs> okay, guys. Okay, therapy time. Our annual tell your pals what's bugging you session. 
Now, here's where the terrible ten let it all hang out. <laughs> Come on, Lud, you go first. It's only fair seeing you miss so many. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, fellas, but right now, nothing's bothering me. Right now, I'm the happiest guy in the whole world. Hey, what do you mean coming up here happy and making us all look bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got something to gripe about. My boss. You want to hear what he did to me? Yeah. Don't answer that guy. Well, he brings his punk kid in, tells me I should teach him how to run the repair department. I tell him, you want your son to run the repair department? That's fine, but count me out. I tell him, I'm not teaching nobody how to put me out of work. Hey, out of boy, Fred. So the yeah, boss, he, yeah. he says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's not putting me out of work. He doesn't really want Junior to run the place. He just wants him to think he's running it. Seems a kid can't hold a job, and the boss figured it's because he's got no confidence. Well, I'm about to enlighten him that what the kid really hasn't got is brains. But the boss gets real chummy, takes me out for a drink, and asks me to please as a special favor to help him out. He sure knows the way to your heart, old buddy. So now I got this nitwit on my hands, and with everything else I have to do, I got to keep an eye on him so as he doesn't get some cars wiring all fouled up and maybe kill somebody. Well, fellas, what do you think of that? Uh, you got trouble, all right. Yeah. Hey, look out! There's a car coming right at us. Turn! Turn! Get out of here! What the hell? Hey, that Holy mackerel, what a driver! Who the hell is it? Looks like my car. Let's my God, it is my car. Evie's at you. Oh, my what are you doing here? What's the matter? What's wrong? That's all. Evie, come on, get out of the car. You all right? Oh, dear. Did I hurt anything? Just totaled our tent, that's all. <laughs> Besides scaring the pants off us. Oh, I'm sorry. Evie, what is it? Is it my dad? Did he have another attack? No, no, dear. Your daddy's okay. And if, if we were, I wouldn't come up here and ruin your weekend by telling you. Well, what happened? Can you put the tent back up, boys? Will it be all right? Well, we'll try. Yeah, no, Evie, it'll be okay. God's sake, are you going to tell me what you're doing here? Oh, I... I just came to bring you something you forgot. What did I forget? It's all right, dear. I brought them. Here. You know you have to take your vitamins. Vitamins? Well, a doll like that, I couldn't let her drive back all alone now, could I? Well, I guess not. Yeah. It was about... Two in the morning when we got home. We went into our cozy, neat-as-a-pin house that Evie had decorated so it looked like it could have been in a magazine. But that night, somehow, it, it seemed strange. Alien. As though I'd never seen it before. Evie said she'd fix me a nice, hot cup of milk. Then she came over, raised her lips for a kiss... I don't remember doing it. I don't remember my hands at her throat or her body going limp. I don't remember anything except a kind of wondrous sense of freedom. <laughs> Holiday. I'm begging you, don't let him strap me into that electric chair. I want to live. I want to live as long as possible. I, I can't die. Not yet. Well, you still haven't told me what made you change your mind. She came to me last night. Evil, she stood right there, right, right where you're standing. I could see her. I, I could see right through her. She spoke to me. She said, I forgive you, my dear. She said, I love you. I'm waiting for you. Oh, don't let me die. Don't let me
Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Love Spelled Backwards, was written by Marion Turk and produced and directed by Fletcher Marco. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Parley Bear and Virginia Gregg. Featured in the cast were Hans Conried, Larry Moss, Dawes Butler, and Barney Phillips. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Cicely Tyson, inviting you to join us tomorrow at this time for another story about love, the most unpredictable of human emotions. This is Vincent Price. I heard a story from a doctor friend of mine that was so incredible, I decided to ask him to tell it himself. Incidentally, he's a psychiatrist, and the story is about one of his young patients. Ordinarily, a doctor won't reveal case histories, but there's no one to be hurt by this story, and I am sure that he will tell it with discretion. As a matter of fact, I promised I wouldn't reveal his identity, so I've decided to call him Elihu Stone. If there are any Dr. Elihu Stones around, I assure you my choice of a name is purely coincidental. Anyway, he can tell the story better than I. Doctor? Thank you. No, my name isn't Elihu Stone, but I am a psychiatrist, and this story did happen. I've written a paper on it that will be published next month. Two years ago, I was a resident psychiatrist at the Angeles State Hospital. A young man was sent up to my office with what I thought were classic symptoms of chronic depression. For the sake of the story, let's call him Alvin Lorick. I, I, I don't sleep at night. I'm, I'm tired all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long would you say you've been feeling this way? Oh, about a year. Is there any reason why you think you should be depressed? Yeah. Would you like to talk about it? I can't. I understand. No, 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 you don't understand. Alvin, you were sent here because you need help. Right now, you may not be able to tell me what's troubling you, but maybe when we get to know each other better... I, 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 I want to tell you, but, but I can't. He'll hear us. He? Who's he? Have you got a pencil and paper? I handed him a pencil piece of paper and he began to write with his left hand. He'd hardly begun when his right hand pulled the pencil from the other and snapped it in half. I, I told you, he, he won't let me. And, and he won't let me talk either. Who is he, Alvin? Tell me. I'm going to tell you. He can't stop me. I'm go 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 his right hand suddenly stiffened and became a claw that quickly clutched at his throat. While his left hand tried helplessly to remove it. Lying in front of me was a human being, very much in the act of trying to strangle himself with his own hand. What's more, he was doing a pretty good job of it. A patient who is serious about inflicting injury on himself wouldn't use his bare hands as an instrument of destruction. I decided not to interfere with his charade since I doubted that he could injure himself seriously. I watched him as he lay writhing on the floor. Suddenly, he lay motionless. His hands fell limp beside his body, and his breathing almost stopped. Red marks appeared on either side of his neck, and his eyelids flickered lightly. Whether or not he was in a true state of unconsciousness, I couldn't immediately determine. I picked up the two halves of the pencil he broke in a paper beside it. Before he had stopped himself, he'd written the letter I, and then K-I-L. The last letter trailed jaggedly off the end of the paper. I... Kill. Someone in that young man's body was trying to tell me something.
And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Man Who Talked to Himself by Shepard Mankin. Our stars, Lou Horn, Mary Jane Croft, and Mr. Mankin as Cliff Sager. A young man lies unconscious in front of Dr. Ella Hugh Stone. By his own hand, with his own strength, a patient has attempted self-strangulation. Dr. Stone continues. Well, that isn't what I thought at the time. Actually, I suppose that the man was putting on a show for my benefit. Either that was the case or there were two distinct people living in this young man. Schizophrenia, a, a double personality. But that kind of theatrical performance isn't unusual with people who are deeply disturbed. And I, I didn't think that he could inflict too much damage on himself with his bare hands. At any rate, stories should begin at the beginning. Alvin Lorick came to me for therapy after that first traumatic incident, and of course, his problems began long before the day he kept his appointment in my office. By his own account, he was a quiet, gentle person who seemed to have a closer-than-usual relationship with his father. Alvin, if we're going to fly those models, let's get out there before the day's over. Okay, Dad, I'm getting the fuel. And bring an extra plug. The plane won't fly if we can't fire up the motor. Right. Oh, where's Mom? She's still upstairs. You like eggplant? Mm, I can take it or leave it. That's what we're having for lunch. I made eggplant sandwiches. Oh, yeah. Well, you'd be surprised how good they'll taste when you're hungry. Eggplant sandwiches? Well, it was the only thing left in the fridge from dinner last night. I didn't want to bother your mom with our lunch. Now, listen, let's get out of here, or the whole day will be gone. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. Say goodbye to your mother. Goodbye, Mom. We're leaving. Bye. What time are you planning to be back? Should be back about four, Alice. Bye. Nothing's going to slip around back there, is it? No, I tied it down pretty good. Can't put a lead weight on a model airplane. Let's get moving. I hope it's not windy out there today. I'm not worried about wind. I just don't want anybody to be playing ball on the field. Well, we can always go to the far end. We won't bother anybody out there. Oh, hey, I forgot. Did you get new batteries for the remote control? Oh, relax. I took care of everything. I hope you're a better pilot today. Last time you nearly cracked us up in a tree. I'll be better. I can't be stupid forever. Well, it's tough. When the plane's coming right at you, all your control movements are in reverse. Mm, I like it better when it's going away from you. Then I feel like I'm in the pilot seat. Now... Dad? Are you all right? I, 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 I don't, don't know, Alvin. Well, well, pull the car over, quick. What's wrong, Dad? Get me home, Alvin. Quick. It was a surprise to everyone. Charles Lorick, Alvin's father, had suffered a heart attack. He had no previous symptoms of any coronary trouble, but according to Alvin, was the kind of person who didn't believe in going to doctors, even for a periodic checkup. Alvin got his father home. They hadn't driven very far, and he called the paramedics, who made arrangements immediately to have him transferred to a hospital, from which he was discharged some three weeks later. It was a frightening experience, but at least now Charles Lorick knew about his problem and was determined to take care of himself. Want another cup? No, I don't know what's in this stuff, but it sure ain't coffee. Well, if you don't like it, drink milk. I would, except it has to be skim milk. Just be thankful you're alive. Have you had enough? Yeah, thanks. Well, I've made a decision you folks might be interested in. Oh, what's that? I'm taking in a partner. A partner? Does that mean you won't own the business anymore? No, no, not exactly, Alvin. Cliff Seeger, an old competitor of mine, retired from the machine tool business about three years ago. Couldn't stand the boredom, and he's been trying to get back in ever since. Of course, he got a pile of money for his old outfit, but they don't want him back in the organization now. So, he's offered to buy into mine, and I think I'm going to take him in. Nobody knows machine tools like Cliff Seeger. Well, what'll that mean as far as what you take home every week? You mean money? Well, uh... 
think it'll be better for all of us. I don't know what made Cliff think he could retire at his age anyway. He's just over 45. He's got a lot of energy and good ideas. He was a formidable competitor, but I think he'll make a great ally. As far as money's concerned, we'll be a lot better off. Just the interest on what he's paying to buy in ought to keep you in furs indefinitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sounds like you should have done this a long time ago. Yeah, it sure does, doesn't it? You know, maybe this is the best thing that could have happened to me. If I take care of myself, I could live another hundred years. God forbid. What's the matter? Do you have any objections to my living a long life? No, it's just that you'll be spending a lot more time at home now. Oh, gee, Dad, that'll be terrific. It'll be fine, just as long as you keep out from underfoot. Between the two of you, it's all I can do to wipe up after you. Here, Alan, help me take the dishes in the kitchen. We can't expect your father to be doing much around here anymore. And so, little by little, Alvin painted a picture of his mother as a woman in her early 40s, probably attractive, and not overly given to showing affection to either him or his father. It was at the beginning of the sixth session together when Alvin suddenly seemed to fall into a state of deep catatonia. His body became rigid, his gaze fixed. I waited for a moment, and then he came alive as suddenly as he froze, and his story continued. He wasn't supposed to be working this hard anymore. He was supposed to be having more free time. Well, what do you want me to do about it? He's your father. You know more about what's going on with him than I do. He likes flying model airplanes as much as I, and he hasn't found time to go out to the field in three weeks. He's busier now than before he got sick. Well, he's putting a partnership together. He wants me to meet this Cliff Seeger, bringing him home tonight. What do you think's my opinion's worth? I don't know. Uh, put on a clean shirt. We may not think much of Mr. Seeger, but there's no reason for him to think you come from a dirty family. Look presentable when you come back. Coming. Hi, honey. This is Cliff Seeger. Hello. Come on in, Cliff. Make yourself to home. What can I get you? Oh, a little bourbon and water be fine. You got it. Won't you sit down, Mr. Seeger? My friends call me Cliff. Cliff? I think we'll be seeing quite a bit of each other. Well, I hope so. Charles didn't tell me he had a beautiful wife. Oh, well, thank you. He didn't say much about you, either. Oh, he must have said something. I hope some of it was good. He certainly didn't tell me you were a lady killer. I don't don't know what to say. I bought you a glass of wine, Alice, and your bourbon and water, Cliff. I'd like to make a toast to us, to all of us, for a long and prosperous... Hi, Dad. Oh, Alvin, just in time. We're just about to make a toast. Oh, I'm sorry I interrupted that. This is my son, Alvin, Cliff. Hello, Alvin. Hello. You can take a sip from my glass, Alvin. Now, where was I? All right. I propose a toast to a long and successful... <laughs> Dad! We'll go catch him! Oh, my God. Dad! Dad! Wait a second, son. He's dead. Get away from him! Just get away from him! The death of someone close brings a response that's unlike any other. Aside from our own agony and longing, there's a tendency to remember the last days of the deceased and feel sorrow for his torment. But why do we pity the dear departed who feel no pain or anguish or deprivation? It's the living who are deprived and who often bear the guilt of not having done or said all the acts and phrases too late considered. Dr. Stone? After the funeral, Alvin confined himself to his room and locked the door. What happened then seemed as natural to him as it was incredible to me. As the story continued on his twelfth session of therapy, Alvin suddenly became two people, two separate sides of his own personality. (laughs) There's nothing you can do about it. He was my only friend. His business was his friend. You were part-time. I miss him. Sure you miss him. You'll get over it. No. No, I won't. Why don't you grow up? Leave me alone. 
You can't be left alone. You're just a kid. <laughs> oh, Dad. Dad. What am I going to do? <laughs> Alvin, are you all right? I'm all right. Tell her to get lost. She doesn't care if Dad's dead. Are you sure? Why did you lock the door? I just want to be alone, that's all. I do wish you'd unlock the door, dear. Oh, please go away, Mother. I don't want to talk. Will you unlock the door? Why don't you come in the living room? It's no good to be alone when you're feeling the way you do. I don't want to be with anyone right now. We all feel the same way you do, Alvin. Come on in the living room and be with the family. How can you say you feel the way I do? You're a fine one to say that. Ever since I can remember, you wanted to be away from us. When was the last time we ever did anything together? You have no right to talk to me that way, Alvin. Not now. I don't want to talk to you anyway. Just go out and leave me alone. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt yourself in a way that you won't be able to fix. I don't want to hear about it. I'm trying to tell you I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you, your pain. I want to be closer to you. You used to call me a chip off the old block. Is it that you don't feel that way anymore, Mother? Or maybe that the old block is dead and buried? The chip's become a splinter that sticks and hurts and wants getting rid of. Oh, Alvin, now just stop doing this to yourself. Please try to understand, if not me, then yourself. There were so many little cuts and stings you've long since forgotten. You can't remember them, Alvin, because time's erased them. In time, the tears for this grief won't come as easily, and finally they won't come at all. You'll forget the bad things. Believe me, you'll forget. I'll never forget. You better know that. I couldn't mean any more to you than he did, so don't give me any more of your sympathy. You go back in the living room and tell all my dear relatives that I died too, and that they can take back their cakes and fruit and well wishes and get the hell out of this house. I don't want their mourning, and I don't want their happy medicine. He was my father. And he was my friend. And I am not forgetting. Not ever. The resolve to be unhappy isn't unusual. You've all heard the expression, he isn't happy unless he's miserable. Well, there are people like that. There are many reasons why these compulsions arise. In Alvin's case, it seemed his determination to prolong his own anxiety stemmed from a resolve to get even in one way or another. He remained in his room for three days after the funeral, taking no food or drink and refusing all solace. How long are you going to stay in here? I don't know. You look like hell. Well, who cares? I do. You're going to kill yourself. I wish you wouldn't take me with you. No. <laughs> Not you care about anything. I care as much as you do, jerk. I just forget the whole thing, right? Be happy and drown your suffering in a glass of milk. Well, what do you think I ought to do? What do you mean, what do I think you ought to do? You're hungry enough, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, nothing. You're starving to death. Now go wash your stupid face and go in and eat something. She'll be watching me. Maybe there are other people in the living room. Big deal. What are you supposed to do, make a good impression? What do you care about what anybody thinks? Well, I, I don't, except it's embarrassing. Boy, you really are a jerk. They're the ones who ought to be embarrassed. They never came over when Dad was alive. Yeah, you're right, you know. Th th those people don't mean anything to me. I'm telling you. They just came over to see some misery. People eat that stuff up. If you're smart, you won't give them the satisfaction. Let them think you got over the whole thing. And if you're going to get even with someone... You don't show them you're weak. Yeah, you're right. Let's go. Thank you for coming over, Mrs. Kenny. I wouldn't know what to do without people like you. Oh, well, that's what neighbors are for, Alice. If you need anything, I'm only two houses down. Thank you for the wine. <laughs> well, I never like to come empty-handed. You stupid old pig. Hey, not so loud. He doesn't have to know you're listening in the hallway. I'm sure you'll be all right, Mrs. Kenny. Well, you just tell him I ask about him, Alice. Oh, it's nice seeing you again, Mr. Seeger. Nice seeing you too, Mrs. Kenny. What's he doing here? I'm glad you'll be looking after things. Alice is lucky to have you. Well, thank you very much. We'll do our best. What the hell does he mean by that? Where'd he come from? Oh, well, I suppose she means well. Irrepressible. Well, she's big anyway. <laughs> Anyone else coming over? Not that I know of. Can I fix your drink? 
I'd like a little of Mrs. Kenny's wine. What's he doing here? Here we go. She's right, you know. Who? About what? Mrs. Kenny. I'm very lucky to have you. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. It's been wonderful. You're coming over like this? I think I would have, no matter what happened. Thank you, anyway. What are you going to do about him? Alvin, I don't know. I don't understand it. He's very much like Charles was, only now... What? Uh, he frightens me. Oh, bingo. I think you made an impression. How do you mean he frightens you? No, I don't know. I just get the feeling he holds me responsible for Charles' death. Oh, that's ridiculous. It's a hard time for you both. But I'm sure that's all in your imagination. I don't think so, Cliff. I'm very worried about him. Cliff? Now it's Cliff. Oh, boy, ain't that cozy. Well, don't worry about it. We'll work something out for the boy. I just wish he'd come out of that room. It gives me the creeps. I'm glad he's in there. Oh, please don't, Cliff. I can't help it. I wanted you the minute I saw you. I'll kill him! Keep cool, man. Don't act like a damn kid. I want you to, Cliff. But it's not right. Of course it's right. If it's what we both want. But I mean, Alvin's in the house. What if he came in here? He's been in his room for three days. Why would he come out now? I don't know. But why don't I go to his room and check? I don't want you to leave me for a second. <laughs> I'll be right back, silly. I'll kill him! I swear I'll kill him! <laughs> One time or another, we've all made amateur attempts at psychoanalysis. We've heard ourselves tell people, it's all in your mind, or you've got to get your head on straight, and probably the most popular, he's got an inferiority complex. But our ideas about people's mental states are guesses for the most part. They're based on personal experience, and few of us have any idea of what really makes people the way they are. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Stone again. That's not entirely correct either. If a person sheds tears, one doesn't have to be an analyst to know that he's either got something in his eye or he's unhappy. But if neither of the above is true, then the reason for the tears becomes a little more difficult to explain. I didn't need a medical degree to understand Alvin Lorick's disturbance when he overheard Cliff Seeger, a virtual stranger, attempt to make love to his mother three days after his father died. He felt an instant surge of anger that gave way to brooding and an obsessive plotting to get even. How he was going to accomplish this wasn't clear to either of his personalities, especially when his concentration was interrupted. What is it? Alvin, we want to talk to you. We? Cliff and I. Alvin, please open the door. What do you want? I want to be your friend. Mr. Seeger said he hoped you could be friends. Thanks. You mind if I sit on the bed? I suppose you know I'm taking over your father's business, Alvin. He and I signed papers before he... Uh, before... Before he be died, you can say it. Before he passed away. My father didn't pass away, Seeger. His heart stopped and he died. Mr. Seeger is only trying to be kind, Alvin. Oh, yeah? Well, if he wants to be kind, he knows what he can do. Look, now, I don't want to fight with you, Alvin. I came in here to try to help I understand why you resent me, and I don't think there's anything I can do to prevent that, but arguing over something that can't be changed isn't productive, and I don't enjoy wasting time. All right, well, what, what do you want? I want you to look at your situation logically and constructively. There are certain things that no one can do anything about, and you've got to accept the fact that your father's gone and that you're going to have to continue without him. Oh, I'm going to go on without him, Mr. Seeger. I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. Oh, I'm glad to hear you talk that way. People have to survive, Alvin. They can't constantly involve themselves with the past. If your father saw how you were behaving this past week, he would have been very unhappy. What do you know what would have made my father happy? How would you know anything about him? I don't know why you're feeling so bitter about me. Is it my fault your father died? No, but you're sure not crying a lot about it. Is she, Mr. Seeger? How your mother felt about your father is a very personal thing that even you can't know about, Alvin. The hell I don't. She never kept her feelings to herself in her whole life. 
My father knew she didn't give a damn about him. How would you know that? What do you know about your father and me? Uh, I know what I know. I think that when you're old, Alvin, you look back at this time with a lot more understanding than you have now. I don't have to look back, Mr. Seeger. I can see everything very clearly right now. All right, Alvin. I won't argue the point. The reason I wanted to talk to you was to see if you'd be interested in working at the plant. Now, maybe only on Saturdays right now, but when you get out of school, you might be thinking of a career in machine tools. Your father would have liked that. Boy, you, you two are something, you know? What do you think I am, a moron? Now, where do you come off telling me what my father would have liked? You knew him even less than my mother, Seeger. And I've got nothing to say to either of you. Uh, but I'll tell you this. I know what's going on between the two of you. And that's something my father wouldn't like. Now, what do you think of that? I think, I think you've got one hell of an imagination, kid. Oh, is that so? How dare you imply such a thing. Why are you doing this, Alvin? Because I'm crazy. <laughs> Everybody says so, right? I I'll dare anything. Like right now... Would you get out of my room because I got a lot of thinking to do? I know you'll both understand. It's the kind of thinking you'd like, Mr. Seeger, because it's going to be productive. And, Mother, you should know that what I'm thinking is an idea that would make Daddy very happy. Not too bright. Mm -mm, not too bright. Oh, you're smart. You really are, you know. You always come in when it's all over. I keep hoping you'll be able to handle things. I can't help it. I get excited. Yeah, well, learn to control yourself. Anyone can take a look at you and read guilty all over your face. Okay, so so i got to learn to be calm. Well, you haven't got much time to do it. Will you get off my back? No, I won't. Because if you blow everything, I get my butt roasted. Oh, come on, give me a break. How do you like that, Seeger? <laughs> He's going to give you a job in your own business. Well, it is yours. Dad would have wanted you to have it. I hate him. And your mother. How dare you imply she's fooling around with Cliffy, baby. I've got to get rid of them. What do you think they're talking about out there? I don't know. Why don't we get to where we can hear them and try to control yourself? Now, quiet now. You're making more noise than I am. I tell you, he knows something. He's guessing, I tell you. How could he know anything? He hasn't been out of that room in two weeks. I just feel it. He knows. Even if he has no proof, he knows. His father is in him. He just knows intuitively. Oh, you're not being rational. Whether I am or not isn't important. I I don't think we ought to be seeing each other in this house. All right. If it'll make you more comfortable, I won't come here for a while. Just until... Shh. Alvin? Alvin, is that you? Yes, it is, Mother. How long have you been standing there in the hall? Now, listen, Alvin, you don't have to come to any wrong conclusions. All right, so your mother and I have been seeing each other, but I promise you nothing serious is going on. Alvin, Cliff is my friend. He's your friend, too. If you weren't so blind, you'd see that. He only wants to help us, and we need help. Stop looking at me that way. You're just like your father when you look at me that way. For heaven's sake, say something, Charles. Oh, my God. God. Alice, stop it. Stop it this oh, minute. It's him, Cliff. It's Charles. That's not Alvin standing there. Stop it, Alice. Of course it's Alvin. Oh. Of course it is, Mommy. Oh. I just look like Daddy. Daddy's dead. I'm your little boy, Alvin. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of The Man Who Talked to Himself. A heaviness surrounds the Lorek house, a changing atmosphere documented by uncut grass and overgrowing shrubs. Two weeks have passed since the Charles Lorek funeral, but his son, Alvin, will not be consoled. This is Dr. Stone again. I think the death of his father and the knowledge of his mother's imminent infidelity literally shook the foundation of Alvin's mental stability. His only thoughts now were to find a way of revenge. His mother, Alice, feeling remorse and a genuine maternal attachment, continued trying to reason with him. How long are you going to sit there like that, Alvin? Why can't you believe I want to help you? Do you realize you've been looking out that window for two days? What's going to become of you? 
Please speak to me. Oh, Lord, I know I haven't been much of a mother, but you never knew what, what I was going through. You don't have to look at me that way. What was I supposed to do living alone in the house with the two of you? Yes, living alone. What did you think I was doing all the time you and your father were in the garage building those damn model planes? And what do you think I was doing all those weekends while the two of you were on the ball field flying them? I never made friends easily, you know that. Not friends of my own. Your father and I knew people together, of course we did, but... Everyone thought we were such a nice couple. Well, they didn't know. No one knew. He smoked those cigars. When the business started going well, he started smoking cigars. You know what he said to me once? You weren't even born yet. You know what he said to me? Alice, he said. You know what cigars smell like? They smell like money. Uh, well, the house smelled like cigars, and he smelled like cigars, and my bed smelled like cigars. <laughs> when I asked him to stop, he said, Get used to it, honey. I don't tell you what dress to put on. <laughs> and then there were his out-of-town conventions for ten days at a time without so much as a phone call to find out how I was. <laughs> Oh, thank heaven, you're a man, Alvin. You'll never know what it means to have someone force his attentions on you. When you were born, he gave you everything he might have given me. I never knew the love and kindness you got from him. One night, he bent over to kiss you, and the ash from his cigar fell on your face. It was hardly a burn at all because he brushed it off right away. But it was enough to make you cry. He never smoked after that. Threw out an entire box of hand-rolled Cuban cigars. Lord knows where he got them. But he paid enough for them. Just threw them out. Tossed them in the spinning garbage disposal one by one, with the water running as though he was performing a holy ritual against the spirit that injured his son. Oh. But he was cold with me, Alvin. I don't know why he hated me so, but after a time it didn't matter because I, I grew to hate him too. I could never forget the loneliness and the stale stink of tobacco that saturated those first years. And then the countless nights. I cried long into the morning, wondering where I could run, hoping one of us would die and free the other. And it happened, Alvin. He died. I don't have to wish anymore. I'm free. And you can look at me with his eyes all you like, because I'm not sorry. And I'm not crying anymore. Now you keep away from me, Alvin. I'm not afraid of you. Don't you look at me that way. You're crazy, do you know that? Alvin, you stay away from me. <laughs> Okay, you know what you've got to do. So I do it, and then what? Seeker's got all the papers to the business. Well, that doesn't seem like much of a problem. Two can die as cheaply as one, and it's all yours. But how do I do it? I, I, I don't want to get caught. We'll figure something out, Alvin. We won't get you into trouble. After all, if you get caught, so do I. I wouldn't like that at all. But you you got to figure a way so I won't be near him when it happens. Naturally. In the car, they'd be together. Two birds with one stone, as far away as possible. But how can we be in control and not be there? Control? 
Control, of course. M model airplane controls. Do it by radio control. Right. Oh, boy, you're not as dumb as you look. <laughs> we can do it from the bedroom window and watch it all happen. <gasps> Beautiful. But what can we use for an explosive? How about gasoline? No, not the tank, but how about one of those plastic bags that seal up like a zipper? That would work. We, we could put it under the front seat. How are we going to blow it up? The model airplane remote unit. If the rudder control broke the bag of gasoline, the elevator control could set off a photo flash bulb. Break the glass away from the bulb so the flash is out in the open and... Right! <laughs> Goodbye, Mother dear. <laughs> Goodbye, Cliff, darling. <laughs> Alvin described the following night when Seeger came to take Alice to dinner. Alvin said he stood in the driveway hidden in the shrubbery. Seeger rang the doorbell. Hello, you're early. I know. Come on in. I'll fix drinks before we go. Alvin rushed from his hiding place into the street. He unscrewed the cover from the air valve that left rear tire with a small instrument and removed it. The wheel slowly sank onto the flattened tire. Alvin ran to the back door of the house, climbed upstairs to his room, and he waited. Through his open window was a commanding view of the street below. Before long, he heard his mother's voice. Goodbye, Alvin. We're leaving now. Don't forget to lock the front door. I won't, Mother. Night. Night. With the curtain, he saw his mother and Seeger get into the car. Pulled forward 50 feet and then stopped. Seeger got out, saw the flat tire, and backed the wobbling car to where it had been at the curb in front of the house. That's crazy. Stupid thing was all right five minutes ago. Oh, it doesn't matter, Cliff. Honestly, let's keep the dinner reservations. We'll take my car, and then when we get back, I'll call the club, and they'll have the tire fixed in no time. Okay, but I don't feel very macho having to use your car. <laughs> Billy, you can drive if you like. Beneath him, the garage door opened. Lorik's car backed out of the street. His heart pounding. Alvin said he held the model airplane transmitter in his hands. As the automobile approached the stop sign at the corner, Alvin slowly pressed the lever marked rudder forward. The car stopped, then started. With a decisive jerk, Alvin diverted the lever marked elevator and held it rigidly. Alvin said he heard a dull boom and saw a red glow in the sky. Very good, Alvin. <laughs> what do you think of that, Dad? Who are you talking to, stupid? He can't hear you. He's dead. But you never can tell. He might be able to hear. You can believe that if you want to. Personally, I'm starving all of a sudden. You hungry? Oh, you know I am. Why don't we raid the fridge like we used to with Dad? Alvin? <gasps> that was a stupid thing you did, Alvin. You shouldn't have done that, Alvin. You! you you're dead! You, you're both dead! Not quite, Alvin. You, you're burning out there on the street! Why are you doing this to me? Why aren't you out there? Why aren't you burning like you're supposed to be? Why aren't you burning? The amazing fact in cases of double personality is that patients are actually able to see the results of what they've prepared without it ever happening. Alice and I started for the restaurant only minutes after I arrived, and I thought it strange that one of my tires would go flat in that period of time. But we changed cars anyway. Just before I got into Alice's car, though, and purely by luck, I noticed a small silver wire... An antenna on the right rear fender. I didn't know what it was. So I, I, I took a closer look, and I found a tiny wire leading from it into the car and under the driver's seat. He'd put one of his radio control machines and a bag of gasoline under the seat. He was going to burn us alive. It's all right, Alice. He's in good hands now. <laughs> Alvin's been sick for a long time, but he's going to be all right, isn't he, Doctor? Well, I have to be honest with you, Mr. Seeger. I don't know. When will I be able to see him? I'm afraid that won't be possible for a long time. You see, he really believes he killed you. The shock of seeing you once again would only set us back. <laughs> The 
Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Man Who Talked to Himself, was written by Shepard Mencken and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Lou Horn, Mary Jane Croft, and Shepard Mencken. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Peggy Ray, and Barney Phillips. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us again tomorrow at this time for another portrait of people in love and sometimes in trouble. This is Vincent Price. Have you ever had one of those days where nothing goes right from the moment you first wake up? Len Doyle is having just such a day. First he overslept. Then there was no hot water for his shower. He nicked himself shaving, popped a button on his shirt, lost a cuff link, and broke a shoelace. Len would like nothing more than to crawl right back into bed. And he would. If only... Len! Len, hurry up! You're going to miss your plane! I know, Helen, I know. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. Where, where's my breakfast? Don't, don't I get any breakfast? Here, orange juice and a piece of toast. Oh, but... You'll have to eat it on the way. Look, you I'm... haven't got time, Len. Oh, all right. Have you got my plane ticket? Yes, and your bag's in the car. Now, let's get going. Wait, I, I think I hear the telephone. Let it ring. Oh, I better answer it. It might be the office. You get the car. Hello? And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Long Distance by Steve Sharon. Our stars, Janet Waldo and Lou Horn. Len Doyle. A young Denver real estate appraiser is just leaving for the airport when the phone rings. Len is already in danger of missing his flight, but he goes back to answer the phone on the chance that the call may be important. Hello? Hello. Hello, Leonard. Aunt Gertrude? Uh, is that you? Yes, dear. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. But I'm afraid I can't talk to you right now. I'm on my way to St. Louis. On business, actually. But <laughs> Well, you've spoiled the surprise. You see, I was going to stop by to visit you while I'm in town. Oh, I've got to go now, Aunt Gertrude. Helen's waiting for me in the car. I'll call you as soon as I arrive in St. Louis. And don't worry about picking me up at the airport. I'll get a cab. Leonard, wait. You mustn't fly. It isn't safe. Do you hear me? You mustn't fly to St. Louis. Yes, dear. Now, now, don't worry. I'm sure I'll be fine. Oh, I've got to go. I'll see you this afternoon. Leonard, wait! Bye! I'm coming, I'm coming! You didn't say who called. Oh, it... It was Aunt Gertrude. Aunt Gertrude? Yeah, can you beat that? 
Here I am on my way to St. Louis thinking what a surprise it'll be when I show up at her door. And she calls me right before I leave. <laughs> anyway, I told her I was coming. Oh, why? You still could have surprised her. Mm, yeah, but it wouldn't have been the same. Ah, it was good to hear the old girl's voice again, but her timing sure could have been better. <laughs> now I am really late. Oh, the traffic's not that bad. We'll make it. Did she say why she called? Well, there really wasn't time to chat. Oh, but when I told her I was coming, she said not to fly. You're kidding. <laughs> I didn't I ever tell you? It, it all started when Amelia Earhart disappeared. Oh. Yeah, ever since then, Gertie has been afraid to fly. <laughs> That's why she took the bus to Denver for our wedding. Oh, I love your aunt. She's such a character. Yeah. I've been thinking about her a lot lately. You know, she's the only family I've got left. I worry about her being all alone. If we both didn't have jobs here, I'd move back to St. Louis. Lan, why don't you ask Aunt Gertrude to move to Denver? She can live with us. We got plenty of room. Do you mean that? Why not? I'm home most of the day working on my illustrations. I could use the company. Besides, it'd be a real hoot having someone like Aunt Gertrude around. You know, if you weren't driving this car, I would give you the biggest kiss. Shall I pull over? Oh, don't tempt me. <laughs> We're late enough as it is. <laughs> Union flight 319 for Chicago, now boarding at gate 24. Here's your ticket. Oh, yeah. I can't go anywhere without that. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll see you in two days. Uh, mm. Well, you better hurry. Bye. So call me when you get to St. Louis. Yeah, I will. Dr. Williams, please report to the Union Airline desk. Oh, hey, excuse me. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh... A uh, flight 405 to St. Louis. Has it left yet? 405. Yes. Well, uh, no, that leaves in three minutes. Oh, but it can't. I I'm supposed to be on it. Look, here's my ticket. Well, we ask our passengers to check in at least a half hour before departure, Mr. Uh, Doyle. Yes, I know that, but, but I overslept. Look, I've got to get to St. Louis. Well, we do have a later flight. Oh. I see. Yes, yes, leaves at 1142. Oh. Shall I reserve a seat for you? No, no. I have a business appointment this morning. Look, can't you call and make them hold the plane? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but that's against company policy. Well, isn't there any way I can get on that flight? Well, there's always a chance of a delay while the passengers are boarding, but you'll have to run for it if you're going to make it. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Doyle, your ticket. Uh, do you have any baggage? No. Oh, uh, yes, this overnight bag. Well, you can carry that on board. Oh, please hurry. There you are. Thanks. Have a nice flight. Global flight 201, now arriving from Mexico City at gate 12. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me, please. Why don't you look where you're going, fella? I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me. Can I get by? I'm, I'm, I'm late. Ex excuse me. Hold it. Huh? Just where do you think you're going? Uh, 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 gate 37. Uh, I'm on the flight for St. Louis. Uh-uh, not till you go through the metal detector. Oh, yes, of course, but, but, but I'm already late. Mister, everybody goes through the metal detector, no exception. Yes, I understand that, and I'm perfectly willing to go through it if you'll just hurry up. You see the, all these people here? They're all waiting to go through, just like you, only they were here first. So, if you just step to the end of the line... Oh, but I'm late. That's not my fault. Just step to the end of the line. But I have to... To the end of the line. Oh, great. Just great. Gertie, I love you dearly, but why? Why did you have to call this morning? I beg your pardon. <laughs> Oh, 
We interrupt to bring you this special news bulletin. Union Airlines Flight 405 bound for St. Louis has crashed on takeoff from Denver's Stapleton <gasps> International Airport oh. only minutes ago. Lynn! Lynn! No! <laughs> A frantic rush to the airport, a quick farewell. And now Helen Doyle hears on her car radio the painful news that she may have said goodbye to her husband for the last time. And police and fire officials have closed off the area. The number of passengers aboard the flight is not known at this time, but Union Airline officials are expected to release the information shortly. This latest tragedy brings the number of airline crashes this year to a total of... Uh, I've, I've got, to, got to get back to the airport. Find out. Give you any information please, around here. Please, I, I, can't you tell me anything about my I need husband? Some information. His name is Doyle. Leonard Doyle. I, I'm sorry, madam, but. Well, what about I, my partner, George Baker? Is, is there any news about him? Is my yes, daughter, right. Julia Warren, on your passenger well, list? Now, me... She was supposed to leave for school today. I'll see you like you. I, I can't remember what uh, flight she was on. But please, madam, the oh. airline's doing the best it can. Oh, if you please, were doing your I've best, no. this wouldn't have happened. I'm sorry, no, I didn't mean it. Well, I know, I know how hard this must be on all of you, but we are trying to find out as much as we can about the accident and who was involved. So please, folks, will you please will be you patient? Please check as quickly as possible. Well, now, uh, when do you suppose they're going to tell us? I... I, I don't know. Computers. That's the trouble. Getting computers to talk. Yes, I, I suppose so. It's, uh, it's your partner you're waiting to hear about, is it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not quite the same as you waiting to hear about your husband, but... My husband! That's what I mean. It's not the same, of course. Is it? That man in the phone booth over there. Huh? Yes, it is. Excuse me. Oh. Oh. Oh, it is. Oh, it sure is. Oh, yes, that house is jacket. You can see the lamb, all right. Lamb. Lamb. Helen. Oh. Oh, thank God. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh. oh it's... it's it's all right. I'm alive. I'm, it's all right now. Oh, I, I, I thought you were dead. I know, I know. I was praying you hadn't heard. Oh, I've been calling the house again and again. Radio. There was no answer. They would, they would tell me if you were on board. I, I was too late for the flight. I ran as fast as I could, but I was too late. No, it's all right now. It's all right. Oh, I'm so glad I was too late. Please don't go to St. Louis. No, no, of course I won't go. I'll stay. I'll stay. I won't leave now. I don't ever want you to leave me. No, no. I'm feeling much better, Mr. Adams, really. Well, it's just that under the circumstances, I think it's better if I didn't go to St. Louis right now. That's quite all right, Len. I understand. Uh, You see, I I promised Helen I'd stay with her. And to tell you the truth, I'm... I'm not too crazy about flying anywhere right now. I don't blame you. All of us here at the office are just relieved that you weren't aboard that flight. Yeah. You know, it hasn't quite hit me yet, just just how close I came to... Well, anyway, uh, if it's all right with you, I, I'd like to take the rest of the week off. You take all the time you need, Len, and don't worry about St. Louis. The appraisal can be postponed. Now, I'll call and let them know the situation. Oh, thanks, Mr. Adams. You just take care of yourself and and, and give my best to Helen. I will. Thank you. Uh, I'll see you Monday. Bye-bye. Oh, 
I guess it gave Mr. Adams quite a shock when he heard about the crash. But he's glad I'm safe. Oh, and uh, I have the rest of the week off. Oh, good. I think you can use it. Oh, we can both use it. Uh, Helen, turn up the volume on the TV. I want to see if they've got anything more on the crash. Oh, okay. The cause of which is still under investigation by Federal Aviation Authorities. Meanwhile, Union Airlines has released a list of the passengers on board Flight 405. There were no survivors in the crash. Those poor people. Of those names now appearing on your screen, all but six were residents of the Denver, Colorado Springs area. Helen, look. What? My name. It's on that list. Oh, no. Oh, where's the number of that airline? But how, how, how could they make such a mistake? Well, you gave them your name at the airline, didn't you? Well, of course I wanted to find out if you were... Well, a... with all the confusion, they probably think you're still there with the other relatives. That you've already been notified. And we forgot to tell them you were too late to board the plane. Ah, here it is. <laughs> Helen, see if there's any more news about the passengers. Oh, hello? Union Airlines. Yes. Uh, I'd like to speak to and someone in charge of releasing information about the are being allowed to continue crash. as scheduled. Yes, sir. In other uh, news, the Middle Leonard East Doyle, situation took a positive step to forward today. Both Israeli and Egyptian sources confirm that negotiations are continuing, <sighs> and an agreement is that. pending. Yes. I, yeah, I understand. And, and I'm sorry for the mix-up, too. Yeah, it, it was my fault. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the airline is going to notify the wire services and the local news media to have my name taken off the list. Oh, good. I just hope they can correct it before our friends see it. Otherwise, you'll be deluged with sympathy calls. Len? Hmm? What about Aunt Gertrude? Holy smoke, I forgot. Oh, she'll have a heart attack if she hears about the crash. Oh. I'd better call. Oh, yes. There's no answer. Uh, I'll try again later. In the meantime, why don't we go out to dinner? It'll take our minds off what's happened. Oh, oh, I'd love to, but what if Aunt Gertrude phones while we're gone? Mm, we really ought to stay home just in case. Yeah, you're right. But I don't think you should have to cook dinner. No problem. I can reheat the spaghetti sauces in the refrigerator. Oh, but you'll have to go to the store and get some more spaghetti. <laughs> I will if you'll promise to lie down and take a nap before dinner. Oh. After what you've been through, I think you could use it. Mm. It's a deal. I'm so glad you called. We've been trying to telephone you. Um, th there, there's been a, a change of plans. Len won't be there until some other time. He, uh, he, he missed the plane. I told Leonard not to fly. Oh, yes. Yes, you did, didn't you? Oh, it's a good thing he wasn't on that plane, because... I'd better let Len tell you about it when he gets back. I sent him to the store to get some spaghetti for dinner. Are you still cooking on that old stove I gave you? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we are. You shouldn't cook on that stove. It isn't safe. It's too old. Oh, nonsense. It has character. Besides, it uses gas. And nowadays, that's so much more economical. You take my advice, Helen. Don't use that old stove. <laughs> it isn't safe anymore. Oh, and Gertrude, I have to run. I smell something burning in the kitchen. Um, look, I'll have Len call you when he gets back, and we can have a nice long talk then, okay? Helen, don't you... Bye that. now. <sighs> because Len Doyle ignored his aunt's warning not to fly to St. Louis as he had planned, he just missed becoming a fatality in the crash of a jet airliner. 
And now his wife, Helen, has also received a warning. Honey, I'm back. You didn't say what size package I should get, so... So... What the... <coughs> Guess! Oh. Helen! Helen, where are you? Oh. <coughs> Helen! Oh, for God's sake, where are you? Helen! Helen! Wake up! Can you hear me? Wake up! Oh, oh I've got to get her out, outside! Another deep breath. That's it. That's it. Force all the gas out of your lungs. Oh, you feel any better? A little. Maybe I'd I better call a doctor. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'll... All right. Are you sure? Yes, yes. Oh, what happened? Oh, the flame on the stove burner must have blown out. Oh. I came back and the house was filled with gas. Oh. When you didn't answer, I thought it was too late. Oh, I was... I was taking a nap. <laughs> it's my fault. I I shouldn't have left the kitchen. But I I didn't think it would hurt to let the sauce simmer a while. Oh, it's that old stove. Oh. It just isn't safe anymore. Len, that that's just what Aunt Gertrude said. Aunt Gertrude? Yes, she called just after you left. I I told her you weren't coming to St. Louis. Did, did you tell her why? No. Why I thought you'd better explain that. Anyway, she she started telling me that the stove isn't safe and that I, I should be cooking on it. Well, she was certainly right about that. Well, now that Gertie knows I won't be coming, we don't have to stick around here and wait for her to call. We'll go to dinner and give the house a chance to air out. It's not as good as your cooking, but I'm too hungry to be picky. <laughs> oh, thank you, darling. You know, it's funny how your Aunt Gertrude knew about the stove. Well, it's an old stove. She was probably just surprised to find out we're still using it. Yeah, but don't you think it's strange that something should go wrong with it right after she called? Oh, it's just a coincidence. Maybe. And maybe not. I, I might believe it if, if it only happened once, but she also warned you not to fly in that plane. Remember? Helen... Gertie was hardly specific. I told you about that plain phobia of hers. I certainly don't think she's psychic, if that's what you're hinting at. Well, I'm just trying to make some sense out of all this, that's all. Has, uh, has your aunt ever shown any signs of being precognizant? Pre oh, sure. Oh? Yeah, when I was a kid. Aunt Gertrude used to read tea leaves. Oh. Oh, now let me see. Um, can I remember any of her predictions? Oh, tea leaves. That's hardly... She anything. said I was going to be tall. Oh. Well, I'm 6'3". She was right about that. Oh. And she said I was going to be handsome. Oh. <laughs> and I refused to admit she was wrong there. Lan, I am trying to be serious. Oh, and once when I was in high school, after I broke up with my girlfriend, she told me I would meet someone else. Her exact words were, Don't fret if you get stranded on the highway of love now and then, because there'll be another bus along in five minutes. <laughs> Very funny. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Aunt Gertrude is drinking a better brand of tea nowadays. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After all, most of her predictions did come true, especially the one about my being handsome. How would you like this salad in your lap? <laughs> Sorry, the number you have reached is not in service at this time. Please check your directory carefully and dial again. This is a recording. Oh, damn. What's the matter? That is the second time I've dialed Aunt Gertrude's number, and I keep getting a recording saying her phone is out of order. Well, maybe you better go through the operator. Mm. Um. Operator, may 
I help you? Yes, I'm having trouble getting through to a number. Could you please dial it for me? What's the number, please? It's long distance to St. Louis. Area code 314-555-2522. One moment, please. Thank you. I hope she has better luck. I'm sorry. The number you have reached is not in service at this time. Please check your directory carefully and dial again. Operator? Yes, sir. Now, I know that number is in service because I've received two calls from there today. Is there any way I can get through? I'm sorry, sir. The problem is at the St. Louis end of the line. It may be only temporary. I'll report it, and I suggest you try again in the morning. Uh, well, I guess I don't have much choice, do I? All right. Uh, thank you for your help. You're welcome. Oh, no luck, huh? Ah, the line's all screwed up. I'll have to try again tomorrow. Well, I wouldn't worry. At least we tried. Someone's at the front door. It's kind of late for visitors. Yeah. Leonard Doyle? That's right. Good evening. I'm Marion Haynes from the Denver Express. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the airline crash this morning. Oh, well, it's, it's pretty late. Uh, can it wait until tomorrow? I'm sorry about that, but I've got a deadline to meet for the morning edition. I tried to call, but... Yeah, uh, all right. Um, well, come on in. Thanks. It won't take long. Uh, this is my wife, Helen. How do you do, Mrs. Doyle? Hello, Miss Haynes. Uh, please sit down. Thanks. I suppose you know that the airline released a fatality list with your name on it this morning, Mr. Doyle. Uh, since you're obviously alive and well, can you explain how your name got on the list? You did check in at the Union Airlines desk this morning, didn't you? Yes, but I never actually got on the plane. You see, I was going to St. Louis on business. And we were just so happy to see each other that we forgot to tell the airline that I wasn't on the plane. I see. Well, that certainly clears up the discrepancy. Oh, uh, honey, mm. you didn't tell her about the call. Oh, you Helen. stopped to answer a phone call from your aunt. That's why you were late. Yes, you mentioned that. Oh, but uh, he didn't tell you that she warned him not to fly. Oh. And then this afternoon, she called no, uh, and... It, it was really nothing. Uh, uh, Helen seems to think my aunt's fear of flying is proof that she's psychic. Oh, well, thanks anyway, but I think I've got the angle I need. Now, I'd better be going if I want to meet my deadline. Thanks again for talking to me at such a late hour. Oh, that's okay. It was no problem. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Helen, I thought we had all that psychic business settled. Why'd you have to bring it up again in front of that reporter? She probably thinks we're a couple of kooks. Well, I'm sorry, Len, but it bothers me. Aunt Gertrude warned us twice, and both times she was right. I just think there may be more to it than coincidence. All right. If you really feel that way, why don't we drive to see Aunt Gertrude? Oh, do, you, do you mean it? Why not? I still have to go to St. Louis to make that land appraisal. Yeah? I can take care of business, and you can have your curiosity satisfied. <laughs> Besides, the drive will do us both good. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of... Long distance. Please check your directory carefully and dial again. This is... Damn. What's the matter? Oh, it's that stupid recording again. Oh. You'd think the phone company would have Gertie's telephone fixed by now. How am I supposed to let her know we're coming? Well, you wanted to surprise her. Anyway, we can always stop on the way and call her. Hey, did you put the bags in the car? Yeah. We can go as soon as you're ready. What's the matter? You look like you don't want to go. No. No, it, it's not that. I I, I, I want to go. Well, what then? Oh, don't tell me you're having second thoughts about this. You're the one that wanted to have your curiosity satisfied, remember? I know. It, it's just that I have those book illustrations to finish. So you bring your work with you. Uh, now, come on. Now, let's get out of here. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Helen, is Leonard there? 
Oh, Aunt Gertrude. Oh, yes, he's here. Oh, Aunt Gertrude, we were just trying to get you. We've been... Uh, just a minute. Hey, Len, it's Aunt Gertrude. Oh, good. L- l- let me talk to her. Hello, Aunt Gertrude? Yes, dear. It's me. Oh, I have had a heck of a time trying to reach you. Did you know your phone's been out of order? I've been very worried about both of you. Yes, and we've been worried about you. As a matter of fact, that's why Helen and I have decided to drive over to St. Louis for a visit. No, you mustn't drive. What? Why not? What's she saying? She doesn't want us to drive. It isn't safe to drive your car. Leonard, do you hear me? Don't drive your car. Uh, Yes, dear, I I hear you, but I don't understand. What makes you think something's wrong with the car? You must not drive your car, Leonard. Aunt Gertrude, how did you know about the plane and and about the stove? How how did you... Don't drive your car, Leonard. It isn't safe. But that's ridiculous. You you can't just... Hello? Hello? Oh, for crying out loud. What happened? She hung up. But what did she say? I don't know. Something about not driving the car. She said it isn't safe. Oh, Len. Oh, now, come on, Helen. You're not going to tell me we should take her advice seriously. Yes. Yes, I am. She she warned you not to get on that plane and about the stove. And what if she's right about the car, too? How could she be, honey? How could she know anything was wrong with the car when she's hundreds of miles away? But, but maybe... I, I know. I know she's psychic. Lan, what are we going to do? Hey, uh, Mr. Doyle, she's ready to roll. Have you checked everything thoroughly? Yes, sir. I went over this car of yours. From headlights to taillights, there ain't a thing wrong with her. Just needed a few bolts tightened here and there. Mm-hmm. You hear that, Helen? There is nothing wrong with the car. Aunt Gertrude didn't know what she was talking about. Well, maybe you're right. This, uh, Aunt Gertrude, she a mechanic? Oh, no, no. She's just an eccentric relative, I'm afraid. Uh, well, how much do I owe you? Oh, 30 bucks ought to cover it, plus an extra 10 for making me come out to your place to pick up the car. Hmm. All right. I just put it on this credit card. I'll get your receipt. Forty bucks. Just to prove to you that Gertie isn't psychic. And to prove it to yourself. Yeah, well, I'll have to admit. I was beginning to wonder. But that is all over with, right? Well, I, I don't know. Oh, Helen, believe me. The car has been checked out and everything is all right. But we can't let a few coincidences start to run our lives... If we do that, we might as well lock ourselves up in the house and never go out. Now, will you drive with me to St. Louis? You're right, Lynn. Let's go to Aunt Gertrude's. Mm, That's my girl. If I turn the radio off? Lan? Hmm? The radio. Can I turn it off? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Hey, you look sleepy. Do you want me to drive for a while? No, no. No, I can make it. We'll, uh... Uh, we'll stop at the next town and, uh, spend the night. Oh, good idea. I'll get the map out and see how far it is. Now, if I can, if I can get this, this flashlight to work. Just a minute. There. There we go. Let's see now. Uh, where are we? Um, Interstate 70. Hmm. We should be in Selena in about... Oh, look out! Hey, hey. I must have dozed off at the wheel. Oh, honey, if you hadn't seen that truck. Len, it's happening. It's happening just like your aunt said it was. 
I don't understand how, how she could know. Lynn, do something. I don't want to drive any further. Please do something. I'd like two train tickets to St. Louis, please. Thank you. Well, any luck? No. All I get is that stupid recording. Mm. Her phone is still out of order. Well, we'll just have to go on then. But we've got to get hold of her, Lynn. Why? What if it isn't safe to go on the train? What if something is supposed to happen to us while we're on the train? Oh, honey... Well, we can't stay here. Don't... Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Helen, stop fidgeting. You're making me nervous. I can't help it. I keep thinking about... Well, don't. Think of something else. I don't know how you can be so calm. Because I am trying not to think about what might happen. Then you do believe that Aunt Gertrude is... is... Clairvoyant? Yes. I don't know. Maybe it's like those astrology columns in the newspapers. Practically anything that happens to a person can be made to fit those astrology forecasts because they're so general. Aunt Gertrude was very specific, Lamb. Don't fly, don't cook, don't drive. Look, honey, maybe we're trying too hard to attach some personal meaning to what's really just a series of bizarre coincidences. If only we could have asked Aunt Gertrude about taking the train. Well, it's too late now. We made our decision, logically and intelligently, on our own. And if we're wrong? Then we can kiss logic and intelligence goodbye. Change driver. Lynn, she's painted the front door again. Well, we made it, safe and sound. Thank God. <laughs> Thank Aunt Gertrude. Maybe she isn't home. Well, she should be. I know she doesn't go out much these days. Aunt Gertrude? Excuse me. Who's that? I don't know. Excuse me. You folks looking for Gertrude Cullen? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, I'm her nephew, Leonard Doyle, and this is my wife, Helen. Oh. I didn't know she had any relatives. Well, we're a little worried about her. You see, we've been trying to get hold of her. Her telephone seems to be out of order. Oh, it's not out of order. Line's been disconnected for the last two days. What do you mean? I, I, I talked to Aunt Gertrude just yesterday. I don't think so. We both talked to her. You don't know, do you? Know what? What, what, what is going on here? Where is my aunt? Uh, I hate to be the one to tell you this. Your, uh, your Aunt Gertrude. She died a week ago today. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Long Distance, was written by Steve Sharon and produced and directed by Fletcher Martin. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Janet Waldo and Lou Horn. Featured in the cast were Louise Fick, Sidney Swire, Jerry Hausner, William Zucker, Stanley Director, Robin Braxton, and June Whitley Taylor. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Ritter. John Harlan speaking. 
The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us again tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. We're in a packed courtroom awaiting the verdict. To my left is Arno Lucas, the defendant, nervously drumming his fingers on the arm of his chair. Seems impossible that this slight, almost unobtrusive old man, virtually lost behind stacks of legal documents and reams of depositions, is a powerful underworld figure. Yet the government's case was strong because of the testimony of the man to my right, protected by two U.S. Marshals, the star witness for the prosecution. He is Frank Egan, Lucas's former associate. It was Egan's knowledge of illegal gambling, fraudulent transactions, and bribery that provided the federal attorney with solid evidence. <clears throat> Will the defendant please rise? The frame up, it's fixed. Mr. Lucas, I understand the concern for your father. However, your lawyers have had ample opportunity to present a defense. Ah, this is a kangaroo court. Mr. Lucas, any further outburst and you will be removed from this court. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Arno Henry Lucas... You have been tried by a jury of your peers and found guilty of extortion, racketeering, and mail fraud. You stand convicted of using your influence to the detriment of others. The time has come to serve notice on you and other men who show disrespect for the law. Therefore, it is the decision of this court that you be fined $100,000 and remanded to the custody of the federal authorities at the United States Penitentiary at Leavenworth for a period of no less than 15 years. What? It's a fix! You hear me? It's a fix! Bailiff! Clear the court! I'll frame up by a rotten stoolie! You're going to play for this, Egan. You hear me, Egan? You're not going to get away with this. I'll get you. I swear, I'll get you, Egan! Order! Order! The courtroom is a sea of confusion as the reporters dash to the telephones and spectators mill about. Frank Egan and Carl Lucas face each other across the room. Lucas's eyes bore into Egan's with an unspeakable hatred. Suddenly Egan bolts from the chamber, terrified. He knows his life will always be in jeopardy. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Double Exposure, by Ken Gerard. Our stars, Vic Perrin and Mary Jane Croft.
Minutes after Arno Lucas was sentenced to prison, Frank Egan was en route to a safe house run by, shall we say, quasi-governmental agencies. Although shaken by Carl Lucas's threat, he felt safe. But now we find Egan in different circumstances, disheveled and frightened, hiding in a seedy hotel. Where are you, Kern? You got me into this mess, now get me out. Where are you? Some special agent. You were going to protect me, huh? He left you alone, Frank. Stuck you out there like a clay pigeon. Left you for Carl Lucas and... No, no, no. Think, 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 think. Okay? Okay, I'll show him. I'll write to the newspapers, to that reporter that covered the trial. What was his name? Ah, Coster. Yeah, yeah, you know what to do with this story. You know that. Where's my pad? Dear Mr. Coster, I'm writing to you because I've got nobody else to turn to. Maybe by the time you get it, I'll be dead. I guess all the strange stuff started right after Arnold Lucas was sentenced. I was leaving the courtroom with Agent Stuart Kern. Hey, Egan. Wait a minute. Come on, Mr. Kern. I want to get out of here. Lucas isn't going to hurt you. Are you crazy? I just put his old man in the slammer. Frank, will you play it our way, huh? He's coming. You better hold on to him, Frank. Real tight. What do you want, Lucas? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Your father had a fair trial. Shut up, Kern. You, Egan. Stooley. I won't forget. Are you threatening a government witness? Oh, no way. I'm offering advice. I want your boy to remember me. And what he did to an old man. He treated you like a son, huh, Frank? You were part of our family, huh? I want to get out of here. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead, you're free. Walk the streets, sit in the park, enjoy yourself. You got Kern and his people to protect you, huh? Carl, please. They made me testify. I didn't want to. I didn't believe me. Liar. I didn't have a choice. Oh, I feel sorry for you. You're going to be living like a king on the outside while my father rots in a stinking prison. But, Frank, you're the one who's in prison, not him. Oh, no. Not him. I was scared. I knew Carl Lucas had hunt me down. I wondered, why did Kern let him have a crack at me? I ran out of the courtroom, but Kern and the U.S. Marshals caught me in the hall. All I remember was struggling, and then a pinprick on my neck, and the whole building started to swim. The next thing I know, I'm in a hospital, and this beautiful woman is sitting beside my bed. Oh, oh, my head. Lie back, Mr. Egan. Oh. I feel like I've been asleep for days. Would you like some water? Yeah. Yeah. My face. I've got bandages all over my head. What happened? Take it easy. Why are all these tubes in me? I, I'm i covered with bandages. That, was there an accident? We're all right now. Come on, please, lie back. That's better. You're fine, just fine. What is this place? Where's Kern? I want to see Kern. He'll be in shortly. I don't like this. You're safe. We've moved you to one of our clinics. We've uh, performed some cosmetic surgery. You did what? We altered your appearance for security reasons. Standard procedure for special witnesses. You people are crazy. The surgery is part of your cover. We're giving you a whole new identity, new face, new job skills, a new life. Why, you'll be able to walk in front of Carl Lucas. He'd never recognize you. Who... Who do I look like? Nobody. Anybody. Does it matter? I guess not. Ah, don't take it so badly. It's like being reborn. Tell me, how do you figure in this? I'm going to be traveling with you for a while. For security. And liaison with our office. When do I get out of here? Oh, not for some time. The surgery is only part of your cover... We'll provide you with an entire new identity. Your new face has to be matched with a new personality. And when you're ready, we'll begin psychological retraining. In a few months, we'll have removed all traces of Frank Egan. It's a successful program. Trust me, Frank. Trust me. I 
sank into the bed, confused and apprehensive. Everything she'd said swam in my brain. They'd operated on me, given me a new face. They were going to make me into somebody else. I didn't even know where I was. I... Suddenly, my eyes filled with tears. And I felt alone. Alone and very frightened. I felt alone and very frightened. Frank Egan looked at the words he had just written to a newspaper reporter he barely knew. Again, he was alone, isolated, in hiding. A barking dog shattered the stillness of the night, and Egan shivered in fear. How could anyone believe his tale? He wasn't Frank Egan anymore. He was now, but let him tell the rest of his story. I think I was in one of their hospitals in the south, but I really wasn't sure. They never let me have a newspaper or watch television. She said it was part of the sanitizing process. Oh, oh thank God. Thank God Kern's found me. He's going to pull me out of here. Hello, Kern? Uh, Ann, is that you? Who's on this line? Talk. Talk, talk. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's them. They're out there waiting, waiting. I'd better finish this letter. I'm going to let the whole story get out. Yeah, I'll have it splashed all over the newspapers. All right. Her name was Ann Harmon. She was Kern's assistant and in charge of my program. Feeling better, Frank? I guess so. I, you know, it, it's creepy. I can't get used to looking at that face in the mirror. It, it, it's strange. I mean, it's a, a handsome face, but... Well, you understand, don't you, that your old life is over. Now you're Taylor Shaw. That's my name? Well, I don't like it. it. It sounds... Well, it's not me. Goes with your looks. And when we're finished with your reprogramming, you'll be that man. Okay. It's better than Carl Lucas chasing Frank Egan the rest of my life. He'll never see you again. Now, let's start with some basic trait corrections. We want you to undergo certain tests. Nothing harmful, just subconscious relearning. The next few weeks, if they were weeks, sped by... I was turned inside out. I learned to talk differently, to walk with a bigger stride. And in the end, I was thinking like Taylor Shaw. After a while, I enjoyed it, but deep down, I was afraid. And then the nightmare started. I never told them about that. I, maybe I should have. No, no, Frank. You graduated from Lafayette College, not uh, State. Sorry. Sorry. There's just too much to remember. Yes, well, take your time. We can go over your background tomorrow, but you better review your notes this evening. Well, when am I going to graduate? You know, leave this place. Soon. Very soon. A week? Two weeks? Oh, come on, Miss Harmon. It can't be that secret. Uh, I imagine two weeks is a good bet. All right. Where am I going to be sent? First you get your personal history down, Pat. Then we'll talk about it. I'll lay you odds. Taylor and... Shaw doesn't lay odds. I'm sorry. Uh, I would guess that I'm going up north, somewhere on the Middle West. And my cover, an office job. No, uh, middle management in a manufacturing company. Am I close? <laughs> you are too smart. <laughs> Is class dismissed for the day? I don't know. I may never graduate. Cheer up, Mr. Shaw. You're going to be released tomorrow. You're kidding. Tomorrow? You and Miss Harmon are leaving for California in the morning. When did you make this decision? I didn't. Mr. Lassiter changed the plan. That's a major alternative. I don't think Mr. Lassiter... Anne, can we discuss this later? There's a staff briefing at 4.30. 
In the meantime, I want Frank, uh, Mr. Shaw, to get some rest. I feel this is too sudden. Anne. Well, everything's okay, isn't it? I, I mean, I'm... I'm still covered, aren't I? Uh, yes, of course. There's nothing to worry about. When you and Anne get to San Diego... San Diego? When you get there, you'll go right to our safe house. Everything's arranged. Safe house? It's part of your cover. The head of the company feels you'd be more productive in Southern California. Level with me, Kern. I'm in trouble. There's been a security leak, right? No. You're protected. Safe. Sometimes these things happen. Trust me, Frank. We know what we're doing. Trust him? <laughs> what a joke. It was a setup all the way. And I was the target the whole time. Frank Egan, the man on the run, sits hunched over a desk in a sleazy hotel. Frantically, he writes out his story. It is a desperate attempt to relate the events that have brought him to San Diego. Events that destroyed his real identity and turned his world inside out. He stops writing and stares into the fearful blackness of the night. His face glistens with a cold sweat. I should have known that I was being set up. But the idea of winding up in California pleased me. And having Ann Harmon as a traveling companion was okay, too. We landed in San Diego on the 19th. Another change in plans. We had jobs at the safe house. <laughs> safe house? It was a diner. I was the counterman and she was the waitress. Give me a BLT, right toast... And what do you want to drink? Coffee. I never saw you here before. What happened to the regular guy? Oh, he quit. Booze, you know. Cream? Uh, no, thanks. You from back east? Yeah. Hey, I thought so. You look just like a guy I knew from Detroit. Never been there. Hey, Taylor, give me a hand with this table. Sure. Now your order's up, fella. There you go. Enjoy yourself. Thanks. You sure you're not from Detroit? No, I'm sure. Who's your buddy? I don't know. Some jerk thinks he knows me. You recognize him? No. Let me carry the tray. You take the glass. You better take a look at him again. Why? You think he's one of Lucas's boys? Well, is he? He's turned this way. Just go to the kitchen. Go to the kitchen. and hurried into the kitchen. Ann started to talk to the guy. He nodded his head a couple of times. Finally, he paid the check and left. So who is he? I'm not certain. You better run a check on him. In the meantime, go back to the apartment and start packing. Well, what about you? I'll meet you there. Uh, give me an hour. Well, maybe I should stay here? Do as I say. Now. All right. All right. Leave by the back door. Don't run. Be cool. Yeah. I'll try. Hiya, Mr. <laughs> Shaw. How you doing? Where'd you come from? Just been waiting for you. Look, I don't know you. I don't want to know you. Oh, sure, sure. Tell me all about it, Mr. Shaw. I don't have any money. Uh, here, take the watch. Oh, come on. Drop the act. Act? What, you think I'm somebody else? Look, man, I know you. We've been waiting months until you show. Did Carl send you? Did he send you? Carl? We don't have any business with any Carl. It's just Franco and me in this part of the world. Well, you made a mistake. No way. You're Taylor Shaw. You're my man. Uh, uh, Franco, down the alley! Uh, you got it! Uh, that, that, that way! Uh, I got him! Uh, uh, what do you want? Now, don't, don't do that again. Never, never. Oscar, are you sure this this is the guy? Roll up his sleeve. Yeah. Uh, the left one, dummy. Uh, there it is. Three dots tattooed above the wrist. They did that to me at the clinic. Uh, shut up. Uh, Franco, get the car. Yeah. We'll take him to the warehouse. We can talk in private. Right, Mr. Shaw? Uh, a nice, quiet talk between friends. 
Oscar slammed me against a brick wall and I slumped to the ground. They threw me into the back seat of a car and the lights went out. The next thing I knew, somebody was slapping my face. Up, up. Come on. That's better. Come on, Joe. Sit up. Oh, oh. Oh, my head. Uh, yeah, drink this. Go ahead. Uh, <coughs> oh. oh, you... You guys made a mistake. It's not what you think. Sure. Tell me about it, punk. Now, where's our devil? Franco. Oh, no. Take it easy. No need for the rough stuff. We're all friends. Isn't that right, Mr. Shaw? Just good buddies. What do you want? Money? Oh, man, if that isn't a joke. Shh. Control yourself. That's right. We would like our money, just as promised. We delivered, now you come across. It's business, Mr. Shaw. Nothing else. I don't understand what you're talking about. $300,000, that's what. It's our dough. Oh, easy, Franco. Easy. Yeah. He's right, Mr. Shaw. You owe us. For what? Hey, let me take him out. Uh, not yet. What's not the yet. use? Now, we're not getting anywhere with now this back off. I don't want this to wind up like the other one. What's the difference, Oscar? He's going to die anyway. No. Let's just get the money. That's all. That's all we're entitled to. Uh, I don't want another killing on our hands. Go ahead. This can be short and sweet or damn painful. Now, where's the $300,000? I don't have $300,000. Mr. Shaw, we performed our end of the bargain. We brought in a shipload of heroin. We killed a Coast Guardsman. We did everything your people wanted. And now we, Franco and I, want to get paid. I am not Taylor Shaw. God damn it, save that garbage for somebody else. The dough. Just get us our share. Understand? You got the wrong guy. No, sir. We've waited for you. You're a month overdue. A month. Look, I'm Frank Egan. Egan. They they changed my identity for for protection. I was a government witness, and the girl, the, the waitress in the diner, she's a special agent. <laughs> Annie. Yeah, Ann Harmon. She'll tell you. Franco, you hear that? Annie's a fed. No kidding. Well, next time I got to see her shield. <laughs> she wears a badge, huh, Sean? Look, look. It's a mistake. Just let me out of here, and, and and I won't tell anybody, all right? I can't get over sweet little Annie working for Uncle Sam. Well, it's true. It isn't. Because Ann works with us. She's the one that brought you out west, right? She's a runner for the syndicate. No, no, no. She's with the FBI. Come on. Hey, sure. Cut the double talk. Now, we are tired of waiting. Now, tomorrow... All of us are going to the bank, and you are withdrawing our money. What bank? The one that has our 300 Gs. Cool it. Now, look, Shaw. We know you've got a safe deposit box somewhere in town. Just open it, and this whole stinking mess will be finished. I am Frank Egan. Don't open your mouth again. Now, don't. Please, please believe me. punch flattened me. I don't know how long I was out, but the next thing I knew, Ann Harmon was standing over me. Lie still, Taylor. Uh, oh. Franco, give me that washcloth. Oh, here you go. Now, doesn't that feel better? Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry the boys had to be forceful. Just keep that on your cheek. But you haven't been cooperative, have you? Uh, Ann, Ann, tell him the truth. Tell him who I am, please. Oh, uh, we won't get anywhere this way. Let her try, huh? You're not making this easy on yourself. It's a waste of time. Oscar, call Mr. J. Get him down Shut here. Shut up. No more. Look, we've taken all the risks so far. Now, you call him. He can deal with his creep. Franco, will you shut up? Mr. J? What are you talking about? Nothing, nothing. Now, just forget it. Tell her. Franco. Mr. J is our partner, silent partner in this business. Listen, will you keep your mouth shut? No. I've had it. I thought you ran this racket alone. Mr. J put up the bread for the boat, the lab, distribution. We're only transportation. And I thought you were running this show. What you didn't know didn't hurt you. Well, I'm tired of taking the heat. Now, Oscar, call the man. Let him take care of Shaw. Do it, Oscar. It's his money, isn't it? Oh, all right. I'll make the call. I am not part of this. I'm I'm Frank Egan. Uh, <laughs> And please... You open your face once more and you'll regret it. You understand? Uh, 
You're with them, aren't you? Here, Annie. Hold my gun on him. I want to hear what Oscar's going to tell him. The man from Detroit is here. I know. I saw him at the diner. You were there? Talk, Oscar. What's the problem? He says he's not our man. You checked for the tattoo? It's there. So, let him take you to the safe deposit box. He doesn't know anything about it. What are you trying to pull? Nothing. We worked him over and he's still saying he's some guy, uh, Frank Egan. Yeah, yeah, Egan. The guy who fingered old man Lucas? How do I know? Listen. Mr. J, you, you got to come down. We want to turn them over to you. This is getting sticky. You were paid to make the delivery, then to take short of the bank, not do it. No, no. It's out of control. Okay. Here's what you do. Make this guy talk. If he's sure and holding out for a slice of the action, I want to know. But if there's been a switch or something, and he's eager, well, keep him alive. He's worth a hell of a lot more than 300000 I know just who to call. Yes, sir. You in the warehouse? Right. Give me an hour. I'll be there. Well, he's coming. But first, we need some questions answered. I watched Oscar put down the phone. And then he looked at me. His stare sent a chill through my body. I acted quickly. Anne had turned away from me. I grabbed her gun. He's got the pistol. Stay back. Get him, Oscar. Don't do it, Frank. He's getting away. Head him off there, Franco. Use the back stairs. I ran like a wild man into the night. I didn't know where to go. I was alone, and I was afraid. She'd maneuvered me into a trap. But why? Why? It pounded in my head. Any way I looked at it, I knew I was a marked man. I would never leave San Diego alive. Vincent Price again. Frank Egan's life hangs by a single thread as we open the fourth act of Double Exposure. I've been holed up in this room for two days. I can't take it anymore. They're out there. They're looking for me. I can't reach Kern. His emergency number is disconnected. I don't know who to trust. When I finish this letter, I'm going to kill myself. You want me? You come get me. Frank, are you all right? But, Kern, how'd you find me? They locked your call into a tracer. But, but it was out of service. Frank always known where you were. Oh, nothing with you makes sense. You know they're after me. You've got to save me. I- I'll try. Try? What kind of answer is that? Now, please, please, I'm in room 303. I want you to get me now. Do you understand? We have to let the string run out. Just stay put. Let her make the next move. Anne? Well, you know your girl's part of a heroin ring. She's not with you. You've got to wait. Why? Whose side are you on? Do you have a gun? Maybe. Maybe not. Stay away from the windows. Oh, you got me into something else, huh? I never had anything to do with drugs. Kern! Kern! i got to get out of here. I'll go down the fire escape. The gun that... Okay. Steady, Frank. You're almost... Maybe Kern. Yeah? Frank, get out of the room. The whole thing's gone sour. How'd you find me? Never mind. Move. He's on his way. Oh, you set this up with Kern, huh? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm not leaving this place. No way. If you tell me to split, then I know it's got to be safe. You got another target. We've had you staked out from the beginning, Frank. You mean set up? There's no time to explain. Oscar and Frank are on their way. You tell it to the Marines. Sure. Sure, you want me on the outside. No way. I'm not leaving this room. I'm going to call the police. Yeah? Night, manager. Bull. Don't shut him, Franco. Mr. J, 
Jay wants this clown alive. Untie his hands. Ah, how you feeling, Mr. Shaw? Is that your real name? Yeah. You know, you've caused us a lot of trouble and time, Shaw. Now, we're going to get paid one way or the other. It's simple, basic business. These boys bring in the heroin. I, well, I underwrite the venture, and then your people come up with the money. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I haven't got $300,000. Oh, could be. But we have to find out. I'm not your man. Whose man are you? Mr. Oscar here tells me you said you were Frank Egan, huh? That's right. Well, the only Egan I heard of was a fink, a stoolie, who sent old man Lucas to the slammer. You that Egan? No, 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 of course not. I don't know any Lucas. Uh, could be. But we'll cross that bridge later. Whoever you are, I want my money. I delivered the junk, you pay. No more stalling. I'm not your man. I don't have it. <laughs> Let's try that again. Think carefully, huh? You you can work me over all you want. I'm not your connection. Okay, okay, let's find out who you are. Because if you're not from the Detroit branch and you don't have any share, well, let's see if you're Frank Egan. Oscar, get our visitor. Yeah, Egan, interesting name. A friend of mine's been looking for a Frank Egan, looking real hard. He's over here, Mr. J. Well, Carl, is this a man? It doesn't look like him. He's had his nose fixed. You, uh, check him for facial scars? No, let's take a look. Keep your hands off me. Hold your head still. I said still. Ah, come here. Yeah, is that what you mean? He's got small incisions near the hairline. Yeah. Yeah, he's had cosmetic surgery. You talk. You're holding the wrong guy. He said he's Egan. What do you think? I'm not forking out 500 grand until you can prove this creep's my boy. Now, if he's the one... You get the bounty. If not, sorry. Listen, Carl, I wouldn't have brought you out here for nothing. He's Egan. Prove it. All right. Bring him here. I'm tired of horsing around with you, fella. Just give us your real name, huh? No double talk. No wise answers. You understand? Yes. Great. Let's have it. Frank Shaw. What kind of answer is that? Talk. Talk you crummy stumble bum. Get your head straight. Let me handle it, Mr. J. I know just what to do. Shh, 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 shh. Not easy, boys. Not yet. I'll let them beat it out of him. If he's sure, you get your three big ones. If he's Egan, I'll pay. You can't lose, Mr. J, but you've got to prove it to me. He's Egan. Don't worry, I will. Tie him to that chair. <laughs> Give me a turn. No, I need a 38. Here, use mine. Okay, big shot, we're going to play a game. It's called a truth game. Very simple. All you need is a gun, liar, and one bullet. Yeah, you see? It's like an enforced game of Russian roulette, except I hold the gun right at your head. Simple, no? Yeah. Good, I think you got the picture. Now, this can be a short game or a long one. You see, fella, at this point, I'm playing for big dough. If you kill me, there's no payoff. The only way you collect is if I stay alive. He's right. I'm not paying for a corpse. Let's see how far this joker's bravery goes, huh? We'll get the truth. Is your real name Taylor or Shaw? Yes. No. Yeah. Sorry. Are you Frank Egan? Yes. No. The odds are running against you. You better come clean. You can't win. Shut up. I don't give a damn about that money anymore. Egan, Shaw, whoever the hell you are, you're going to die. Don't, Mr. J. Let us have him. What? You beat him up, he'll say anything. Oh, no. I'm going to blow his brains all over this warehouse. I'm finished. I'm happy. All right, cool it. 
If he's Egan, I want him. Our family wants him alive. Do it again. Okay, okay. Don't press your luck. Start talking. Frank Shaw. Give me the gun. I'll handle this. Mr. Chang, there's a couple of cars coming up the road. And don't bother me, yeah? Now, I want some answers. The truth. You got a phony store and you've had cosmetic surgery and I'm tired of these half-baked answers. You hear me? Hey, hey, hey. The cars are stopping in front of the building. Some people are getting out. I think... I think you're Frank Egan. Am I right? Frank Shaw. Okay, smart boy. I got this pistol right against your temple. Feel it, huh? <laughs> My last chance. I know you don't want to die. Give it to me straight. I'm going to count to three and then... Don't. Don't. One. Please. Two. You got to believe me. I didn't want three. to. Three. I'm Frank Egan. I am. I am. Don't shoot me, Carl. They made me testify. I didn't mean to hurt your father. They said he wouldn't be sent up. You rotten freak. I yeah, should blow your head. Special Agent Kern. Uh, the building is surrounded. Come out with your hands up. Can't kill the lights are down. Where's the back door? This way. What about here? I'll take care of it. Come out with your hands up. You, you know where you can go. Wait a minute, I'll nail our friend here. Good guess, yeah. I can't. Stop. Stop. I give up. Finish. Get those lights on. It's over. Over. Now get their guns, Rossiter. Take the men and find the other two. Stuart, over here. It's Egan. Is he dead? No, just beaten pretty badly. Lucas tried to kill me. I told him. I told him. It's finished. We'll take care of you. Trust me, Frank. Trust me. Stuart Kern and Anne Harmon arrived not a moment too soon. Oscar and Franco were captured. But what happened to Carl Lucas? And the elusive Mr. J. Agent Kern. Good morning, Stuart. How did your meeting go with the agency chief? Fair. He was quite disturbed that we didn't apprehend Carl Lucas and Mr. J. Yes, well, under the circumstances, we were lucky to get the other two. The boss doesn't see it that way. He wanted J so bad he could taste it. Well, at least this time we have three men who can identify him. Two. Egan's had a complete nervous collapse. He's no use to us. The psychiatrist reports he's assumed a dual personality, grand schizophrenia. He's become Shaw and Egan. Hmm, I should have gotten him out of the hotel immediately. Oh, so much for a case against Lucas. I thought we could have had him on attempted murder. Well, I think I can persuade Oscar to cooperate. He's facing an assortment of charges. It's worth a try. Let's move him to the clinic. He's already there. Selecting a new face? Oh, no, no, we haven't progressed that far. It's in the early stages of discussion. Anne, hmm. uh, when you conclude the talks, why don't you have the doctors make him look like Frank Egan? Hmm. Interesting concept. We could use him as bait to get Carl Lucas and possibly Mr. J. Interesting. Well, think it over. Give me a call. I will, Stuart. I will. All you have to do is get Oscar to trust you. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Double Exposure, was written by Ken Gerard and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Vic Perrin and Mary Jane Croft. Featured in the cast were David Downey, John Larch, Marvin Miller, John Shea, and William Zucker. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us again tomorrow 
when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. <laughs> 